Section 24 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill. Instagram social number Billiam113. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Up to this time, Cosimo had lived in the Medici Palace in Via Larga, and it was there that he brought home his bride. But shortly after making this marriage, Cosimo removed into the Palazzo Vecchio, having the rooms on the second floor, which had been those always occupied by Gonfalonieri, handsomely decorated for Eleonora's reception. He had several reasons for this change of residence. But his principal one was that the Medici Palace was not a defensible castle and possessed no accommodation for the bodyguard of troops necessary to protect his person. While his occupation at the Palazzo Vecchio, which for a century had been associated in the minds of Florentines, the governing body not only gave him a more secure abode, but also emphasized the fact that he alone now wielded the power of the state. Other rulers around him, such as the Astet Fela and Gontaga Atamantua, each occupied their uh, castello in the center of their capital city, and no other residence was in fact suitable for a despotic ruler such as Cosimo, desired all men to recognize that he intended to be immediately at the door of the palace and passed daily by him stood Donatello's statue of Judith laying Holofernes with the inscription which the citizens had placed on it as a warning to all who might attempt to tyrannize over Florence. And this Cosimo suffered to remain as it was. In grim irony, the wide contrast between the sentiment expressed by the inscription and the rule which he had established. His bodyguard of Swiss lancers he placed during the hours that they were on duty in Orcana's Logia, which thus acquired the name by which it has always since been known of the Lagia de Lanzi. The Palazzo Vecchio was a somewhat restricted and gloomy abode for Eleonora, but Cosimo had other plans for the future, and intended arranging him for himself and Eleonora a much larger and grander residence later on when he should feel sufficiently firmly established. Meanwhile, by incorporating the buildings on the eastern side, including the residences of the Esecutore di Guestizia and the Capitano dei Fanti, he considerably enlarged the Palazzo Vecchio, and he and Eleonora lived there for ten years, six of their eight children being born there. But until he had an army of his own, independent alike of any troops lent him by the emperor and of florentine's levies cosimo could not feel sh secure added to which he had views on the future of extending the boundaries of tuscany when op opportunity should offer and for this powerful army would be necessary he therefore gradually raised a force of swiss german and italian troops the latter recruited from other parts of italy than tuscany and soon had a small but strong army which he steadily increased in numbers in order to strengthen his hold on florence he also much enlarged the fortessa and augmented the number of troops quartered there by the above means cosimo by the time he was twenty one had firmly established himself as a despotic ruler of Tuscany. Bronzino's portrait of him in the Pitti Gallery, one of the best portraits the Bronzini had ever executed, painted, Vasari tells us, when Cosimo was forty, accords closely with the description of his appearance given by contemporary writers. 
these state that his face gave no indication of the great abilities which he possessed, and he had a dark and impenetrable disposition, with a fierce power and relentless anger, all the more terrible because it burnt under the surface. For the first ten years of his reign, Cosimo was chiefly occupied in strengthening his position as Duke of Florence. The three main factors in European politics were, as before, Francis I, Charles V, and the Pope, Paul III. During the years 1536 and 1537, the latter had continued to labor earnestly to bring about the peace between the two antagonists, but for some time without avail. At length, in June 1538, he got both Charles and Francis to come to Nice, although they would not meet, and the Pope had to conduct negotiations by personally visiting them alternately. So that much credit is due to him for the success he eventually achieved in getting them to agree to a truce which caused a secession of the conflict for four years. At the end of that time, however, they were again at war, and Cosimo had to choose his side, abandoning the traditional Florentine policy of alliance with France. Cosimo, throughout his reign, threw himself heart and soul on the side of the emperor, imposing the operations of the French in Italy on all occasions. At the same time, beginning as the emperor's vassal, he gradually purchased his independence. When the war between Francis and Charles was resumed in 1542, and five separate French armies invaded Charles's territories, the emperor, to raise troops to meet this attack, borrowed money largely from Cosimo, who in return obtained the withdrawal of the imperial garrisons from Florence and Pisa. The same process was repeated on several subsequent occasions, Cosimo taking a step further in the same direction every time that the emperor was in need of funds until he attained entire independence. Nevertheless, after he had done so, he still continued the same policy of always siding with the emperor and against the French so that he came eventually to be Charles V's mainstay in Italy. While the accessions of territory, which from time to time the emperor had helped him to acquire, by increasing Cosmo's power, also Charles's feeling of security was increased as regards to Italy. In 1544, peace was made for a time between Francis and Charles at Crepi, and in December 1545, the Council of the Church, which had been talked of for so many years, at last assembled in Trent. It, however, failed to possess the character which had been intended, for instead of the two parties in the dispute being present, only one of them was represented at it. Neither the Church of England nor the Protestant party in Germany and France sending any representatives to it, so that it became merely a council of the Roman Church, and as such lost all interest for Europe as a whole. In 1546, the Strozzi brothers, who had never ceased to make vengeance against Cosimo for their father's death, made an attack on him, with the assistance of Francesco Bonamacchi from Lucca, but the attempt failed. In 1547, the long triangular duel, which had lasted for over a quarter of a century, came to an end by the death in the early part of that year of two of the antagonists, Henry VIII and Francis I. Just when Francis was preparing a fresh attack upon Charles, this removal of his two rivals materially increased Charles V's power. As all states in Italy soon felt, and in particular the Pope, the attempt of the latter to introduce the Inquisition, which had been established in Rome in 1542, into Naples, was defeated, Charles refusing to allow it. The Pope was also endeavouring 
to get the Council of Trent removed to some city in Italy, and intriguing for this purpose with the French against Charles. But in this, as in all his undertakings, he found a strong opponent in Cosimo, whose state of Tuscany was rapidly becoming the strongest in Italy. At this time we find Cosimo tendering remarkable advice to Charles I, urging him in a letter of the 6th February 1547 to use his power for a complete reform of the church through the council, tasking away the tyranny of the priests, reducing the power of the pope to its proper spiritual limits, restoring the pure faith of Christ without the abuses that had grown up around it. Whilst all those in Italy who were in opposition to the emperor looked natural to the pope for assistance in the young duke Cosimo, says Ranquet, and Paul III found the very man best fitted to oppose him. And Cosimo himself, in a letter about this time, says, The Pope, who has succeeded in so many undertakings, has now no wish more earnest than doing something in Florence as well. He would fain estrange the state from the Emperor, but this hope he shall carry with him to his grave. In this year, 1547, Cosimo managed to remove from his path a danger which had from the first threatened him. The degree which he had obtained at the time of his election, putting Lorenzino's branch of the family out of the succession, still left him open with a feeling of insecurity, as it was always open to his enemies to get up an agitation to dethrone him on the ground that Lorenzino was the lawful head of the family and the rightful ruler of Florence. Lorenzino's death was therefore much to be desired, and Cosimo had long tried to achieve it, but without success. Lorenzino, after many wanderings in France, Turkey, and other countries, had eventually settled with his mother, Maria Soderini, at Venice, where he lived in constant fear of his life, knowing that Cosimo was employing the most skilled assassins to dog his steps, knowing the dangers which were around him in the narrow little streets. He seldom trusted himself anywhere outside his house except in a gondola. At length, one night in 1547, he was caught unawares in a narrow street by two hired assassins employed by Cosimo and murdered. The account of how they killed him was related by themselves and may be read in full detail in various recordings of the time. Cosimo's plea for this act was that he was only carrying out a just execution of Lorenzino for the murder of Alessandro. Throughout his life, he had adopted the same attitude on this subject. The view that Lorenzino's act was inspired by a desire to liberate his country by creating sympathy with Lorenzino militated seriously against Cosimo's usurpation of the rule of Florence, while it might inspire others to similar actions against himself, and as it was in order to excite a feeling against Lorenzino, and to extinguish, if possible, the above view of his act though no other reason for the deed could ever be produced that cosimo on coming to power had the house broken down and that he and his successors the grand dukes endeavoured in all ways to keep as much odium as possible on lorenzino's name with the result that lorenzino had been handed down to us not as he was looked upon by his contemporaries viz as the florentine brutus but as one whom every abusive epithet may freely be cast. In 1548, Cosimo su succeeded in performing an important service for Charles V. The Republic of Siena had revolted from the latter, driven out his representative and the Spanish garrison, and placed themselves under the protection of the Pope. Cosimo offered to mediate between the two parties, and which was accepted immediately, and he was so successful that he was able to pacify the Sienese and arrange an agreement that Siena's ancient form of government should be respected by the emperor, while a representative of the latter with the Spanish garrison should be admitted. Both France and the Pope were now preparing to attack the emperor 
and he was strengthening himself in every way in Italy for the conflict. As one measure to that, and the harbor of Portoferraggio and the adjacent district in the island of Elba was given to Cosimo, and he, in a short time, made Portoferraggio the strongest naval station in the Medi Mediterranean. He was also allowed to occupy Piombino for a time to assist him in defending his own coastline near Pisa, and gained various accessions of territory along the coast. In 1549, Pope Paul III died, and since his successor, Julius III, adopted a more amicable policy towards the emperor, this tended to um, create peace in Italy. In ten years from the time of his marriage, Cosimo had so firmly established his rule that he felt able to occupy a different kind of residence from the Palazzo Vecchio. Well, this change was the more desirable, since he and Eleanor had now seven children, the eldest of them being nine years old. Accordingly, early in 1550, Cosimo, imitating the ancestor after whom he had been named, set about building a new palace for the family, that which is now the royal palace in Florence, and which, though known to us as the Pitti Palace, was entirely built by the Medici, and was their home during two hundred years. To carry out this purpose, Cosimo bought, with Eleonora's money, this estate covering the northwestern slope of the Boboli Hill, on the southern side of the Arno, together with, at the foot of the hill, the portion of the palace which had begun, more than eighty years before, by Gluca Pitti but which had the family never had the money to finish. This, when Cosimo bought it, consisted only of a small center portion of the present building, embraced by the three center arches of the ground floor, and the seven windows above them. It was only completed up to the top of the first floor, and was still unroofed, leaving more than half the building, even as it existed in Cosimo I's reign, to be completed. Except this small nucleus, the hall of the palace, as we see it, was built by the Medici. Cosimo, assisted by his able architect Amadnati, completed the center portion up to the roof, but without extending it laterally, which alone suffices to show that the present central court did not exist even in his time. The estate and the unfinished building upon it were sold to Cosimo by Buonacorso Pitti for 9,000 gold to Florence. It is generally stated that the Pitti Palace is built on the design which it had 100 years before been drawn up by Bonaleschi for Luca Pitti. But this, while of course totally incorrect as regards all the rest the palace, this is an error, even as regards the comparatively small portion of it, which formed the ducal palace in Cosimo's time, and which scarcely amounts to one-sixth of the building. For when the Carso Pitti, when sending the property, was unable to supply Cosimo with Brunelleschi's design, this having, in the lapse of the years, been lost. Nor even had it been forthcoming with a building designed to accommodate an ordinary citizen family in 1440 sufficed. A hundred years later, for the residence of the Duke of Florence and his court. Be this as it may, Cosmos Palace, when completed, consisted only of the comparatively small central portion of the front block of the present palace. When thus finished by him, it was a plain oblong building, three stories high, with seven windows on the front, which faces the Via Romana, and without either the central court or the two great wings on either side of the latter, running back at right angles to the facade, which now formed the great central block of the palace. Thus, in Cosimo's and Eleonora's time, the palace had a very different aspect from the immense building to which we are accustomed, including as it did only that portion of the fa facade which is embraced by the seven central windows. This is remarkably corroborated by a little known picture occupying a dark corner in the long corridor between the Pitti and 
Uffizi Galleries. He chose the portrait of a lady in the ducal court with, in the background, the picture of the ducal palace, demonstrating very plainly what its dimensions were in the time of Cosimo I. The picture, owing to its background, is labelled a lady of the Pitti family, but the background itself refutes this, for the palace is represented as completed and roofed, which at once proved that the time is subsequent to that at which the building had any connection with the Pitti family. And we are shown here the palace as, as it was after being completed by Cosimo I. The picture cos consequently represents not a lady of the Pitti family, but a lady of the ducal court. In the beginning of the year 1553, the work was sufficiently far advanced to allow the next new palace being occupied, and Cosimo and Eleonora with their seven children moved into it. End of section 24「Section 25 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 24, Cosimo the First, Part 3. The Bobbly Gardens. Cosimo, who was extremely fond of elaborately planned gardens, and was the founder of the botanical gardens at Pisa and the Giardino Botanico di Semplici at Florence, took the greatest pleasure in laying out, with the help of Tribolo and Buontalenti, the magnificent gardens behind his new palace, extending up the slope of the Boboli Hill and covering an immense area while to Eleonora and her children the change must have been great after the confined precincts of the Palazzo Vecchio. And as in these beautiful gardens we traverse the long avenues of cypress, ilex and stone pine, or follow the shady pathways amidst banks of roses and azaleas, or sit on the seats of the amphitheatre, overlooking the back of the palace, it is impossible not to think of those eight children of Cosimo and Eleonora, who were the first of many families of children to play here, and of their chequered histories. Maria, whose sad death at sixteen cast the first gloom over the family. Francis, unstable and unenergetic, who succeeded his father. Isabella, destined to die a tragic death at the age of thirty-four. Giovanni, whose death at nineteen was so severe a blow to his father's hopes. Lucrezia, married at fifteen and dying at seventeen. Garzia, his mother's favourite son, whose death at sixteen was immediately followed by hers. Ferdinand, capable and full of energy, who succeeded his brother Francis and carried on the Medici line. And Pietro eight years old when his mother died, and either justly or unjustly accused of murdering his young wife when he was only twenty-two. Looking at the palace where they all grew up, one feels that its main interest will always be associated with this first generation of the family who lived here, Fort of San Giorgio. But Cosimo did not only lay out gardens in connection with his new palace, he intended that it should have a fortress in close proximity to it as well. Therefore, on the summit of the Bobbly Hill, at the extremity of the gardens, he laid out the lines of the Fort of San Giorgio, also called the Forte di Belvedere, placed so as to join the line of the city walls, and on a height more immediately overhanging the city than that of San Miniato, it commands the whole of Florence, besides completely defending it on the southern side, and this fort, when completed by his son Ferdinand I, became the stronghold of the Medici family. Art Collections Cosimo, soon after he had, by his marriage with Eleonora di Toledo, become rich enough to undertake such a quest, 
set about a diligent search for traces of the ancient Etruscans, making extensive excavations at Chiusi, the ancient Clusium, Arezzo, and other places in Etruria to search for specimens of Etruscan art, while at the same time he purchased all rare Etruscan and Egyptian antiquities which chance threw in his way. These efforts of his had important consequences. For this search for remains of the ancient inhabitants of Tuscany was continued by his descendants, producing an immense collection of most valuable and interesting specimens of the art of the Etruscans and objects revealing their mode of life. And these, combined with the Egyptian antiquities also gradually accumulated, resulted in the two collections which now form the Etruscan and Egyptian museums of Florence, the former being considered probably the finest Etruscan museum in the world. Among the numerous interesting remains of Etruscan art, which Cosimo obtained from these excavations, were the fine statue of Minerva, found near Arezzo in 1541, the celebrated Chimera, found near Arezzo in 1554, and the statue known as the Orator, found near the Trasimene Lake in 1566, all being of bronze. The most valuable of these finds was the statue of the Chimera, or fire-breathing monster, having the body of a lion, a goat's head springing from the back, and for the tail, a serpent which is biting the goat's head, a statue contemporaneous with the wolf of Rome. It was, however, held to be inauspicious to Florence, and so was kept by Cosimo in his private room in the Palazzo Vecchio, and not exhibited to the public. From the time that he moved into his new palace, Cosimo began to turn his attention to the collection with the assistance of Vasari and Bronzino, of a gallery of pictures, such as that which his ancestors had gathered round them in former days in the palace in the Via Larga. The plunder of the Medici art collections, which had taken place in 1494 and again in 1527, had dissipated the collections made by the elder branch, scattering far and wide most of what had not been destroyed valuable pictures which had been the property of the Medici, having even found their way to France and Germany. But some portion of these art treasures were still in Florence, dispersed among different families or hidden away elsewhere, and Cosimo had search made for these, and bought back as many of them as he could find for the embellishment of his new palace, including portraits of former members of the family, a few statues and busts, and objects of art such as the vases which had belonged to Lorenzo the Magnificent. At the same time, he set Bronzino to work to paint, from such materials as existed in the shape of representations on medallions, frescoes, or otherwise, the portraits of all the Medici, from Giovanni de Bici downwards. Bronzino carried out this work with great care and long labour, and the series of portraits that he painted of the older Medici for Cosimo, and which are now in the Uffizi Gallery, are among his best works. Vasari, who was also at work for Cosimo in other directions, says, In some small pictures painted on plates of copper, and all of the same size, he, Bronzino, painted all the great men of the house of Medici, beginning with Giovanni de Bici and Cosimo the Elder, down to the Queen of France, Catherine, in that line, and in the other, from Lorenzo, brother of Cosimo the Elder, down to Duke Cosimo and his children. The witch portraits are behind the door of the studio made by Vasari in the apartments of the new rooms of the Ducal Palace. The two fine portraits of Cosimo I, and Eleonora di Toledo gave Bronzino the reputation of the best Florentine portrait painter of his time. The years 1551 to 1553 were a troubled time for Charles V, who was harassed with defensive and unsuccessful war against the Turks in Hungary, 
against France in both Savoy and Lorraine, and against the rising in Germany headed by Maurice of Savoy. And that these troubles were not increased by the war spreading also to Italy was due entirely to the strong position to which Cosimo had by this time brought Tuscany, and to his steady adherence to the cause of the emperor. Nevertheless, in 1552, the peace of Italy was severely endangered by the action of the Republic of Siena, which again rose in revolt against Charles V, drove out the Spanish garrison, and accepted a French garrison in its place. Cosimo was, however, able to prevent the revolt from spreading to other states, and in January 1553, a force was dispatched from Naples to subdue Siena, but owing to the death of the Viceroy of Naples, Don Pedro di Toledo, Eleonora's father, this force failed to effect anything. For his efforts in the Emperor's cause, the latter conferred upon Cosimo the coveted honour of the Order of the Golden Fleece. The attempt from Naples having failed, Cosimo now proceeded to undertake the conquest of Siena himself, nominally, of course, on behalf of the emperor, Siena being an imperial fief. He had by this time a large and well-equipped army, partly composed of German, Swiss and other non-Italian troops, and partly of the Tuscan militia, inaugurated many years before by Machiavelli, which Cosimo had revived and largely increased while the numerous fortresses of Tuscany were well armed, strongly garrisoned, and commanded by reliable leaders not belonging to Tuscany. The army which he sent against Siena was commanded by Giacomo Medicino, Marquis of Marignano, while that of Siena, consisting chiefly of French troops, was commanded by the skilful soldier Piero Strozzi, Filippo Strozzi's gallant son who in his unceasing endeavours to avenge his father's death, was always to be found opposing Cosimo wherever any fighting was taking place. The war was a long one, Siena making a splendid fight in defence of her ancient republic. Piero Strozzi added greatly to his laurels by his conduct of the campaign. It was carried on throughout the Sienese territory. The whole country between Siena and Florence becoming a frequently fought-over battlefield. Cosimo introduced great barbarity into the conflict by his cruel treatment of the country people of the districts traversed by the war, which increased the determined resistance offered to him. At length, in August 1554, Strozzi's army sustained a severe defeat at Marciano, which was followed by the investment of the city of Siena which endured a terrible siege for many months. Everything that a brave people could do in such a case was done, even the ladies of Siena taking an active part in the defence. When, after untold horrors had been suffered, the end drew near, it was decided that Piero Strozzi, with a portion of the troops, should depart to hold Montalcino, one of Siena's subject cities which was yet unconquered, and the command of the defence then devolved on Blaise de Montluc, Marshal of France, who covered himself with no less glory than Strozzi had done. At length, when out of 40,000 inhabitants, only 6,000 remained alive, and when everything edible had been consumed, Siena surrendered, April 1555. The concluding scene is thus described by Trollope. The miserable remnant of the brave garrison marched out with the honours of war, accompanied by six hundred families who would not stay to see their beloved city under a tyrant's rule. They marched out into a desolate country. For two years no spade had touched the soil. From Montalcino to Siena, from Siena to Florence, no living thing moved upon the face of the land. Many died that day, though Montluc killed his horse to give them food. At Buon Convento, Strozzi met them. At length they reached Montalcino. 
and there the remnants of Sienese liberty found a haven. The shadow of an ancient republic rested for a while, on its old grey walls as faintly as their hopes. But it soon passed over the mouldering dial and disappeared for ever. Thus ended the last of the great Italian republics of the Middle Ages. It had long been in the power either of France or Spain. Cosimo, when once he had conquered Siena, did not treat it badly. He retained almost intact its ancient constitution and preserved the local customs and traditions of its government so that there was less change than had been the case even in Florence itself. And to this conduct on his part is due the strong local colour which Siena has ever since retained. On that state coming under his rule, Cosimo appointed as Siena's first governor his own personal friend, Nicolini, and built on the spur called the Lizza, the strong fort of Santa Barbara, which is still in use. As soon as the war was over, Cosimo paid a long visit to Siena and arranged all these matters himself, and so much to the satisfaction of the Sienese were the various details settled, that Siena never afterwards revolted from the Medici, and became the most loyal portion of their dominions, while in after years that city came to consider it as a right, that one member of the Medici family should always be its governor, and out of Cosimo's army of 30,000 men, 7,000 of his best troops were recruited from Siena. In October 1555, the Emperor Charles V, who had been the most prominent figure in European history for 40 years, abdicated at an impressive ceremony held at Brussels, resigning Spain, Naples, the Netherlands, and his other hereditary dominions to his son Philip II, and the imperial dignity to his brother Ferdinand, king of Hungary and Bohemia. He retired to the monastery of Juste in Spain, and died there in 1558, at the age of 58. In the same year that Charles V abdicated, Pope Julius III died, and was succeeded first by Marcellus II, and after a month by Paul IV. While Cosimo I, by his conquest of Siena and the other acquisitions of territory which he had gradually gained, as well as by the efficient administration of his military affairs, had doubled the territory of Tuscany and more than doubled her offensive and defensive power, the improvements he wrought in her civil administration were still more important. Cosimo ruled by fear. His government was a tyrannical one, and none dared disobey or evade his commands, but he ruled well. In every department of the state, order and the strictest discipline took the place of disorder and corruption. The administration of justice was entirely remodelled. A proper criminal code was drawn up and rigidly adhered to. Magistrates were well paid and forbidden to receive any sort of bribe, and terrible retribution fell upon any who transgressed. The police had to submit daily to Cosimo a list of all crimes committed during the previous 24 hours, and they had reason to rue it if any attempt to shoot or stab was not promptly followed by the arrest of the criminal. Cosimo's secret prisons, more dreaded than even those of Venice, were kept for those who failed to obey these orders. For the rest, Justice had never been so evenly administered. Never in the days of freedom had justice been obtainable as it now was under the rule of a tyrant. Heavy taxes had to be imposed, especially after the great expense of the Sienese War, but Cosimo, by his care over the commerce of the country, enabled the people to bear them. He revived the decaying silk and woolen trades, by disobeying Charles V's order to the Italian cities to eschew the fairs of Lyon, Cosimo drew trade away from Genoa and Lucca, while he also captured the lucrative trade in brocades with Sicily and Spain. He set an example in scientific farming and fruit growing. He took a lively interest in the silver mines of Pietra Santa, the marble quarries near Carrara, 
and the anthracite discoveries on the upper Arno. Concessions were obtained for working the alum of Piombino and the iron of Elba. End of section 25. Read by Jane Bennett. Section 26 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 24. Cosimo I, Part 4. Roads, drainage works, harbors, markets, all the appliances of a modern state, grew up in all directions under Cosimo's hand. Pisa, then a depopulated desert, was revived again into a flourishing city. Its sanitation was improved by the draining of the surrounding marshes, and its prosperity increased by the introduction of new manufactures. The harbor was reopened by the construction of new docks, the university was re-established, and Tuscans forbidden to take degrees elsewhere. The Pisa School of Botany was founded, and became afterwards very celebrated. While by frequently residing at Pisa with his family, Cosimo made it a fashionable resort. Legorn was raised from a neglected fishing village of 700 inhabitants to a busy port, and plans were laid for its development which afterwards bore much fruit under Cosimo's son, Ferdinand. Siena had its social and commercial conditions in every way improved, while the Sienese Maremma was drained and agricultural colonies from Lombardy established there. By these and similar methods carried out all over Tuscany, Cosimo advanced the material prosperity of the country no less than he did its political power. Naval and military affairs showed the same energetic rule. Porto Ferrajo was made a strong naval station, and in addition to his extensive works on its harbor, Cosimo introduced a seafaring population from Sicily and Greece, while he also began the creation of a fleet of galleys, which, under his son Ferdinand, did good service against the Turks and the pirates of the Mediterranean. His army, 30,000 strong, was well equipped. While of his militia, Cosimo was specially proud and declared that he could mobilize them in five days. He studded Tuscany with fortresses, fortresses which, constructed with the assistance of his celebrated architect and engineer Ammanati, were monuments of defensive strength. As an example of one of these, we have the remarkable fortress of San Martino, on the hill above San Piero a Sieve, laid out under Cosimo's orders in order to defend Florence on the north, which, when its garrison and armament were withdrawn two centuries later by the Austrian Grand Duke Pietro Leopoldo, 1765-1790, to was ordered by him not to be destroyed, but to be kept Quote, as a monument of the military architecture of the 16th century, end quote. This fort is a mile in circumference, and the strength of its construction extraordinary. It stands on the spur of a hill, at the foot of which, on three sides, flow the waters of the Sieve, and its lofty keep dominates the whole plain of the Mugello. In the center of the fort, is a capacious reservoir for storing water for the garrison, while, should this be exhausted, a deep staircase in the heart of the mountain enabled the troops to lead their horses, without being seen by the enemy, down to the Sieve for water. In the depths of the mountain are vast subterranean halls, where were magazines, armories, foundries for making every kind of military equipment, and storerooms for food, so that the fortress was considered able to defy the most formidable enemy. The bastions and walls are of extraordinary thickness and solidity, and they, with the battlements and casemated gateways, are studded everywhere with the Medici arms. Within the walls, 
there is much open space for the movements of troops, which is now cultivated. This fortress was begun by Cosimo I, and completed by his son Ferdinand I, with the assistance of the architect Buontalenti. Nor did fleets, troops, and fortresses, the development of trade, and the improvement of civil administration absorb all Cosimo's energies. The Medici have written their sign manual even upon the landscape of Tuscany. Few among the many who look with pleasure on the gentle slopes of the Tuscan hills, covered far and wide with those olive plantations whose soft bluish-green tints add so much to the special beauty of the landscape in Tuscany, realize that this great industry which now forms so large a part of that country's agricultural life is due to Cosimo I, who introduced it as a portion of his measures for improving the agricultural prosperity of the country. Such things last when crowns, castles, and orders of the Golden Fleece have long passed away. By these various measures, Cosimo gradually welded Tuscany into a well-administered modern state and the leading power in Italy, and they would have made his rule entirely admirable had they not been combined with vindictive conduct towards all who opposed him and a tyranny which crushed out all independent spirit. It is observable that he was to some extent conscious of his own limitations. Tyrant as he was, he would at times endeavor to adopt outwardly something of the bonhomie and absence of formality which was customary with his great ancestor Lorenzo the Magnificent. But the role was one alien to his character, and let any presume to treat him in return with the freedom with which they would have treated Lorenzo, and they at once found Cosimo lapse into the cold and stiff demeanor natural to one who ruled by fear alone and had no sympathy with republican ways. Among Cosimo's numerous successful efforts to promote the manufactures of the country, none was more important in its results than his introduction of the tapestry manufacture, Arazzo, an industry which had hitherto been confined to Flanders. Being anxious to establish a manufactory for this industry, which should surpass all others, he founded the Florentine Tapestry Manufactory, and by means of an abnormally high salary, induced two Flemings, Nicholas Karcher and Jean van der Roost, to enter his service for the charge of it, giving them an annual salary of 600 gold scudi, free quarters, and permission to undertake private commissions in addition to their work of charge of the factory. In return, they bound themselves to teach the secrets of their art to a fixed number of Florentines and to keep twenty-four tapestries always on hand as examples. All work done for the House of Medici was paid for separately. The results of this action surpassed even Cosimo's expectations. The Florentine tapestry manufactory grew in a short time into great repute, its work being considered fully equal to that of Flanders, and even surpassing the latter in variety of design and harmony of color. This manufactory had a distinguished career for nearly two hundred years, but came to an end when the Medici passed away, the manufactory being closed in 1787 on the death of the last Medici Grand Duke. We are told, quote, it prospered and fell with the House of Medici, end quote. Of the tapestries made by this factory, 124 had been purchased by the Medici family, and these formed part of the gift to the nation made by Anna Maria Ludovica. They were at that time scattered among the various palaces and villas of the family, but they are now to be seen collected together, and forming with specimens of Flemish and Gobelin's tapestry, which also belonged to the Medici, the Galleria degli Arazzi, and a comparison between them and the Flemish and Gobelin's tapestries is decidedly to the advantage of the Florentine tapestries. They are exceedingly rich, woven in gold and silver thread, intermixed with silk and wool, the borders especially being very artistically designed. 
Cosimo, for the amusement of the people, introduced chariot races after the pattern of those of ancient Rome. They were held in the Piazza Santa Maria Novella, where the marble goals are still to be seen. These were originally of wood, but Ferdinand I caused them to be constructed of marble and placed, as now, on bronze tortoises made by Gian da Bologna. In 1557, four years after they moved into the new palace, occurred the first death in Cosimo's family, that of his eldest daughter Maria, who died at sixteen and whose charming portrait at about the age of ten by Bronzino in the Uffizi Gallery is well known. In the following century it was declared that this death of his eldest daughter was due to slow poison given her by her father, the motive being asserted to be that, having arranged with Pope Paul IV for her marriage to that pope's nephew, Tabriano, Cosimo discovered that she had fallen in love with another youth, a page at her father's court. No historians of the present day give any credit to this story, which made its first appearance more than fifty years after Maria's death. Moreover, the state archives now show that Cosimo, who was at this time strenuously endeavoring to establish close political relations with Ercole II, Duke of Ferrara, had arranged for Maria's marriage, not as the story relates to the Pope's nephew, but to Duke Ercole's eldest son, Alfonso d'Este. So that Cosimo would, by the crime alleged, have destroyed an alliance he was laboring in every way to cement, and have made an enemy of the Duke of Ferrara, whom he was particularly anxious to unite to himself as closely as possible. In 1558, great destruction was caused in Florence by an unusually heavy flood in the Arno, which swept away the Ponte Santa Trinita, the Ponte alla Caraja, and all the houses which were on the Ponte Arubiconte, the Ponte Vecchio, built by Taddeo Gadi in 1334, alone of all the bridges, remaining uninjured. Florence became in a few hours a sea of mud and ruin, some parts of the city being submerged to a depth of twenty-two feet. It was after this flood that Cosimo built his two fine bridges to replace the two which had been destroyed, the new Ponte Santa Trinita being especially notable. This beautiful bridge, in its proportions, excellence of construction, and the symmetry of its lines, exemplifies the perfection in such architecture then attained in Tuscany, though now unattainable anywhere. Part of the reason why it pleases the eye so much is that its curve is that technically known as a catenary, being that taken by a chain suspended from supports at both ends, a curve which is neither that of an ellipse or of any other geometrical figure, but special to that particular case. In June 1558, Piero Strozzi, the eldest of Filippo Strozzi's three sons, was killed at the taking of Thionville. He had spent a large part of his life in warring against Cosimo and endeavoring to exact vengeance for his father's death, and had become one of the most experienced generals of the time. He had spent many years in France, where he was highly thought of by Catherine de' Medici and was protected by her against the attempts which Cosimo made on his life. Cosimo constantly tried to have him assassinated, but Strozzi never retaliated in the same way, and at his death Cosimo spoke of him with honor, affirming that Strozzi had ever acted against him con la visiera aperta, and that Italy had lost in him one of her principal gentlemen no small tribute from so vindictive an enemy as Cosimo. In the same year, the latter gave his daughter Isabella, then sixteen, in marriage to Paolo Giordano Orsini, prince of Bracciano, and his daughter Lucrezia, then fifteen, to Alfonso, the eldest son of Ercole II, Duke of Ferrara, instead of her sister Maria, whose untimely death had prevented a similar alliance. 
In November of this year, Mary Tudor died, and her sister Elizabeth succeeded her as Queen of England. The year 1559 was an important one for Europe. In February, four months before Henry II's sudden death at the tournament in Paris, the Treaty of Cateau Cambrésis between Henry II, Philip II, and Queen Elizabeth put an end to the war in which France, Spain, and England had been engaged, and closed the long struggle between the two former for supremacy in Italy, which, begun by the invasion of Charles VIII, had lasted for over sixty years. That struggle ended in a complete victory for Spain, and the final result was mainly, if not entirely, due to the fact that Tuscany, the most powerful state in Italy, had sided against France and with Spain. By the above treaty, France formally withdrew from Italy, surrendering all her claims in that country. Siena, together with Montalcino, was assured to Cosimo, the Duchy of Savoy, conquered by France twenty-three years before, was restored to its rightful duke, Emmanuel Philibert, and erected into an independent buffer state between Italy and France. Spain remained in possession of both North and South Italy, while Cosimo held the center, and the peace thus created in Italy lasted for over half a century. In June, Philip II married Elizabeth of France, daughter of Henry II, who, being killed a few days later, was succeeded by his son, Francis II. In July, Philip II quitted the Netherlands, which country, during the remaining thirty-nine years of his life, he never again visited. Before leaving, he appointed as governor of the Netherlands his half-sister, Margaret of Parma, and held at Ghent, the last chapter of the Order of the Golden Fleece that was ever assembled. In August, Pope Paul IV, who, during his four years pontificate, had been a constant cause of war in Italy, died and was succeeded by Pius IV. The new pope was of humble origin, and though named Giovanni Angelo Medici, or Medicino, was no connection of the Medici of Florence. Nevertheless, on becoming pope, he assumed the arms of the latter, and Cosimo made no objection, hoping to obtain solid advantages through this pope's friendship. For Cosimo was now silently at work upon a project which he had for some time been secretly nourishing. We are told that the leading marks of Cosimo's character were, quote, profound sagacity, deep dissimulation, impenetrable darkness, extreme caution, patience, resolution, and indomitable perseverance, end quote. And the project for which Cosimo was now, in accordance with these characteristics, secretly working, was nothing less than the realization of that which had been the culminating point of the dream of Clement the Seventh. As a duke, he was theoretically merely the emperor's lieutenant. As a grand duke, he would be a reigning monarch, Cosimo could not hope to obtain that crown upon which his aim was set through the regular channel, the emperor. Ferdinand I, like his dead brother Charles V, would not be likely to entertain for a moment a proposal to place a crown on the head of one who, only a few years ago, had been an unknown youth to whom it had been a great favor to allow him to become ruler of Florence and the emperor's vassal. But future emperors, further removed from the days of 1537, might not be so opposed. And in the meantime, it might be possible to obtain the coveted dignity through another channel, that of the Pope. For this object, paramount influence at Rome was all important, and to attain this, Cosimo was steadily employing every means at his disposal, though allowing none to know what was his ultimate aim in doing so. Pius the Fourth was soon entirely under his domination, and when in 1560 Cosimo paid a visit to Rome and was entertained by this pope, his influence was so powerful that the pope, sensible that Cosimo was now by far the most important ruler in Italy, 
wished we are told to make him a king or what was practically the same thing a reigning grand duke but cosimo put the suggestion aside as a mere polite piece of flattery outside practical politics it was what he was quietly working for but his excessive caution made him feel that the time for such a step was not now when the nations of europe had just made peace together or while ferdinand i was emperor when france and spain should be again at enmity when england should be involved in war with one or other of them and when a weaker emperor should have succeeded ferdinand i and one perhaps allied to his family in marriage then such a step might be hazarded without danger of provoking opposition other than that of mere verbal protests moreover his relative catherine who hated cosimo and thwarted him on many occasions began in this year fifteen sixty her long career of power in france and cosimo foreseeing that she would soon be involved in difficulties with both spain and england if not also with germany when she would be unable to offer any active opposition to his design preferred to wait until this should be the case in the meantime he succeeded so well in the preliminary step of establishing a paramount influence at rome that three successive popes were practically governed by him meanwhile cosimo adopted measures to establish still more firmly the position of his family already much strengthened by the marriages of his daughters one of whom was now duchess of ferrara and the other princess of bracciano the wife of the most powerful prince in rome in fifteen sixty through his influence with pius the fourth cosimo succeeded in getting his second son giovanni now seventeen made a cardinal thus imitating the course which lorenzo the magnificent had so successfully taken with that other giovanni who had become pope leo the tenth cosimo hoped that giovanni who was his favorite son would achieve similar success while his joining the ranks of the cardinals would help to strengthen that influence at rome which cosimo had special reasons for desiring he also in fifteen sixty one instituted the tuscan order of knighthood the order of santo stefano which afterwards became very famous in tuscany and highly sought after it was a naval order and its primary objects were laid down as being one to rid the mediterranean of pirates two to liberate the christians held captive by the pirates and the turks and three to propagate the christian faith the duke himself was the grand master and by the order being confined to the nobility and made the chief order of tuscany the knights became a sort of permanent bodyguard for the protection of the duke and his dynasty being a naval order the knights of santo stefano had their conventual palace and church at pisa and the church is hung with moorish banners taken by them from the turks and the barbary pirates and with the figureheads of turkish galleys captured in war the knights won special honor at the battle of lepanto 1571 the cross of the order was similar in shape to that of the knights of malta but in color red instead of white in this same year 1561 cosimo and eleonora who had already lost one of their three daughters heard of the death at ferrara of their daughter lucrezia duchess of ferrara at the age of seventeen it was in after years declared that she was poisoned by her husband on the ground of infidelity but this statement is considered by the highest authority to be quite untrue and to have been entirely fabricated by the florentine foruscitti end of section twenty six Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 27 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 24, Cosimo the First, Part 5. And now there fell upon Cosimo a terrible domestic disaster. Death of Giovanni, Garda, and Eleonora di Toledo. In October 1562, he started on a tour through Grosseto, the Maremma, and Leghorn to Pisa to see in person various military and engineering works which he had inaugurated at those places. He took with him his wife Eleonora, who had been suffering from haemorrhage of the lungs for more than a year and was recommended by the doctors to go for the winter to the milder climate near the sea coast, and his three sons, Giovanni, Gazzia, and Ferdinand. A bad epidemic of malarial fever was in that year devastating a large part of Tuscany, and especially the Maremma, and the doctors urged Cosimo not to take with him his young sons. But the latter were eager for the chances of sport on such a trip, and persuaded their father to disregard the advice. The expedition had a sad ending, for within a single month Eleonora, Giovanni and Garcia all died from malarial fever. Giovanni on their reaching Leghorn, and Garcia and his mother three weeks later at Pisa. Such an event could not, in Cosimo's case, fail to form a foundation for a tragic tale of murder, and accordingly we find put forward a highly dramatic one, purporting to convey the true story of those three deaths, and stating that in a quarrel, while the two brothers were out shooting near Leghorn, Garcia had stabbed his brother Giovanni, who died three days later in consequence. That Cosimo was so enraged at this death of his favourite son that he drew his sword and killed Garcia with his own hands, and that Eleonora died of grief and horror at the double crime. This account, which has continued to the present day, was that related by the various historians of that age. The latter, unable to obtain access to the private documents of the Medici family, were forced to rely on information, often felt by them to be dubious, and several of them, though giving this account, throw doubts upon its truth. The chief cause of their uncertainty was that however deeply the subject was probed, in no case could it be discovered with whom the report originated, added to which every investigation showed that it had no origin in Tuscany, but that all the different versions of the story had this in common, that they all emanated from Rome, the principal abode of the Florentine exiles, from thence spread by letters and news agents to Venice, to France, and above all to the large body of ecclesiastics assembled at the Council of Trent, the story soon became the common opinion outside Tuscany, and was eagerly taken up by every foreign enemy of Cosimo throughout Europe. But this account of these deaths did not all appear at the same time. Its Roman authors, whoever they were, brought it out piecemeal. When on the 20th of November Giovanni died, it was stated that he had been killed by his brother Garcia. When three weeks later Garcia died, an addition was made to the effect that Giovanni, when wounded, had in retaliation also wounded Garcia, and that this was the cause of the latter's death. At this point the story remained for some fifty years. To this first portion of the story, there was, however, added more than fifty years later, a further embellishment of it, to the effect that Garcia's death had not been caused as previously stated, but that Cosimo, enraged at Giovanni's death, had killed his younger son with his own hands, and that Eleonora's death had been caused by horror thereat. During the intervening fifty years, no single letter, document, or historical writing throughout Italy had ever conveyed even a hint of this deed. This addition, by making the story so dramatic, increased its chance of spreading. 
While since it was produced long after Cosimo was dead, it was evidently aimed not so much at himself as at his family. It rapidly spread and soon became the common belief. The state archives in these days supply the information which the historians of a former day lacked, and recent research therein has furnished a mass of evidence which conclusively disposes of both portions of the story and shows that the historians who doubted its truth were right. This evidence includes two letters from Cosimo to his eldest son Francis, then in Spain, relating the events which had occurred to the family during the latter part of this untoward trip. In the first of these, dated 20th of November, 1562, he tells his son that on the 15th, Giovanni had been attacked by malignant fever at Rossignano, that they had promptly moved from thence to Leghorn, but that he became worse and had died there on the date of the letter, that Garcia and Ferdinand also had fever, but less severely, and that he was going to take them next day to Pisa, where it was hoped they would recover, and that this exceptionally malignant type of fever was very bad all over the part of the country that they had been traversing. This is followed by a second letter from Cosimo to his eldest son, dated 18th of December, written amidst all the grief at the death that day of his wife Eleonora, in which he tells Francis that Garcia's fever had increased after their arrival at Pisa, that after a severe illness of 21 days he had died on the 12th of December, and that his mother, worn out by her exertions in nursing him, while she was herself also ill, had succumbed six days later, and giving full details of their last hours. These letters, together with the other documents in the state archives already referred to, prove with great completeness that the story which so long obtained credence as the history of this episode is a complete fable. One perhaps scarcely expected to be taken seriously, even by its unknown authors. It was, in fact, one of a series which had their origin in the manner by which Cosimo gained his throne. From the day of Monte Merlo, a ceaseless war was waged between Cosimo and that large number of Florentine families who had lost near relatives in his ruthless executions after that battle and lived in exile, a war in which Cosimo, cruel and vindictive, slew his enemies with the sword whenever his arm could reach them, and in which the exiles, no less vindictive, but poverty-stricken and without the resources he possessed, responded by attempts to murder him, and by a constant stream of stories of this nature poured forth unremittingly on the principle that if enough mud is thrown, some must stick. The Cambridge Modern History, than which there is no higher authority, dismisses the entire story in contempt with the following remark. Quote, in the autumn of 1562, he, Cosimo, had lost within a few days from Marema fevers his wife and his two sons, Garcia and Giovanni. A year earlier, his well-loved daughter Lucrezia died shortly after her marriage to Alfonso II of Ferrara. These natural misfortunes were in the following century caught up by scandalmongers and Florentine exiles and distorted into dramatic tragedies of adultery and poison, fratricide and parricide, which have passed muster as the inner history of the reign." Unquote. But even without any such terrible additions to its natural features, this episode was sufficiently tragic. Of the family party of five, who had started for a pleasant trip together, only two, Cosimo and his young son Ferdinand, returned. Cosimo had lost within a month the devoted wife, who had been his constant companion and adviser for 23 years, and two sons, on one of whom, through his recent creation as a cardinal, he had built many hopes, while both of them possessed many attractive qualities. All the three bodies were brought back to Florence and buried in San Lorenzo. 
the funeral of Giovanni being scarcely over, before the grave was again opened to receive the bodies of his mother and brother. And in one corner of the crypt of the family mausoleum, these four lie buried together. Cosimo, Eleonora, Giovanni, and Garcia, the last three with the following dates of death upon their tombstones. Giovanni, 20th of November, 1562. Garcia, 12th of December, 1562. And Eleonora, 18th December, 1562. Bronzino's fine portrait of poor Garcia, who is given a charming character by those who knew him, and who, dying at sixteen, has had his name thus defamed for centuries to gratify political animosity against his father, must have been painted only a few months before the family left Florence, on the tour which was to end so disastrously. Of her five sons, he was his mother's favourite son. She loved him as her own eyes, says an old chronicler. This loss was a severe blow to Cosimo, and under it he became more than ever dark, sullen, and impenetrable. It left him with only four children, Francis, now twenty-two, Isabella, twenty-one, Ferdinand, fourteen, and Pietro, a child of eight. Isabella, returning soon afterwards from Rome, took charge of her father's household. Her husband, Orsini, being content that she should live in Florence while he remained at Rome. Eleonora di Toledo Eleonora di Toledo, the only Spanish wife whom the Medici ever took, their other matrimonial alliances being all with France or Austria, deserves a much more prominent place in the history of that family than she has received. The very large part which she had in the establishment of Cosimo's power in the years 1539 to 1549 has failed altogether to be recognised. Yet Eleonora di Toledo might almost be looked upon as a second founder of the family. So great was the assistance which she brought to Cosimo when, as a youth of twenty, he was destitute of wealth, family, friends or influence to support the tottering throne which he had seized, but which without her he would probably in a very short time have lost, together with his own life. Many have wondered how it was that at the beginning of his career, Cosimo, so signally without the means to effect such a result, should have been able so quickly and firmly to establish his power. The secret lies in Eleonora di Toledo. Cosimo in time himself became rich by a sound fiscal policy and by the private trading which he throughout his life carried on. But these sources of income took time to develop, and his urgent want at the commencement was money with which to start such operations and to maintain a military force for his own protection. Eleonora brought him the immediately available wealth of which he stood so much in need. Cosimo was also without friends or influence to back him. Eleonora brought him the powerful support of her father, whose only child she was, and who as ruler over the whole of southern Italy was always able to put pressure upon the Pope to prevent the latter from molesting Cosimo, as he was very desirous of doing. Above all, Eleonora had exactly the kind of character which made her an admirable wife to a man of Cosimo's peculiar disposition. She understood how to treat his dark and gloomy moods and to soothe his fierce rage. She was strongly devoted to him, and never lost her great influence with him during all the twenty-three years of their married life. She was the only channel to his favour, and she was, throughout her life, a most sensible adviser to him. Though accustomed until she arrived in Florence to the far greater grandeur of her father's viceregal palace at Naples, she never complained of being given as a residence the gloomy Palazzo Vecchio, until after ten years, 
Cosimo's circumstances enabled him to provide her with a more suitable abode. Lastly, the extent and beneficial nature of her influence is amply demonstrated by the marked deterioration to be observed in Cosimo's character from the time that death deprived him of her when she was forty years of age. Eleonora's splendid portrait by Bronzino in the Uffizi Gallery, with her little son Ferdinand by her side, is the finest of all Bronzino's many portraits. Whatever may be the reason, her face has an expression of sadness, and the picture has for its background the night scene of a dreary marshy landscape with dark desolate hills in the distance, which accords with this expression. The picture was evidently painted sometime in the year 1558, when she was 31, and Ferdinand, then her youngest born, was four years old. She wears a magnificent dress of white satin, heavily embroidered all over with rich black galloon trimming of a very marked pattern, on her head a net of gold cord set with pearls. Round her neck, a string of large pearls, and round her waist, a girdle having a large tassel of pearls. This dress had an important subsequent history. Eleonora was the first who was buried in the manner ever afterwards customary in this family, all the members of which from this time onwards were buried dressed in their most splendid costumes and wearing numerous jewels. And Eleonora was buried dressed as she appears in this portrait. In 1857, a commission was appointed by the state to open and examine all the Medici coffins, which, owing to their having been kept without due security after the Medici passed away, had, in the early part of the 19th century, been broken into by thieves for the sake of the jewels they contained, and were in considerable disorder. When this examination took place, Eleonora's coffin was one of the few found without any name or inscription, either outside or inside, but her remains were at once recognised by this dress, which was familiar to all through Bronzino's well-known portrait. The official report on the examination of the coffins states in regard to hers, quote, The body was recognised with certainty by the rich dress of white satin, richly embroidered with galloon trimming, all over both the bodice and the skirt, exactly as she is depicted in the portrait painted by Bronzino, which is in the gallery of the statues, together with the same net of gold cord worn on the hair. Beneath this dress was an undergown of crimson velvet, and on the feet, shoes similarly of crimson velvet. Unquote. The string of pearls round her neck and the girdle with the tassel of pearls had, however, been stolen. End of section 27. Read by Jane Bennett. Section 28 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 24. Cosimo I, Part 6. Cosimo, notwithstanding the heavy domestic blow which he had suffered, did not relax his pursuit of the aim on which his mind was set. To this end, it was highly important to have one son, a cardinal, who would maintain a constant watch over Cosimo's interests at Rome, and within a month of the funeral of his wife and sons, he obtained from Pius IV the creation as cardinal of his fourth son, Ferdinand, to take the place of the dead Giovanni though Ferdinand was only in his fourteenth year. In December 1568, the Council of Trent, which had sat for eighteen years, finished its labours and was dissolved. Pope Pius IV, the Pope who made himself a member of the Medici family, has obtained a lasting memorial in the work of this council, 
from the fact that it drew up a new creed, called by his name, which has ever since had to be accepted, in addition to the three creeds of antiquity, by all belonging to the Church of Rome. As regards the primary object for which it was convened, the Council of Trent achieved nothing. Abandoning the endeavour to reunite Christendom, to attain which object the convocation of this council had been so anxiously striven after for so many years before it was assembled, it made no attempt to deal with the evil which Pope Adrian VI had so ably diagnosed as the cause of the disease, or to apply that remedy which he had pointed out as the only one, a limitation of the absolutism of the head of the church an attempt which even the councils of Pisa, Constance, and Baal had made. On the contrary, this council turned its whole attention to re-establishing the papacy on the footing on which it had stood in the 13th century, so that instead of uniting, it accentuated the differences between the two parties more than ever. Nevertheless, the Emperor Ferdinand I did not even yet give up the hope of effecting a reconciliation. As soon as the Council had dispersed after this abortive conclusion, the Emperor, following to some extent the example which Catherine de' Medici had set two years before in France, caused George Cassander, a highly learned Belgian theologian, to draw up a statement of the points of controversy between the two parties, to serve as a basis for a fresh conference on the subject. This Cassander did in a very able and broad-minded treatise entitled A Consideration of the Articles of Religion Under Dispute Between Catholics and Protestants, which was duly published. But owing to the Emperor's death, no further result ensued. In 1564, the Emperor Ferdinand I died and was succeeded by his son, Maximilian II, with whom Cosimo hoped to be able to establish closer relations. In this, he was successful, and in January 1565, Cosimo's eldest son, Francis, was married to the Emperor Maximilian's sister, the Archduchess Joanna of Austria, daughter of the Emperor Ferdinand I, and niece of the Emperor Charles V. It was another step upwards on the ladder which the Medici had for so many generations been climbing, being the most exalted marriage they had ever yet made, and Cosimo had good reason to hope that it would materially assist him when the time should come for him to put forward a claim to be no longer merely Duke of Florence, but a crowned head. It did not, however, augur well for the chances of happiness of Francis and Joanna, that the former had been for more than a year passionately attached to the beautiful Venetian, Bianca Capello, while the Archduchess was not only plain in appearance and unattractive in manner, but also made no secret that she considered the marriage one altogether derogatory to her dignity. As Cosimo was anxious to do honour in every way to his son's bride, nothing was omitted which could add splendour to the occasion. It was settled that the Palazzo Vecchio should be made over to Francis and Joanna as their residence, and the old castle of the Signoria of Florence was, under Cosimo's orders, beautified in every way by Vasari to fit it for the abode of an archduchess. The suite of apartments which had been occupied by Cosimo and Eleonora was entirely redecorated. Round the vestibule of the cortile were painted fresco pictures of Austrian towns, so that Joanna should have familiar scenes to look at. The massive pillars of the cortile were adorned with stucco ornaments on a gold ground, which still remain, though the gold has disappeared. And in the centre of the court, Cosimo placed Verrocchio's beautiful fountain of the boy with the dolphin, which had been made for Lorenzo the Magnificent's villa of Careggi, while a pipe conducting specially pure water from the Boboli Hill 
was brought over the Ponte Vecchio to supply the water which flows from this fountain. The Archduchess arrived in Florence in January 1565, and the marriage, which took place in San Lorenzo, was a very magnificent ceremony, and was followed by a week of public festivities of the most lavish description. The Passaggio In addition to these arrangements, Cosimo, in connection with this marriage of his son with the Empress's sister, constructed another work which still remains one of the notable sights of Florence. In imitation of the passage which Homer describes as uniting the palace of Hector with that of Priam, as well as to provide a means of escape for his family in time of disturbance, Cosimo arranged to connect by a long covered gallery his own palace with the Palazzo Vecchio, now to be occupied by his son. He therefore ordered Vasari to construct the celebrated Passaggio, a corridor of nearly half a mile long through a crowded part of the city, starting from the Palazzo Vecchio, passing over the building known as the Uffizi, or public offices, which Cosimo had built in 1561, over the top of the shops on the Ponte Vecchio, through houses and over streets, until it reached the Ducal Palace. The work must have been executed with great rapidity, for the contract was only signed on the 12th March 1565, and Lupini tells us that the corridor was finished by November. The contract for this work gives some details interesting to those who know Florence in these days. It lays down that, quote, There shall be an arch above the street, where is the dogana to the wall of the church of San Piero Ceraccio, and another arch at the house of Signor Trajano Boba, and along the Lungarno, a corridor with arches and pilasters, as far as the Ponte Vecchio. Thence, proceeding onwards above the shops and houses of the said bridge, on the side towards the Ponte a Rubaconte, and round the tower of the house of Matteo Matnelli, by means of stone brackets. From this tower, another arch spanning the Via dei Bardi shall rest upon the tower of the Parte Guelfa, opposite the house of the Manelli. The corridor is then to follow the small alley behind the houses, facing the principal street, and pass above the portico of the church of Santa Felicita, where is to be made a loggia. Thence, the corridor, supported on pilasters along the whole length of the cloisters of the clergy of Santa Felicita, shall gradually descend to the level of the Garden of the Pitti. The said corridor and its adjuncts are to be roofed in, the ceilings plastered, whitewashed, and finished according to the orders, designs, and models given from time to time by the magnificent and excellent master Giorgio Vasari. End quote. The sentence in this contract, ordering the corridor to be carried round the outside of the Palazzo Manelli on brackets, is interesting. That palace occupies the end of the bridge and had belonged to the Manelli family for many generations. Its position appeared to make it unavoidable that Cosimo's new corridor should pass through it. Accordingly, Melini says, Cosimo sent for the owners of the said palace and asked if they were willing, courteously, to permit him to make the passage through it. But they strongly objected, pointing out that it would spoil their house. Whereupon he, Cosimo, placed it as we now see it on stone brackets, passing by a sharp turn round the outside of the house. Nor did he bear the mill will, saying that every one was master of his own house. Hitherto, the shops on the Ponte Vecchio had been occupied by butchers. On making the Passaggio, Cosimo ordered them to vacate and directed all the jewellers in Florence to inhabit these shops, and this has ever since been the jewellers' quarter. From the time of his eldest son's marriage, 
Cosimo made over to him the entire control of home affairs, though still retaining in his own hands foreign affairs. In the same year, 1565, Pope Pius IV died and was succeeded by Pius V, Michele Ghislieri, the stern old inquisitor and a pitiless persecutor of the new religion. With such a pope, it was not difficult to see what kind of conduct would be most conducive to the maintenance of that paramount influence at the Vatican, which it was Cosimo's earnest desire to retain, and the more so since affairs in France, Spain and Germany showed that the time was approaching when he would be able to take the step for which he had long been preparing. The character of the new pope soon made itself felt throughout Italy a general stamping out of Protestantism wherever it had taken root began. This placed in danger a man who had long been a firm friend of the Medici family and who had done good service for Cosimo in particular in various capacities. Carnesecchi was a Florentine of very good family who had been proto-notary apostolic to Clement the Seventh and of so much influence with him that it was said he rather than Clement was Pope. Some years after Clement's death, he came under the influence and teaching of Valdez, became a Protestant, and ere long one of the leading Protestants in Italy. After spending some years in France, he returned to Italy, but in 1557 was pronounced by Pope Paul IV a refractory heretic and had to fly for his life. He fled to France to Catherine de' Medici, who protected him. On the death of Paul IV, he returned to Florence, where during the pontificate of Pius V, he remained unmolested, and was one of Cosimo's most trusted friends and advisers. But the election of Pope Pius V placed Carno Secchi at once in danger danger which was increased by his having recently entreated Cosimo to exert his great influence with the emperor to bring about the assembly of a really ecumenical council in the centre of Germany and to effect the Pope's personal attendance thereat. Pope Pius V, dreading the effect of Cosimo's influence if exerted in the manner urged by Carna Cerci, earnestly desired to remove this friend and adviser from Cosimo's side, and was eager to get hold of Carnesecchi and hand him over to the Inquisition. Catherine de' Medici, on the other hand, had written to Cosimo, urging him to protect Carnesecchi in the same way as she had done, and to refuse the Pope's demand for his surrender. But Cosimo, throughout life, ruthlessly sacrificed all who came in the way of his plans. He was bent upon an object which only the Pope's favour could obtain for him, and he knew well that Carnesecchi's life would be the price. Therefore, to his lasting shame, he in July 1566 surrendered this faithful adherent of himself and his family to the Pope and in October 1567, Carnesecchi was burnt in Rome by the Inquisition. Two years afterwards, Cosimo received his reward. Carnesecchi was the last of the chief reformers in Italy, and with his death, the reforming spirit in that country, which at one time had been very strong, died out. Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1569, the year of the battles of Yarnac and Montcontour in France, when Catherine de' Medici's troubles were at their height, Cosimo just considered the time at last propitious for the step he had long contemplated. France was blazing from end to end with civil war. Spain was occupied with the contest in the Netherlands and endeavouring also to take part in the conflict in France. England was embroiled with both France and Spain, and in Germany, the Emperor Maximilian had his hands full with similar troubles. None were therefore likely to interfere actively against Cosimo's assumption of regal dignity. 
Accordingly, we are informed that owing to Cosimo's great influence with Pope Pius V and his many good offices to the papal see, that Pope now published a bull creating Cosimo I, Grand Duke of Tuscany. In doing this, the Pope was, of course, assuming the prerogative of the Emperor. But Cosimo trusted in time to get the latter to acquiesce in what was a fait accompli. Nor was the Pope's action unjustified from the general point of view. Cosimo had raised Tuscany to such a position of power and importance that her ruler was justly to be considered on a level with other sovereign rulers of states, not in any way in advance of his in these respects. In February 1570, Cosimo was, with much ceremony, crowned in Rome by the Pope. Spain and Germany refused to acknowledge Cosimo's new rank. France and England, however, did so. And within the next few years, the other powers of Europe, one by one, concurred. The shape of the new crown was peculiar and was carefully laid down in the Pope's bull. This ordered that the crown of Tuscany was, unlike the French, Spanish and other crowns, to be radiated like that of the Eastern kings, alternate with the Florentine lily. It was a royal crown with the points curving outwards, intended to represent the blades of the iris. In the centre of the front was a large red Florentine lily, thus making the crest of Florence's ancient republic the chief jewel of the royal crown. The sceptre was also peculiar, it was ordered to be surmounted by the Medici Pagliè, and upon this the Florentine lily. The portrait of Cosimo painted to commemorate this occasion shows him wearing his robes as Grand Duke, with on his head the new crown, and in his hand the sceptre. Thus had the Medici reached at length the summit of their career, and a crown was at last placed upon a Medici head. One hundred and seventy years from the time that Giovanni de Bici, the humble banker of Florence, is first heard of, his descendant, the head of the house, entered the group of European sovereigns. Fate, in irony, had realised the long dream of Clement VII in a manner far different from his intentions, and had placed the crown which he had schemed to gain in the future for his family upon the head not of a scion of the elder branch, but of the son of that Giovanni delle Bande Nere, whom he had striven to keep from succeeding to the honours of the Medici, and had thought finally disposed of on the battlefield of Governolo. The remaining four years of Cosimo's life were only notable for the general deterioration in his character, which, beginning to set in from the time of Eleonora's death, and increasing year by year, became in these last four years strongly pronounced, leaving the entire government of the country to the inefficient hands of his son Francis, he lived chiefly in retirement at the villa of Castello with a new wife, not at all in his own rank, named Camilla Martelli, whom he had married about the year 1571, and who was treated as a sort of morganatic wife. This marriage gave the greatest offence to his sons, who refused to recognise Camilla as really their father's wife, while this and undignified disputes in which he was involved with her relations caused Cosimo's latter days to be wanting in either peace or dignity. He died at the Villa of Castello on the 21st of April 1574, at the age of 55, after a reign of 37 years. Cosimo, whose tomb bears the inscription Magnus Dux et Primus, was interred with great pomp in San Lorenzo, clad in his robe as Grand Master of the Order of Santo Stefano, and wearing his jewelled crown and sceptre and his Order of the Golden Fleece. The Medici were regardless of expense in the matter of crowns. 
They objected to wear crowns, of which even the jewels ornamenting them had been worn by their predecessors, and each Medici Grand Duke was buried wearing his actual crown, not an imitation of it, and with his jewelled scepter by his side, an entirely fresh crown and scepter being made for his successor. As a consequence, when in the early part of the 19th century the Medici coffins were plundered by thieves, the latter sought chiefly for those of the Grand Dukes. Owing, however, to the darkness of the lower crypt and the manner in which the coffins on removal thither had been piled together in different parts of it, without any system, the thieves were only able to find the coffins of five out of the seven Medici Grand Dukes, those of Cosimo III and Gian Gastone, which had no distinctive marks on the outside, escaping detection. These, however, were the only two in which the crown and scepter were found when the coffins were opened in 1857 by the commission appointed for the purpose, that of Cosimo I being among those found entirely plundered. The body was dressed in the robes of the Order of Santo Stefano, with under these a doublet of red satin and hose of the same colour on the legs. His sword was extraordinarily large, and in the velvet lining of the scabbard, hidden by the gilded hilt, were enclosed a small dagger and a number of small stiletti, with very sharp points, almost as fine as needles, stuck into the lining of the scabbard as into a needle case. The robbed and broken coffin did not contain the golden crown, the scepter and other ornaments which should have been found there. In Cosimo I, the prominent characteristic is a pitiless ferocity. No sentiment of generosity, magnanimity or mercy ever stirred his nature. His enmity worked with as little pity and as little remorse as a machine. Death, prompt and cruel, ensued for all who failed to obey his will or thwarted his purposes. The doors of the Bargello closed behind them, and the scaffold in its courtyard saw their end. Or if they escaped from Florence, then the hired assassin was equally sure. Together with this characteristic there was another, of meanness of character. Among other evidences of this there was in him, the son of the bravest leader of troops in Italy, that want of personal courage which so frequently accompanies a cruel nature. He never ventured into a battle himself, sending other men to risk their lives for his advantage, and he carefully surrounded himself with a bodyguard, which his cruelties made a very necessary precaution. But the defects of a cruel and ignoble disposition must not be allowed to hide his undoubtedly great work for his country. In thinking of Tuscany, we are too apt to regard it as it had become in the beginning of the 18th century, and so to lose sight of the prosperous kingdom which Cosimo I created in the 16th. It is indeed strange to compare the small, misgoverned and insignificant state which this son of Giovanni delle Bande Nere and Maria Salviati seized by his bold coup d'etat of 1537 its capital half ruined by the long siege of 1530, its scanty territory devastated by the war, and its whole condition brought to degradation by Alessandro's five years' misrule. With the large and flourishing kingdom which Cosimo, its first grand duke, left to his successors, he found Tuscany a small and despised state, dependent on a foreign power, without troops, commerce, agriculture or resources, with ruined towns, a wasted country and a poverty-stricken population. He left her a large and independent kingdom with a powerful army, a rising fleet, flourishing manufactures, wide commerce, sound laws, model public works, a well-ordered administration and a thriving people. He successfully resisted the most powerful pope of his time and governed three others in succession. 
he saved Tuscany from becoming, like Milan, a province of Spain, and he made her the leading state in Italy. There is probably no other example of so small a state advancing within a period of some thirty years to a position of power and importance scarcely inferior to most of the monarchies of the time. It is this comparison between what he found and what he left which gives the true measure of Cosimo I. In ability, he didn't fall far short of those earlier Medici who had advanced Florence over the heads of all her rivals in their time and made her the artistic and intellectual capital of Italy. It would have been well had he shown also those other qualities of character which they, in addition to their abilities, had possessed, of a generous and high-minded spirit, readiness to forgive injuries, mercy to enemies, courtesy of demeanour, and sympathy with the people. But these qualities were foreign to his nature, and his rule was that of an iron-handed tyranny. It was Florence's own deliberate action which had brought that tyranny upon her. On Alessandro's death she could, if she would, have reinstated her republic. Completely untrammeled, and under no pressure from any direction, she deliberately of her own will subjected herself to the rule of a tyrant. But, tyrant as he was, the effects of his tyranny did not fall upon the mass of the people and by his even-handed justice, his strong government, capable administration, sound fiscal laws, and advancement of the material prosperity of the country, Cosimo I made the condition of the inhabitants of Tuscany one altogether superior to any which they had ever known before. End of section 28 Read by Jane Bennett Section 29 of The Medici, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young Chapter 25 Francis I, Part 1 The knell of the Medici fortunes has struck. Though muffled at first, its distant tolling can henceforth be heard in the midst of all their grandeur. Almost from the very day that the crown, striven after for so many years, first by Giulio and then by Cosimo, was gained, this family's deterioration, both in abilities and character, set in. The crown, now set above the pale in the family arms, becomes but the signal of departing glory. For one hundred and seventy years we have seen the Medici steadily climbing upwards. For the next hundred and seventy years we see them sinking steadily down to their end. There were pauses in that downward course, but its general tendency was ever the same. And with Francis I, the eldest son of Cosimo, that decline begins. It had begun five years before he actually came to the throne. Cosimo, from the time that he gained the rank of Grand Duke, gave up practically the entire government of the state to Francis, and, adopting an unworthy style of life, apparently disregarded the fact that his son's negligent rule was sowing the seeds of serious harm to the administration of the country. The natural result ensued with extreme rapidity, and within two years of Cosimo's death, misrule and corruption were rampant in every department of the state. Disorganization in the administration of the police and corruption in the judicial tribunals soon produced an enormous growth of crime, and Francis's reign of thirteen years became a continuous record of bad government and social demoralization. So that Tuscany, which, under a good government, might have escaped the general tendencies of the time, under a bad one did not fail to exemplify those tendencies. 
at that period an intense ferocity appeared to have seized upon mankind all regard for human life seemed to have disappeared from europe in the bitter passions which the religious wars and persecutions had stirred up men had grown ruthless in their familiarity with torture and death and wherever we look whether it be in france spain england the netherlands or germany a ferocious and merciless cruelty with a disregard for all justice is the prevailing characteristic of the time with murders and torturings as matters of common daily life tuscany under the misrule of francis i had her share of these experiences and was only so far fortunate in that they were not made still worse by the scourge of war italy though it shared in the general demoralization of the age was owing to the settlement made by the treaty of cateau cambresi able to look on whilst almost every other country was torn by a strife which seemed to turn the wars of the time into the conflicts of tigers one result of this state of things was the view taken regarding the assassination of those upon whom a sentence of death had been passed rulers such as cosimo i and francis i looked upon hired assassins very much as if they were executioners and such rulers seem to have seen no difference between this mode of putting out of life a man whose death had been decreed and that of the formal execution of a condemned prisoner even escape to another country procured no safety since such assassins penetrated into all countries in pursuit of their victim murder and tragedy were thus ever present while each event of the kind was multiplied fourfold in the imaginations of the people francis i was thirty-three years old when he succeeded to the throne the fine portrait of him which was painted by paolo veronese and hangs in the state apartments of the pitti palace shows him as he was at about the age of thirty-five he wears the order of the golden fleece and on his cloak the cross of the order of santo stefano he possessed much the same character as his father cosimo and had brilliant mental gifts but whereas his father's chief interest had been the advancement of tuscany that of francis was science and this made all the difference possible to the country since he refused to be drawn from his favorite pursuit to attend to public affairs which consequently lapsed into the condition which has been noted at the same time he inherited his father's tyrannical disposition towards the upper classes with the result that this when combined with general corruption in the administration and a defective fiscal policy caused a hatred to grow up against francis which exceeded even that which had been felt against cosimo and this excessive hatred created a fruitful soil for the growth of every story of crime against francis which fertile brains could originate one of the latter's minor tyrannies was exercised towards his father's morganatic wife camilla martelli on succeeding to the throne francis as the head of the family having according to the laws of italy at that time powers of life and death over all its members consigned camilla to incarceration in a convent and there she remained for the rest of her life the high taxes which he imposed on corn were specially disastrous to the agricultural colonies planted by his father to reclaim the wastelands of the maremma which colonies as a result were ruined and these lands again became waste on the other hand francis continued his father's plans for the development of legorn but the chief steps in this work were taken subsequently by his brother ferdinand and the great success achieved belongs to the reign of the latter in each generation from the time of cosimo pater patrie in fourteen twenty eight to that of francis i in fifteen seventy five every new head of the house had to meet an attack led by one or other of the principal families of florence that which came upon francis was dealt with by him 
with less rigor than his father had displayed in 1537, but nevertheless with a severity which brought him into great odium. In the first year of his reign, he discovered a widespread plot to assassinate him, which had been formed by various members of the Pucci, Ridolfi, Caponi, and Machiavelli families. When discovered by Francis, it was asserted that the plot had been abandoned, and this appears to have been true. Nevertheless, he proceeded to deal out the severest punishment. All who had been concerned in the plot who did not make their escape were seized and put to death. Many other persons declared to have been privy to it were also punished, and a vigorous confiscation of all property connected with them took place. The result was that a large number of the principal Florentine families were brought to degradation, which created an undying hatred against Francis among all the well-to-do classes of Florence. It was an inauspicious beginning to a new reign. On the ruler of Tuscany becoming a crowned head, all the ceremonial of the court of a reigning sovereign had been introduced, and Francis, probably chiefly to gratify the desire of his wife, the Archduchess Joanna, kept up a great deal more state than his father had done. The court was maintained almost on the lines of that of Spain, which Francis made, in all particulars, his model. Quote, a number of gentlemen, divided in two departments, attended to the various branches of the household. Sixty pages from the principal families of Italy and Germany were maintained and educated at the palace in all the accomplishments and depravity of the day, but still without neglecting the arts and sciences or the use of arms, equitation, and all the various acquirements of a gentleman." In 1576, the emperor Maximilian II, Francis's brother-in-law, without making any allusion to the action which the pope had taken in the matter seven years before, not only formally conferred on Francis the rank of Grand Duke, but created Tuscany a Grand Duchy which the Pope had been unable to do. A few months later, Maximilian II died and was succeeded as emperor by his eldest son, Rudolf II. In the summer of this year, 1576, the second year of Francis's reign, two terrible tragedies in his family, occurring within one week, cast a black pall over the ducal palace. The family, at this time, consisted of Francis, with his wife Joanna and their children, his youngest brother Pietro, married two years before to a niece of their mother, named, like her, Eleonora di Toledo, and his sister Isabella. The latter had continued to live at Florence after her father Cosimo's death, the proceedings of her husband, the prince of Bracciano, not being of a nature to cause her to desire to make the Orsini Palace at Rome her residence. Cardinal Ferdinand, their remaining brother, lived at Rome. Pietro, the youngest of the eight children of Cosimo and Eleonora, deprived of his mother at eight years old and disliked by his brothers, had grown up passionate, jealous, dissolute, and without a redeeming quality of any kind, and was now twenty-two. His young wife, Eleonora, by this time nearly twenty, was universally pitied when, at fifteen, she came to Florence, a very beautiful and innocent young girl, to be married to him. This ill-assorted young couple lived in the Medici Palace in the Via Larga. Pietro, altogether given up to an evil life, had a distaste for matrimony, and from the first treated Eleonora as badly as possible. He scandalized even the society of that time by his disgraceful orgies, while his young wife was left neglected and an object of pity. The natural results followed. Eleonora, made for love but cast aside and neglected, fell in love with an agreeable and handsome youth of about her own age, Bernardino Antinori. Not long afterwards, one of his friends quarreled with Bernardino, and attacked him in the narrow passage 
running along the south side of the Strozzi Palace, and Bernardino, in defending his life, killed his assailant. He at once gave himself up to the authorities and was confined as a prisoner in the palace of his family until the Grand Duke's pleasure regarding him should be known. Eleonora, fearing for his life, was wild with grief and, regardless of appearances, drove round and round the Antinori palace in the hope of seeing and speaking with him at some window, but failed to see him. Bernardino was exiled to Elba. From thence he dispatched a letter to Eleonora by what he supposed a trustworthy hand, but through a chapter of accidents the letter was taken to Francis and at once caused Bernardino's condemnation to death. He was brought back to Florence, consigned to the Bargello, given only one hour to prepare for death, and executed on the 20th June. Eleonora's own fate followed quickly. On the 11th July, she received a summons from Pietro to meet him at the villa of Caffagiolo, about 15 miles from Florence on the Faenza Road, leaving her four-year-old son Cosimo in Florence. Dreading the worst, she embraced her little son again and again in an agony of tears, and then set out for Caffagiolo, quote, plunged in grief, and with a trembling heart. End quote. She reached there in the evening. Pietro made her sup with him, and then, drawing his sword, killed her. Her body was at once placed in a coffin and carried that same night into Florence, where it was buried in the new sacristy in San Lorenzo. There, thirty two years afterwards, it was seen when, in 1608, the work on the new mausoleum was being executed. Francesco Settimani, in his diary, says, quote, The writer from whom this account has been taken adds that in the year 1608 he saw the body of the said Lady Eleonora on the occasion when it was exhumed from the new sacristy and carried to the vault, and that she was as beautiful as if living, without the corpse being in the least corrupted or injured and appeared exactly as if sleeping, and was dressed all in white. End quote. Eleonora's little son, Cosimo, died a few months after his mother, and is buried in one corner of the mausoleum. This story of Eleonora's murder is that which has always been believed, and it is to some extent corroborated by the fact that there is no tablet to her memory in the family mausoleum, at the same time, it must be remembered that the story did not appear until a subsequent generation, and is not authenticated in any way, so that we may be doing both Pietro and Francis a severe injustice if we accept it as undoubtedly true. At the time it occurred, her death was declared to have been due to heart disease, while it is noticeable that the writer who describes having seen her body thirty-two years afterwards in so perfect a state of preservation saw no sign of wounds, which is peculiar if she were killed with the sword in the manner which had been related by him. After this episode, Pietro was sent by Francis to the court of Spain, where he resided almost entirely for the rest of his life, becoming as much hated there as he was in Florence, and a constant thorn in the side of Tuscany. End of section 29 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 30 of The Medici, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young Chapter 25, Francis I, Part 2 Five days after this sudden death of Francis's sister-in-law, a second dreadful occurrence took place in connection with his sister Isabella. In this case, a Medici was the victim, not the perpetrator of the crime. 
Isabella was the most beautiful of the three daughters of Cosimo I and Eleonora di Toledo. Clever and highly accomplished, she was also of a kind-hearted disposition, and is said to have been the only one of the family who showed kindness to Bianca Capello. Quote, Wit, beauty, and talent made her conspicuous among all the ladies of the day, and she captivated every heart but her husband's. Speaking French, Spanish, and Latin fluently, a perfect musician, singing beautifully, a poetess, and improvisatrice by nature, Isabella was the soul of all around her, and the fairest star of the Medici. End quote. But it was her fate to be involved in, and to be the first victim of, a celebrated fourfold tragedy which caused the ruin of the great house of Orsini. She was now thirty-four, and had been for eighteen years married to Paolo Giordano Orsini, prince of Bracciano, the head of the most powerful family in Rome, a race who for generations had made and unmade popes and intermarried with kings, and who possessed fortresses and domains all over Italy. The tragedy in which Isabella's life terminated is that connected with Vittoria Accoramboni, the four persons who all lost their lives in it being Francesco Peretti, Vittoria's husband, Vittoria herself, Paolo Giordano Orsini, and Isabella de' Medici. Vittoria Accoramboni, young, beautiful, vain, and ambitious, had captivated Orsini, who, indolent, pleasure-seeking, and no longer young, cared nothing for the wife whom he left to live in Florence while he spent his time in Rome. Vittoria, fired with the ambition of being the princess of Bracciano, practically told Orsini, who was infatuated with her, that he must kill her husband and his own wife and marry her. He, as head of the house of Orsini, with absolute powers of life and death over all members of his family, saw no difficulty, and proceeded to carry out her injunctions by first putting to death Isabella, and then, as soon as opportunity offered, by similarly disposing of Peretti. Isabella, who had some suspicion of danger to herself, had written to Catherine de' Medici, begging her to afford her an asylum, as nowhere in Italy could she be safe from the far-reaching power of Orsini, and Catherine had replied agreeing to do so, and had made arrangements to receive her, but it was too late. On the 16th July, Isabella, already horror-stricken at her young sister-in-law's sudden death a few days before, and made still more uneasy by her husband's unexpected and mysterious arrival at Florence, accompanied him by his request to their villa of Seretto Guidi, near Empoli. She went with great misgivings, which she confided on the way thither to her friend Lucrezia Frescobaldi, whom she took with her. When they retired after supper to their own apartments for the night, her husband, Orsini, while pretending to kiss Isabella, suddenly slipped a noose round her beautiful neck, and, after a violent struggle, strangled her. He had prepared for this crime by making a hole in the ceiling of the room, and stationing four men in the room above, from which a rope with a noose at the end of it was let down through the hole, and concealed behind the curtains of the window until the moment came that it was required. The room being intentionally kept rather dark, this passed unobserved by Isabella, enabling him to effect successfully his cruel purpose. It was given out that she had died from a fit of apoplexy while bathing her head. This was followed in due time by the assassination of Peretti, Orsini sending a party of his soldiers to seize and kill the latter at the Villa Negroni in Rome where Peretti was betrayed into their hands by Vittoria, and killed. The sequel is well known. Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, guessing how and why these two had met their deaths, refused to allow Orsini to marry the widowed Vittoria. 
Orsini defied the Pope and went through a mock marriage. The Pope then sent troops to arrest the murderer of Peretti, but the Orsini retainers beat them off. Eventually, Vittoria was seized and imprisoned in the castle of Sant'Angelo, but escaped. For four years the struggle went on, Orsini and Vittoria living at Bracciano, outside the Pope's jurisdiction. Then Gregory the Thirteenth died, 1585, whereupon they came to Rome to be married before another Pope should be elected, and the ceremony was hastily performed in the small family church inside the Orsini fortress. Within a few hours, to their horror, it was proclaimed that the Cardinal of Montalto, Francesco Peretti's uncle, had been elected as the new pope, and they had to face the terrible Sixtus V, bent upon exacting vengeance for his nephew's murder. Orsini fled to Venice, was exiled, and then, broken in heart at the ruin of his family, died after making a will leaving his remaining property to Vittoria, who had fled to Padua. But her husband's nearest relation, Ludovico Orsini, enraged at the property being left to her, suddenly burst into her house at midnight, six weeks later, with a party of masked men, and she was stabbed to the heart. Venice, however, did not permit such acts of private war, and a week afterwards Ludovico Orsini was himself arrested and put to death. And the ruin of the great Orsini family was complete. They never again recovered their former power. In 1578, Francis's first wife, Joanna of Austria, died at the age of 31. She had been married 13 years and had not had a happy life. She had no qualities to make her either liked by her husband or popular with the Tuscan people, being plain in appearance, of a cold nature, without personal charm, and imbued with a great deal of Austrian pride. And this first Grand Duchess of Tuscany did not hide her contempt for the Tuscan monarchy and the Tuscan people. Francis had never shown her the least affection, and during the whole of their married life was devoted to Bianca Capello, with whom he had been in love before his marriage to Joanna, and whom, after the latter's death, he married. And the unceasing complaints which Joanna addressed to her brother, the Emperor Maximilian, on the subject of her husband's behavior, did not make matters go more smoothly. Joanna's six children were Eleonora, born in 1565, Romola, born 1566, Isabella, born 1567, Anna, born 1569, Maria, born 1573, and Filippo, born 1577. But only two of these, Eleonora and Maria, survived childhood, while Romola and Isabella died before their mother. There is a peculiarity about both the portraits of Joanna in the Uffizi Gallery. In both, she is shown with her little son, Filippo. He was only ten months old when his mother died, yet in the portrait of her shown in this book, he is represented as a child about two years old, and in her other portrait as about four years old. Unless, therefore, these portraits of her were painted several years after her death, and after Francis had married another wife, which is extremely unlikely, it would seem that the figure of the child must have been added afterwards, though with what object, since he died at the age of five, is not apparent. Joanna of Austria was buried in the church of San Lorenzo, and when, in 1857, the Medici coffins were opened, her body was found so well preserved by the embalming process employed as to appear only just buried, even the color of the face being unaltered. The year after Joanna's death, Francis married Bianca Capello, whose unvarying lover he had been for fifteen years. 
The remaining nine years of his reign were almost entirely devoid of incident, either political or domestic, and his interests became more and more centered in those studies in natural science to which he was devoted. Francis had an absolute passion for chemistry and natural science. By far, the greater part of his time was spent in his laboratory, and so reluctant was he to be drawn away from his experiments that he would often give audience to his secretaries of state standing before his furnace, bellows in hand. It was he who first discovered the method of melting rock crystal, and he became distinguished for his skill and taste in making vases in this material, many of which are still to be seen in the gem room of the Uffizi Gallery. He was also the first to achieve the manufacture of porcelain in imitation of the Chinese, and he founded the existing porcelain industry of Florence, which has attained much celebrity. Francis had also the usual Medician fondness for art and literature. He gave liberal encouragement to all artists, and in particular to Giovanni da Bologna, 1524-1608, the leading sculptor of the day, and it was for Francis that the latter executed the well-known statue of Mercury now in the museum of the Bargello. For Francis was also executed by the same sculptor the group of the Rape of the Sabines which now stands in the Loggia de Lanzi, and the statue of Abundance placed at the highest point of the Boboli Gardens, facing the palace, and said to represent Francis's first wife, Joanna of Austria. His desire to promote the cause of literature resulted in the foundation in 1582 of the celebrated Accademia della Crusca, which still exists, and which was founded under his auspices by Francesco Grazzini and Leonardo Salviati for the purification of the Italian language. Its name, Crusca, Bran, referring to the sifting of the chaff from the flower. But there was another work undertaken by Francis which had more important consequences. He was the first to begin arranging the building which we now know as the Uffizi Gallery, to adapt it for a picture gallery, and to begin placing there some of the family collection of pictures. Cosimo had erected the lower part of the building to accommodate the various public offices of the state, and on the second story had placed ranges of workshops where his skilled workmen engraved, painted, made inlaid tables, executed models for statues, distilled essences, and carried on many other minor arts. Above this second floor was an open loggia, being part of the passaggio leading from the Palazzo Vecchio to the Ducal Palace. This loggia Francis now caused to be enclosed with glass, placing the architect and sculptor Buontalenti in charge of the work, and conveyed there a number of the family pictures scattered among their various villas. Buontalenti, at the same time, executed the statue of Francis in the dress of a Roman knight, placed over the portico at the southern end of the gallery, facing the Palazzo Vecchio. Thus was begun a work which, after generations of the Medici, made one of Florence's greatest possessions. The great naval war between England and Spain, the terrible conflict in France, the battles and atrocities deluging the Netherlands with blood, were the events taking place in other countries, while Florence was laying the foundations of her great picture gallery. And the peace which she thus enjoyed made her lot by comparison happy, even though under the tyranny of Francis I. In 1582, Francis lost his only son, Filippo, at the age of five. This was a serious loss to him, as he had no children by his second wife, and the crown would therefore go at his death to his brother Ferdinand, between whom and himself there was no love lost. In 1583, Francis gave his eldest daughter Eleonora, now eighteen, in marriage to Vincenzo Gonzaga, Duke of Mantua. Eleonora's portrait by Pulzone in the Pitti Gallery 
shows her to have had considerable beauty. Her dress is chiefly remarkable for its splendid example of the well-known Medici collar, which has round its edge a string of small pearls. In the same year, Francis's daughter Anna died at the age of fourteen. Thus, out of his six children, four had died in their childhood. One daughter was married, and there only remained to him his daughter Maria, at this time a child of ten. Francis I continued his father Cosimo's practice of private trading and operating on a large scale amassed great wealth, and at his death a vast amount of treasure was found to have been collected by him in the fortress of the Belvedere. He died in October 1587 at the villa of Poggio a Cayano at the age of 46, his wife Bianca dying at the same time and his brother Ferdinand succeeded to the throne. End of section 30 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 31 of The Medici, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 25. Francis I, Part 3. Bianca Capello. Bianca Capello's romantic history and celebrated beauty have made a great impression in Italy. Pictures of her are numerous, and her story in various forms is related in every chronicle of the time. And, lavish as has been the praise accorded to her beauty, scarcely less so has been the abuse showered upon her name. While she must certainly be held to deserve a portion of this condemnation, by far the greater part has been quite undeserved. Francis loved her with a steadfast affection for twenty-four years, never showing any regard for anyone else, and the deep hatred felt for Francis attached itself also to any one for whom he showed any regard, and most of all, therefore, to Bianca Capello. Added to this, she was a Venetian. For over a hundred years, Venice had been Florence's bitter foe and rival. In almost every war, they had been opposed to each other. Every enemy of Florence found an asylum out of reach of her wrath at Venice. Even in the domain of art they were rivals, and no Venetian need expect to be received at Florence with a welcome. Lastly, Bianca was, throughout life, strongly hated by Francis's brother Ferdinand, who succeeded him as Grand Duke, and all who wished to curry favor with the latter had an easy means of doing so by inventing stories against her after her death. These three causes together resulted in the imputation of crimes to Bianca by the Florentines, of which her character was altogether incapable. All Francis's tyrannies were, by those who suffered from them, placed on her shoulders, and the more they hated Francis, the more they attributed the cause of his acts to the Venetian to whom he was so devoted. Bianca Capello was the daughter of one of the proudest and most illustrious of the nobles of Venice, Bartolomeo Capello, and was brought up in all the splendor and luxury customary in a noble Venetian family of that age. She had, in a pre-eminent degree, that quality sometimes seen of an inherent and unstudied attractiveness, independent of beauty, while in her case to this was added beauty also. It may be imagined that the combination made her irresistible. Quote, Grace and fascination hung round her movements, and whether grave or gay, silent or speaking, quiet or in motion, she was always completely attractive while without any particular regularity of features, she concentrated within herself the varied influence of every feminine beauty. End quote. 
no wonder that titian desired to paint her portrait especially as an addition to her other attractions she had hair of that beautiful auburn red tint only seen in venice and so admired of all artists his portrait of her at the age of twenty-one plate sixty six is one of the most beautiful of titian's portraits about the year fifteen sixty when bianca was seventeen she fell in love with a youth a year or two older than herself belonging to a florentine family named piero buonaventura a gentleman by birth but whose family were in reduced circumstances while he himself was a clerk in the salviati bank which was situated in one of the narrow streets of venice exactly opposite the capello palace her family would have killed her rather than allow such a marriage and they were married secretly but an accident threatened suddenly to reveal what they had done and they had at a moment's notice to fly for their lives piero hurried his young wife into a gondola they escaped by sea and eventually reached florence where his father and mother were living in great poverty all venice was horrified at such an insult to its proud aristocracy the capello family were powerful and the whole venetian nobility vowed vengeance on piero for his intolerable audacity a reward of two thousand ducats was offered to any one who would murder him and his uncle giambattista buonaventura was thrown into prison and there died meanwhile in florence bianca had no easy lot piero's mother was bedridden his father unable to support this addition of two extra members to his family was forced to discharge their only servant and the luxuriously brought up daughter of a venetian noble had to take the servant's place and become a household drudge at the same time fear for piero's life and dread on bianca's part of falling into her enraged father's hands kept them both prisoners that bianca bore uncomplainingly all that this great change must have meant to her for the sake of her love for piero who after all showed himself a worthless creature speaks well for her natural good-heartedness she was despised hard-worked condemned by all and execrated by the whole aristocracy of venice but she cared not so long as piero remained true to her during this time of their poverty a daughter was born to them pellegrina buonaventura who afterwards married ulisse bentivoglio in the year fifteen sixty three francis then twenty-two the eldest son of the duke of florence crossing one day the piazza san marco looked up and saw bianca whose story all florence knew at a window and at once fell in love with her she was then twenty and at the height of her beauty soon afterwards she was entrapped into a meeting with him at the house of the marchesa mondragone the wife of francis's spanish tutor who lived at the house called the casino on the west side of the piazza san marco Quote, startled by the prince's sudden and unexpected appearance in a private room she fell on her knees declared herself bankrupt of everything but honor and implored his forbearance and protection and for a time he obeyed and left her alone End quote. soon however he began pursuing her with his attentions even fears for piero's life contributed while the latter heartless and contemptible who was tired of her and of their poverty-stricken life failed to protect her in any way and accepted an office which francis procured for him at the court and allowed a palace to be taken for them in the via maggio near the ducal palace piero thus promoted became proud insolent dissolute and generally detested and after a short time was one evening murdered at the corner of the via maggio near the ponte santa trinita by one of the ricci family whom he had insulted francis remained bianca's devoted lover all his life and his marriage to the archduchess joanna of austria 
in December 1564, when Bianca was 21, made no difference in this. When not at work in his laboratory, he spent most of his time at Bianca's house in the Via Maggio. The Archduchess Joanna, furious at this neglect of herself in favor of a rival so far beneath her in rank, wearied her brother the emperor with complaints, but without avail. And when she died in April 1578, Francis married Bianca, who was by this time 35. At first, on account of the recent death of Joanna of Austria, they were privately married in the small chapel in the Palazzo Vecchio, but in the following year this was succeeded by a very magnificent marriage in San Lorenzo, while at the same time, strange to say, a grand ceremony in honor of the event took place at Venice. Venice, which had cast ignominy upon Bianca's very name, now hastened to do it honor, and not only received with a stately ceremonial and hypocritical compliments an embassy from Florence on the occasion, but promulgated a public decree in Bianca's honor, while the city of the Adriatic blazed with countless illuminations. This was followed by a pompous embassy from Venice to Florence to invest Bianca, quote, with the prerogatives of her new rank, end quote. Bianca was unlike her predecessor in another respect. She did not care for ostentation and the degree of ceremony attaching to a high position. But Francis was determined on this occasion to show her every kind of honor that he could devise. There followed tournaments, bullfights, balls, feasts, and every sort of pastime for the people. And finally, on the 12th October, 1579, in the great hall of the Palazzo Vecchio, an imposing ceremony took place, at which Bianca was first declared by the Venetian ambassador to be, quote, a true and particular daughter of Venice, end quote, and then, seated by the side of her husband Francis, was crowned with the crown of Tuscany, after which the whole assembly, led by the Grand Duke and the new Grand Duchess, proceeded in state to the cathedral, where High Mass concluded the ceremony. Francis spent on this marriage 300,000 ducats, equal to about one year's ordinary revenue of the ancient republic. Bianca Capello was Grand Duchess for nine years. In that position she continued to be very much the same as she had always been, not showing any exaltation on account of being raised to so high a rank, nor any desire for pomp and grandeur, and preferring, whenever possible, a country life with Francis at one or other of their villas, removed from Florence and its abuse of her. For Francis's tyrannies continued to heap condemnation upon her head, and whatever untoward event occurred, it was always in some manner put down to her. It is almost unnecessary to say that when Francis's only son, Filippo, died in 1582, it was declared that she had poisoned him. And this tale, like others of the kind, was handed down after her death, regardless of the fact that had she been guilty of such a thing, the suspicious Francis would certainly have found it out and lost all his affection for her, as well as of the fact that the one ruling desire which governed all Bianca's life was to please him. But the people had another reason for hating Bianca Capello, and readily accepting every story against her. They believed her to be a witch, and openly called her so. The hint had not improbably been dropped by Ferdinand, but the only kind of witchery that Bianca knew was that of woman's witching ways, and none ever possessed it in a higher degree. And without making light of the one great fault she did commit, it may well be noted in her favor that, although possessed of this exceptional power of attraction, we never hear, amidst all the stories against her promulgated after her death, one single breath charging her with infidelity to Francis, a significant fact under the circumstances. It is also to be noted that all writers credit her not only with considerable talent, but also with various good qualities. 
Her portrait by Bronzino in the Pitti Gallery at the age of 30 has a sweet expression. He knew her well, and it is sure to be a good likeness. It must have been the last portrait that Bronzino ever painted, as he died very shortly afterwards. The feeling with which Bianca was regarded by her brother-in-law Ferdinand, who lived at Rome and was on bad terms with Francis, was a prominent factor in her lot. The inclination which the Florentines had to attribute to Bianca every crime committed or imagined to have been committed by Francis was felt by Ferdinand, quote, her most deadly enemy, end quote, to a still greater degree. And he, over and over again, remonstrated with Francis for having anything to do with her, and endeavored to get her banished from Tuscany. The hatred he felt for her amounted to a mania, and his refusal after her death to allow her body decent burial, his causing her armorial bearings to be erased, and his speaking of her on all occasions in terms of opprobrium, showed how deep was the feeling which, unappeased even by her death, was nourished by him for so many years against her. When he became Grand Duke, the time-serving contemporary writers followed suit, heaping upon her memory every possible vilification, and handing down every tale which a scandal-loving age could invent to her discredit. And this is the real origin of the many stories which have passed as the history of Bianca Capello. The true Bianca was a less exaggerated and far more natural woman. She had many faults, but they did not run in the direction of murder and poison, as a sensation-loving populace ready to believe anything against a Venetian confidently asserted. After Bianca became Grand Duchess, she summoned her brother Vittorio Capello to Florence, and he soon became a great favorite with Francis and almost his sole adviser. This still further incensed Ferdinand, and after a time he contrived to put such pressure upon his brother as to cause him to dismiss Vittorio Capello again to Venice. Many of Bianca's letters to her brother, in her clear, bold handwriting, are to be seen in the Florentine archives, and they show both her character and how highly educated she was. Bianca is reported to have shown a good spirit towards her brother-in-law Ferdinand on various occasions, constantly endeavoring to reconcile the two brothers, and by her amiability at times succeeding temporarily in doing so while, as a part of these endeavors, she several times persuaded Francis to give large sums of money to Ferdinand to supply his financial necessities, these latter being very great owing to his expensive tastes in the collection of the treasures of Greek art. At last, in 1587, came the end, Francis and Bianca both dying together, and at that place, which above all they would have chosen, the villa of Poggio a Cayano. Notable on many other accounts, this villa has ever since gained its chief interest as the place where the lives were simultaneously ended of these two, who, whatever else they were, had been unswervingly devoted to each other for twenty-four years. The villa of Poggio a Cayano since the days when it had been built by Lorenzo the Magnificent, had been much enlarged and improved by successive heads of the family. Its great hall had, under the auspices of Leo X, been decorated with frescoes typifying the deeds of Cosimo Pater Patrie and Lorenzo the Magnificent, frescoes which had been, in succession, the work of Andrea del Sarto, Pontormo, Francia Biggio and Allori. The ceiling and walls of its dining room had been painted so as to give the illusion of being seated in a Tuscan garden. The reception rooms were hung with portraits of prominent members of the family. The wide-spreading park, with the ombrone flowing through it, afforded the pleasures of the chase. The well-laid-out gardens were an unceasing delight to all who saw them while from the broad terrace 
spread out a view exemplifying all the special beauty of a Tuscan landscape. Poggio Accaiano had always been a favorite residence of Bianca Capello, and she and Francis had spent many days there together, hunting in the park, riding about the surrounding country, and enjoying other outdoor pursuits. In October 1587, they went there to enjoy once more its charms at that beautiful season of the year, and to revel in a country life away from the formalities of the court. But they had also another reason. The sincere endeavors which all writers acknowledge that Bianca constantly made to conciliate Ferdinand and heal the breach between the brothers had once more been successful. A reconciliation had been effected, and to cement it, Francis and Bianca had invited Ferdinand to come from Rome and join them in a visit to Poggio a Cagliano. Accordingly, Ferdinand arrived at Florence, was received at the Ducal Palace by Francis and Bianca with every sign of cordiality, and, together with the Archbishop of Florence, accompanied them to Poggio a Cagliano. There they remained for some days in complete harmony, the Grand Duchess and the Archbishop exerting themselves to maintain these cordial relations between the brothers who had so long been at enmity. But this happy state of affairs had a melancholy ending. On the 8th October, the whole party went out hunting. During the day, the Grand Duke, while violently heated, sat down by a small lake in the park and caught a severe chill, ending in fever, which he insisted on treating himself, taking for it some of the most unheard of medicines with which his chemical researches had made him acquainted, notwithstanding that his indisposition steadily grew worse and was accompanied with violent sickness. On the ninth day of this illness, his malady took a more serious turn. This was increased by Bianca's inability to nurse him, as she was accustomed to do, she having been herself taken ill on the 13th October of a bad type of fever. Francis became rapidly worse, and after 48 hours of great agony, expired on the 19th October. Meanwhile, Bianca, seriously ill at the same time and unable to go to her husband, was consumed with anxiety about him, and her enquiries for him were incessant. She had always been accustomed to say that, between her death and his, hours, not days, would elapse. And so it proved. After six days' illness, feeling herself to be dying, and not knowing that her husband was already dead, she sent him her parting words by her confessor, Fra Maranta, weeping, as she said, quote, Give my farewell to my lord Francesco de' Medici, and say to him that I have always been most faithful and most loving towards him. Tell him that my illness is made so great because of his, and beg him to pardon it if I have ever offended him in anything. End quote. In order to prevent her hearing sounds from the apartment of the Grand Duke, which was near hers, such as would reveal to her that he was dead, his body was carried down to a room on the ground floor of the villa but the unusual trampling of feet in the passages, the agitated and tearful aspect of her attendants, and the noise of carriages and horses in the open space below as Ferdinand and the archbishop took their hasty departure to Florence, soon awakened her to the knowledge that Francis was dead. For a while she lay silent. Then, after murmuring a few broken sentences, she breathed a very deep sigh and said calmly, And likewise, also it accords with my own wish that I should die with my lord. After which she became too ill to speak, and soon afterwards expired, dying eleven hours after her husband. Of course it was inevitable under the circumstances that Ferdinand should be suspected of having poisoned them both, the fact that by the death of his brother he succeeded to the throne, joined with his well-known hatred of Bianca, made his guilt apparently certain. He at once ordered a post-mortem examination of the two bodies, and the doctors reported that there was no trace of poison in either case. But naturally, such a report carried little weight, so that the common theory, 
has always been that Francis and Bianca were poisoned by Ferdinand. Side by side with this theory, however, there has been another. Bianca had been too long a subject of vituperation for an endeavor not to be made in some way to throw the guilt upon her, however difficult in this case to do so. Hence we have the well-known story of the tart supposed to have been prepared by Bianca in order to poison Ferdinand, but eaten by accident by Francis, and that Bianca, seeing this, eat of it also, being determined not to survive him, a story which, notwithstanding its almost palpable untruth, has obtained wide credence. The account, however, given above of this affair, which is that disclosed by the state archives, unearthed within recent years by the patient research of the late Signor G. E. Saltini, shows plainly that Bianca was not even present when Francis became seriously ill, she having then been for four days ill in bed. And it is now considered certain, not only that Bianca was perfectly innocent, which is almost self-evident, but that Ferdinand was innocent also. All historians are now convinced that it was no case of poison at all, and that Francis and Bianca died from the natural causes assigned by the doctors as the result of the post-mortem examination, Bianca from dropsy, from which she had suffered for two years, and which was aggravated by her attack of fever, and Francis chiefly through the absurd remedies which he persisted in taking to cure his indisposition. Moreover, Ferdinand's history during the succeeding twenty-two years as Grand Duke showed very distinctly that he was not the kind of man who could be guilty of such a crime. Ferdinand, however, inspired by his inordinate hatred of Bianca, was led into conduct which was extremely short-sighted. He not only refused to allow her decent burial, but also ordered the destruction of everything that could recall her memory. He caused her armorial bearings to be erased from the escutcheon of the Medici and replaced by those of Austria, when obliged to mention her name, would not give her or allow others to give her the title of Grand Duchess, and, even in a public document, designated her as La Pessima Bianca, by this conduct, Ferdinand used the best means possible for making it supposed that he desired to divert suspicion from himself and for confirming in men's minds the idea that he was guilty. The two bodies were together brought back to Florence. That of Francis was embalmed and buried in the church of San Lorenzo with the ceremonial customary in the case of a grand duke. But when the architect Buontalenti asked Ferdinand where the body of the Grand Duchess should be buried, he replied, Where you please, we will not have her amongst us. Her body was, therefore, wrapped simply in an ordinary winding sheet, and buried without ceremony, none know where. And so, among the Grand Duchesses of Tuscany, one, the second, is missing from that great mausoleum, where all the rest lie buried and in its crypt francis i has by his side the first wife whom he so disliked and who was grand duchess for four years but not the second wife who was grand duchess for nine and was the only person whom throughout life he had loved or who loved him but to bianca it mattered nothing to what obscurity her body was consigned for her memory has lived on notwithstanding all ferdinand's efforts to obliterate it while the accusations so freely spread abroad against her have gradually shown themselves to be untrue bianca capello was forty-four when she died undoubtedly notwithstanding all that can justly be said on the other side she was a woman who deserved a better record than the distorted picture of her which was handed down to posterity owing to the insensate hatred entertained for her by the brother of her husband, who succeeded him as Grand Duke. Regarding her one grave fault, it has been remarked that, quote, thrown while yet a mere girl into temptation, distress, and danger, with a warm heart and strong sensibility, her natural protector false, despicable, and utterly selfish, assailed by unwanted hardship and suffering, 
reduced from the splendor and refinement of exalted station to perform the menial offices of a starving household with a youthful prince at her feet and the glimmer of a throne in the distance she finally sank under temptation and became probably not all that her enemies have described her in an age of infidelity she was at least faithful to the grand duke and probably would have been faithful to her husband had he taken any pains to keep her so End quote. bianca capello in fact shows herself as one in whom throughout life love reigned supreme and the true essence of her character is seen in the girl who abandoned all the grandeur and luxury belonging to a venetian noble's daughter for the man she loved and in the wife who felt that it quote, accorded with her own wish to die with her lord end quote, and when she knew that he was dead had no desire to live any longer end of section thirty one Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 32 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter Twenty Six Ferdinand the First, Part One. Ferdinand, the fourth son of Cosimo the First and Eleonora di Toledo, who had been made a cardinal when he was fourteen, at the time of the death of his mother and his brothers, Giovanni and Garcia, was twenty five years old when his father died and his brother Francis succeeded to the throne he and francis differed violently on every subject it merely required that a proposal should emanate from one of them for it to be opposed by the other and after a time they kept altogether apart during the thirteen years of his brother's reign ferdinand resided entirely at rome where he became a strong power at the vatican though a cardinal he never took holy orders fierce haughty bold and independent and at the head of a powerful faction in the curia he feared no pope whatever on one occasion he withstood even the ferocious and tyrannical sixtus v on the subject of wearing arms and armor in the vatican which he ferdinand de medici declined to abandon at another time he by his boldness and resource saved the life of his friend cardinal farnese the latter had been condemned by sixtus v to be executed and the hour for his execution fixed but ferdinand put on all the clocks in the vatican by one hour and then boldly facing the pope petitioned for farnese's pardon and practically forced the pope to grant it the latter however only doing so because he thought that the hour for farnese's execution was already passed then ferdinand stopped the execution on the authority he had extracted from the pope and his friend's life was saved at rome ferdinand signalized himself in two ways he showed much capacity in the administration of ecclesiastical affairs being notable in particular as the founder of the great missionary establishment the propaganda and he was still more distinguished as a great collector of the works of classic art it was a time in rome when the greater part of the collections of sculpture of the classic age which had been unearthed and gathered together in the vatican by popes julius the second leo the tenth clement the seventh and paul the third had been scattered by subsequent popes who cared nothing about art and in ferdinand's time the popes had not yet begun again to take any interest in such things ferdinand on the other hand inheriting the same tastes as his ancestors purchased eagerly all such works which he could obtain and became the chief collector of the time in rome he built the celebrated villa medici at rome 
and there he collected an immense number of the most priceless works of greek and roman sculpture these included the venus de medici found in the villa of hadrian at tivoli the group of niobe and her children found near the porta san paolo in fifteen eighty three the dancing fawn the wrestlers the knife whetter the apollino and many statues of classic times busts of roman emperors and other works of antiquity which were all subsequently removed by degrees to florence by him or his successors and now adorn the staircases and corridors of the uffizi gallery thus ferdinand before he was grand duke purchased out of his own private funds the six best examples of greek art which florence possesses and except the apollo belvedere the laucon and the torso of hercules the best which were at that time known as regards the venus which being purchased by ferdinand immediately it was found henceforth received his family name it is too much the fashion to decry its excellence solely because a former generation erred in the opposite direction it has been said that this statue cannot be understood at a single visit while byron's well-known words about it remain as true as ever of the apollino shelley said that it was like a spirit even in dreams ferdinand was thirty-eight years old when his brother francis died as the latter left no son ferdinand resigned his cardinal's rank together with a good prospect of being the next pope and succeeded his brother as grand duke of tuscany his conduct with reference to bianca capello is not to be looked upon as a true indication of his character but rather as a monomania on that particular point his whole conduct during the long period of twenty-two years that he was grand duke and as such a mark for the searching hostile criticism of those who watched for any cause of offence in the head of this family showed him to be a man of high character whose life gave no cause of offence to any two medici grand dukes preceded him and four followed him but he was superior to them all for though his achievements great as they were did not equal those of his father cosimo this high character and exemplary conduct more than restored the balance on ascending the throne ferdinand reversed the previously existing foreign policy of siding with spain and began to establish relations with france thus returning to tuscany's older policy unlike francis he had always been on friendly terms with catherine de medici and before the year fifteen eighty seven was ended he had arranged with her that her favorite granddaughter christine of lorraine then twenty-two should be given to him in marriage this was however for some little time delayed first by the sudden death of christine's father the duke of lorraine and then by the disturbances in france nor did the marriage appear a very propitious one rumors were rife at the french court which declared that the proposed bridegroom was the murderer of his brother and sister-in-law while in the existing condition of france it was thought unsafe for christine at present to take the journey for it was a troubled time spain's great armada was about to sail to attack england and spain was laying plans to obtain possession of french ports while in france civil war was raging the league being in possession of paris and the king henry the third with the states-general having to take refuge at blois ferdinand sent an embassy headed by orazio rucellai to escort christine to florence but they had to remain at blois until march fifteen eighty nine before it was safe for her to travel and during this time much occurred in july fifteen eighty eight the armada made its attack on england and in a fortnight was entirely destroyed meanwhile catherine de medici was evidently dying and christine could not leave her in december the murder at blois of the duke of guise threw all the court into confusion and terror 
On the 5th January, 1589, Catherine de' Medici died, Christine being with her to the last, and in March the latter started from Blois on a somewhat melancholy journey, all the court being sorry to lose one who was universally liked, and she herself being very sad at bidding good-bye to France. She was accompanied for a long distance from Blois by a brilliant cavalcade, including Henry III himself, who showed her great affection at parting. At Marseilles, she and her escort found the fleet which had been waiting there for her for months, and in due course she arrived at Florence. The marriage festivities at Florence lasted a month and were on the most splendid scale. Quote, Florence resembled the city of a fairy tale rather than the sober habitation of common men. In the courtyard of the palace, the storming of a Turkish fortress was represented with inimitable talent. A magnificent tournament followed, and this was succeeded by a sumptuous banquet. But after the guests had refreshed themselves, they found that the courtyard of the palace had been converted into a mimic sea, and a spirited naval combat ensued and made the walls re-echo to its thunders. End quote. Christine of Lorraine made Ferdinand an excellent wife. On the death of her mother, she had been adopted by her grandmother Catherine de' Medici and entirely brought up by her, and is described on her arrival at Florence as, quote, full of grace, vivacity, and spirit, end quote. She survived her husband, Ferdinand I, for 27 years, her son, Cosimo II, for 16 years, and was appointed by the latter regent of Tuscany during the long minority of his son, Ferdinand II. She was thus the leading social influence at Florence during the greater part of three reigns, and for so long a period as fifty years. Though not possessed of much ability, she was a thoroughly good woman, and she completely reformed the court of Tuscany. Henceforth, no ground was given for the fabrication of dark tales of crime such as that which the atmosphere of the court had afforded in the reigns of Cosimo I and Francis I. And this one important work done by Christine of Lorraine and made permanent through the excellent bringing up which she gave her son Cosimo II is sufficient to render her worthy of the utmost praise. One other thing Christine effected. For by showing herself all that she was in this respect, she did an important service to one who had loved her, whom she had loved, and to whom she owed all her training. For nothing could better vindicate the character of Catherine de' Medici than the results which her training produced in the granddaughter whom she had brought up. In the portrait of Christine in the Uffizi Gallery, taken a year or two after her marriage, she wears her court dress and has her crown by her side. The crown is large and heavily jeweled, and has, below the Florentine lily, two figures supporting a shield. Her dress is of a peculiar shape, the lower part of the sleeve being removable and fastened with large buttons to the upper part or cape. And this pattern of dress is to be seen in several other portraits of ladies of this time in the Uffizi Gallery. In another portrait of her, taken about the same time, she wears the same shaped dress, and the crown by her side is a small, light one, having on it only the Florentine lily. In the case of the Medici, not only each Grand Duke, but each Grand Duchess also was buried wearing her own crown, an entirely fresh one being made for her successor. In her portrait, each Grand Duchess is painted with her crown by her side, always heavily jeweled, and each has a different one. Ferdinand I reigned over Tuscany for 22 years. The crest and motto which he chose on coming to the throne, a swarm of bees with the motto Majestate Tantum, by which he intended to signify that his rule should be just and temperate, enabling the people to gather wealth as bees do honey, was faithfully acted up to by him. 
and while his marriage restored order and morality to the court his various reforms revived tuscany from the state of maladministration into which it had fallen under francis he had a profound veneration for all the acts and opinions of his father but the bold spirit which he had shown as a cardinal did not continue to appear in his career as grand duke and he often quailed before the jesuits which order recognized by pope paul the third in fifteen forty three had in only forty years gained entire domination over the papacy on beginning to reign ferdinand pardoned all who had opposed him and removed all restrictions as to where florentines might reside he put an end to the corruption which had invaded the courts of justice assisted commerce by many wise fiscal reforms and gave his entire attention to state affairs and measures for the welfare of the country among many other useful works with this object he successfully accomplished for the time the draining of the val di chiana which had been an engineering difficulty for generations he brought under cultivation the plains of pisa fucecchio and the val di nievole and he gave pisa water communication with legorn by means of the canal of the naviglio into which a portion of the water of the arno was turned but ferdinand's greatest achievement was the creation of legorn for it was he who practically created that port through the particular measure which made it so remarkable a success his father cosimo had begun the conversion of this small fishing village into an important harbor but had not had time to proceed far with the project the one good work of francis had been the continuation of his father's plans in this respect but though he advanced them to some extent by far the greater part of the work still remained to be done when ferdinand came to the throne the latter took this matter up vigorously and it became his chief interest harbors were laid out and excavated fortifications planned and thrown up and sound fiscal regulations made to attract commerce to the new port but these arrangements alone would not have amounted to more than had often been carried out in other cases without any startling results to them however ferdinand added a measure which in its broad-mindedness was entirely in advance of the ideas of his age he published a decree which from legorn's italian name of livorno he called the livornina by which it was ruled that in the new port there should be universal toleration thus making it an asylum of refuge for the persecuted of all religions and nationalities protestants flying from france and spain roman catholics flying from england Flemings flying from Alva's atrocities in the Netherlands, persecuted Jews from all countries, were all alike welcomed and protected at Legorn, and found a safe refuge there. While to the Jews, Ferdinand gave also a special charter to protect them from persecution by Tuscans. The result of this broad minded policy was that Legorn went up with a bound and before ferdinand's reign of twenty-two years was ended had risen from an insignificant fishing village into the leading commercial port of italy after genoa montesquieu speaking of this achievement calls legorn the masterpiece of the dynasty of the medici the latter could however point to greater achievements than this one both before and after it important as it was ferdinand also largely increased the tuscan navy and the latter led by the knights of santo stefano gained much honor in the mediterranean both by victories over the turks and by sweeping from the seas the fierce pirates of barbary who were a formidable obstacle to all maritime commerce towards the end of ferdinand's reign the war galleys of the knights of santo stefano were in 1607 sent to attack bona on the coast of barbary the headquarters of the corsairs the place was fiercely defended by the latter but the knights took it by an assault in which they displayed unexampled bravery in the following year 
the same galleys achieved a still more brilliant victory over the Turks, attacking and completely defeating the much stronger Turkish fleet, capturing nine of their vessels, seven hundred prisoners, and a store of jewels valued at two million ducats. This victory was the final success which closed a long series of similar contests and placed the Tuscan fleet at the head of naval affairs in the Mediterranean. In the Sala del Baroccio, in the Uffizi Gallery, is to be seen a table of Florentine Pietra Dura, executed for Ferdinand, in the center of which is a representation of the harbor of Legorn, with vessels of all nations floating on a sea of lapis lazuli, and among them a squadron of six galleys of the Tuscan fleet bringing into the harbor two captured Turkish ships. In his foreign policy, Ferdinand continued to increase those close relations with France which he had begun by his marriage. Six months after Christine of Lorraine left Blois, Henry III was assassinated, and there followed four years of war in France, during which Henry of Navarre, Henry IV, was contending for his kingdom against the League, which was assisted by Spain. Ferdinand supported his claims and provided him with money, undeterred by the opposition of Spain and the League, who were appalled at the prospect of a Protestant succeeding to the throne of France, and were determined to prevent it at all costs. And it was practically Ferdinand, who at length placed Henry IV on the French throne. The revenue of the Grand Duke of Tuscany was at this period equal to, if not greater than, the entire revenue of France, and the sums which Ferdinand lent Henry to enable him to continue the contest were enormous. Great trains of wagons, containing specie, and escorted by large bodies of cavalry and infantry, were continually being sent from Florence to Henry in France. After a four years' struggle, seeing that Henry would never gain that throne as a Protestant, Ferdinand urged him to accept the Roman Catholic faith. He smoothed matters over for him with the Pope, and eventually Henry, in 1593, renounced Protestantism, was through Ferdinand's strenuous endeavors acknowledged as king by Pope Clement VIII, and in March 1594 at last gained possession of Paris. This was followed in 1598 by the death of Philip II of Spain, which had the effect of still further cementing Ferdinand's close friendship with France. And in the following year, the latter was able to arrange a marriage which bound Henry IV still closer to him. End of section 32. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 33 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 26. Ferdinand I, Part 2. Ferdinand's niece, Maria... Francis's second surviving daughter had been a girl of fourteen when her father and stepmother died and her uncle succeeded to the throne. She was given a home by the latter and was now twenty-six, the same age as the Grand Duchess Christine, while for one cause or another various proposals for her marriage had one after another fallen through. At length, however, Upon Henry IV and Marguerite of Valois being divorced by mutual consent, Ferdinand succeeded in arranging that Maria should be married to Henry IV. The marriage, which thus placed a Medici for the second time on the throne of France, was performed by proxy in Florence in October 1600. And a few days afterwards, Maria set out on her journey, the Grand Duchess accompanying her as far as Marseille. She had an immense dowry, great as that of Catherine de' Medici had been, 
Maria's was even greater, and Sully said that no former queen had ever brought to France such a marriage portion. As queen of France, Maria, or as she was always called in France, Marie de Medici, proved herself a decided contrast to her predecessor. Her blonde hair and creamy white complexion, that beauty which inspired Rubens, at first charmed Henry the Fourth until he found out how devoid she was of brains. She was good-natured, and was a moral woman in a most immoral time, but, unlike most of her family, she was entirely wanting in humor, wit, or intelligence, being, in this respect, remarkably inferior to her sister Eleonora, Duchess of Mantua. Henry the Fourth gave her every inducement to show all her worst points. His infidelities were numerous, and Marie was not inclined to pass these over without resentment. Henry looked on the matter in another light. He wrote to Sully, quote, Our little disagreements ought never to outlast twenty-four hours, end quote, and complained of Marie, that when she was offended she, quote, took five days over it, end quote. She also objected to his illegitimate children being educated with the princes and princesses, and to being forced by Henry to address one of the former as my son. Under these conditions, the court of France became a scene of constant dissensions. The quarrels, rivalries, and battles royal which disturbed the palace were incessant, and Henry's great minister, the Duke of Sully, was constantly called away from affairs of state to pacify the storms in the royal household. Right was entirely on Marie's side, but she did not adopt the best means of fighting her battle. Once, in Sully's presence, her wrath was so great that she was about to strike the king, when the minister was only just in time to dash her hand aside. "'Madame!' he cried. "'Are you mad?' Do you not know he could have your head off in half an hour? But Marie's quality of good nature was of value to her. Richelieu writes, quote, A storm was scarcely over before the king, delighting in the fine weather, treated the queen with such sweetness that, since that great prince's death, I have often heard her rejoice over the memory of her life with him. End quote. In Marie's portrait in the Uffizi Gallery, painted not long after her marriage, her dress is very magnificent. Marie de' Medici spent more on dress than probably any other lady who ever lived. The descriptions of the contents of her wardrobe and of the numerous garments of richest material, from among which she daily selected what dress she would wear, fill pages in the accounts of her life. Among them all, she had three special favorites, a dress of cloth of gold on a ground of columbine, a dress of gold and silver embroidery, and a dress of blue velvet sewn with gold fleur-de-lis, and it is the latter which she wears in this picture. The stomacher is of ermine, covered with groups of large pearls and amethysts, each group of four pearls having an amethyst in the center, while in front she wears a large cross of amethysts, from which hang three very large pearls. The sleeves are similarly covered with groups of pearls and amethysts, while the skirt is heavily embroidered with fleur-de-lis in gold. Her crown is also encrusted with amethysts and pearls. Ferdinand I was no less active in the cause of art than in that of the development of the country, the perfecting of the navy, and the founding of Legorn. From the Villa Medici at Rome, he gradually conveyed to Florence a great part of the works of Greek and Roman sculpture which he had collected there, and placed them in the new rooms over the public offices, the Uffizi, though some of the chief of the works collected by him at Rome, including the Venus and the Wrestlers, were not brought to Florence until seventy years after his death, by Cosimo III and the Niobe group and the Apollino, not until a hundred years later still. To accommodate the various works of sculpture which he was bringing from Rome, 
Ferdinand commissioned Buontalenti to construct several additional rooms to this gallery, including, in particular, the beautiful one called the Tribuna, with its ceiling of mother-of-pearl set in gilded gesso, walls lined throughout with hangings of moire antique, and pavement inlaid with colored marbles. Thus the Uffizi gallery was, for a long period, more noted for its sculpture than for its pictures, and on this account was, down to quite recent times, called the Gallery of the Statues. At the same time, Ferdinand continued the course which Francis had begun of collecting in these rooms any additional pictures which he acquired. We have an example of the vicissitudes which many of the pictures now in the Uffizi Gallery have undergone, before at last finding a resting place there, from the history of Botticelli's beautiful little picture of Judith. Painted for Piero il Gottoso, it originally formed part of the artistic treasures of the Medici Palace. Robbed with their other possessions when the palace was sacked in 1494, it disappeared for ninety years, during which time it apparently passed from hand to hand until it at last came into the possession of Ridolfo Singatti, who gave it as a present to Francis's wife, Bianca Capello, and so it came once more into the possession of the Medici, and after Bianca's death was placed by Ferdinand in the Uffizi collection. Still more extraordinary have been the vicissitudes of one of the greatest treasures of the Pitti Gallery, Raphael's Madonna del Gran Duca. For this picture, painted by him in 1505, and now the most highly valued of all Raphael's pictures in Florence, had in the course of two hundred years dropped out of sight, and, passing from hand to hand, at last came into the possession of a poor widow, who esteemed it of so little value that she sold it to a picture dealer for twelve crowns. But the most important work, inaugurated in Florence by Ferdinand I, and begun by him in 1604, was the great family mausoleum, attached to the church of San Lorenzo, but by its size and the height of its dome, forming a more conspicuous feature in the view of that part of Florence than the church alongside of which it is built. The construction of such a mausoleum had been planned by Cosimo I, but up to Ferdinand's time nothing had been done in the matter. The latter, however, now set about it with the energy which he showed in all his undertakings. The site chosen was immediately behind and adjoining the choir of the church, from the back of which a door opens directly into the mausoleum, but this entrance has long been kept closed. The laying of the foundation stone of this great work was an impressive ceremony, and is thus described in the diary of Francesco Settimani, a Florentine citizen of the time. Quote, on the 6th April 1604, His Most Serene Highness, the Grand Duke, having chosen the place alongside the Church of San Lorenzo, where he proposed to erect a splendid chapel at the hour of half-past two on Good Friday, the day of the Most Holy Passion of our Saviour, came to the place accompanied by the whole court. He gave to the Prince Cosimo, his eldest son, a gold spade for the purpose, with which the latter digging the site where the foundations were to be laid, dug out a portion of the earth, and with his own hands loaded a small gold basket with it, and then raising this earth, began the work of the foundations. This being finished, the Grand Duke concluded the ceremony by saying in a loud voice, Here shall be our end. end quote. One wonders how far Ferdinand I standing in the corner of the Piazza Madonna in the space allotted to the new building, surrounded by his numerous sons and daughters and his magnificent court, in making the speech with which he concluded the laying of the foundation stone of the great mausoleum, looked forward into the future, as he evidently did look back into the past. He certainly little imagined that the long roll of family tombs lying some in the old sacristy, some in the new sacristy, and some in the mausoleum which he was founding, 
would end four generations later with a tomb laid where he stood over one who was the last solitary descendant of the family. The construction of this huge work, which was intended to be as splendid as size and the decoration of the interior with a profusion of precious stones could make it, occupied more than a hundred years, and called forth various descriptions of artwork in Florence, originating in particular one important industry which still flourishes. The building was designed by Ferdinand himself, and its magnificence led the people to believe that it was intended to receive the sepulchre of Christ, which the emir of the Druzes had promised to give to the Grand Duke. Begun by Ferdinand I, the construction of this mausoleum continued during the whole of the reigns of his four successors, not being really finished until after the death of the last of them. The design of the building as we now see it completed is an immense octagonal chapel surmounted by a dome, the interior of the walls covered with rich marbles, and round the chapel the sarcophagi of the seven Medici Grand Dukes, each sarcophagus being of highly polished oriental granite, of the same fine workmanship as the inlay work on the walls, and in a niche over each sarcophagus a colossal statue in bronze of the individual Grand Duke, standing, clad in his robes of state, with crown and scepter, and on each sarcophagus a jeweled cushion in oriental granite, with upon this a gilded and jeweled crown. Large slabs of porphyry below each monument bear the name and titles of the Grand Duke to whom it refers. The walls are lined throughout with inlaid marbles, lapis lazuli, and other precious stones, the richest crust of ornament that ever was lavished on so large a surface, and the inlay work is of an improved description introduced specially for the decoration of this mausoleum. It was intended that the dome should be entirely lined with Persian lapis lazuli, divided into cassettone, which would have been in unison with the tone and material of the walls. But after the last Medici died, this was given up on account of the cost, and the dome was simply painted with frescoes. Round the lower part of the walls are the coat of arms of the various territories ruled over by the Medici, including both the various states originally comprised within those of Florence and those other territories, such as Siena, which, one by one, the Medici added to these and incorporated in their Grand Duchy of Tuscany. There are sixteen coats of arms representing these various territories, to wit, Florence, Fiesole, Arezzo, Cortona, Pistoia, Pisa, Borgo San Sepolcro, Volterra, Siena, Montepulciano, Montalcino, Grosetto, Massa, Pienza, Chiusi, Svania. These coats of arms are executed in lapis lazuli, mother of pearl, jasper, agate, chalcedony, and other precious stones, and are of the very finest quality of intarsiatura work known. The whole building is estimated to have cost about one million pounds sterling. It is the fashion to decry the mausoleum and to compare it with the new sacristy, calling the latter an abode of art and the former an example of mere tasteless magnificence. But this is a short-sighted view and displays ignorance of the conditions. In this work, Ferdinand I did exactly as his ancestors, the earlier Medici, had done, carrying out the traditions of his family by helping forward the particular artistic talents of the Florentines of his time. Those talents, on the decay in painting and sculpture which had supervened, now ran in the direction of the minor arts, and particularly of inlay work in stone, and it was only in that direction that assistance to the artistic talents of the Florentines could at this time be afforded. 
and had the interior decoration of the dome been completed in accordance with the original design instead of being covered with highly colored and inharmonious frescoes the merits of the building would have been better appreciated in any case it remains a remarkable memorial of the medici and of the grandeur of their conceptions while it gave a valuable impetus to every branch of those arts which deal with work in marble and precious stones this work called for a degree of excellence in the art of pietra dura or florentine mosaic far in advance of anything which had previously been attempted in that direction ferdinand had already prepared for this and had in sixteen hundred founded the royal manufactory of pietra dura and this manufactory was now set to work to execute all the inlay work required for the new mausoleum when the walls should be ready to receive it thus originating that pietra dura industry which has since become one of the most prominent minor arts of florence music also made an important new departure under ferdinand's auspices it is to florence and to the encouragement given to the new venture by ferdinand i that lovers of music owe the italian opera it was invented by jacopo peri and was at first called recitativo the first opera ever produced was daphne the dialogue being by peri and the music by ottovio rinuccini and was performed in fifteen ninety four in the presence of ferdinand and the whole court in the great hall of the uffizi that now occupied by the state archives as a result various improvements were introduced and the second opera considered a great advance on the first was euridice which was performed in sixteen hundred at the marriage festivities of marie de medici the dialogue being by perry and the music by emilio cavalieri this was followed by the third opera ariana by the same composers amongst various other works in florence which ferdinand carried out was the great bronze ball and cross crowning the top of the cathedral verrocchio had made the original ball and cross which were placed in position in fourteen seventy one a work of considerable difficulty but in january sixteen hundred florence was visited by a great storm which threw down verrocchio's ball and cross in falling they did much damage to the roof of the cathedral while the ball rolled some distance down the via de servi ferdinand had a new ball and cross made considerably larger than verrocchio's and these which now crown the cathedral were placed in position in sixteen o two and have stood the storms of three centuries ferdinand also completed the fortress of san giorgio which cosimo had begun and called it the fortress of the belvedere from the beautiful panorama to be seen thence he made buon talenti its architect construct in it a subterranean chamber for which buon talenti invented a secret lock only able to be opened by himself and the grand duke and here the medici treasure was henceforth always kept the amount of ferdinand's treasure was very great it is recorded in a contemporary diary that he showed to bernardo bonarmotti to whom he gave it in charge no less than five millions in coined gold seven thousand spanish dollars and an immense mass of jewels end of section thirty three recording by linda johnson Section 34 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 26 Ferdinand I, Part 3 to the medici villas of careggi caffagiolo poggio a caiano and castello which had seen so many generations of the family ferdinand now added another the villa of petraia which he purchased from the salutati family 
he completely restored this villa and had its beautiful central court decorated by volterano and other artists with frescoes representing the coronation of charles v by clement the seventh the entry of cosimo i into siena the institution of the order of santo stefano and other episodes in the history of the family ferdinand also caused the fine equestrian statue of his father cosimo i to be executed by gian di bologna and set it up in the piazza della signoria it has on the pedestal bronze bas-reliefs representing the three most important episodes of cosimo's career one his being given the rule of the state by the council of the forty-eight two his triumphal entry into siena on its conquest and incorporation with tuscany and three his being given the rank of grand duke by pius v having completed and set up the statue of his father ferdinand then set gian da bologna to work upon a similar equestrian statue of himself that which stands in the piazza santissima annunziata this statue has considerable interest not only from being that rendered celebrated by robert browning's poem of the statue and the bust but also on other grounds it is made from the bronze guns captured from the turks in the naval victories gained by ferdinand's fleet and bears on the pedestal his private crest the swarm of bees and motto majestate tantum the horse like that of the statue of cosimo i bears strong traces of a very ancient pedigree being evidently modelled to a large extent upon that of the equestrian statue in rome of the emperor marcus aurelius while it very nearly found its way to paris it was the origin of a celebrated statue in that city in sixteen o five marie de medici was anxious to present to paris an equestrian statue of her husband henry the fourth to be set up on the open ground between the two sections of the pont neuf as there was no sculptor in france capable of such a work she wrote to her uncle ferdinand i asking that he would allow gian da bologna to execute it and with this request she coupled another as gian da bologna was eighty-one and the work would take a long time she asked her uncle to give her the bronze horse which was then ready to receive his own statue and to let another be made for himself but ferdinand declined to accede to this cool request being quite as much alive as marie was to the probability that gian da bologna might not live to complete another bronze horse he however suggested that the moulds used for casting his horse might be made use of for that which marie desired this was done though owing first to other commissions and then to gian da bologna's death it was nine years before the statue including both the horse and the figure of henry the fourth to be placed upon it was completed the transport of the statue by sea from leghorn to havre and thence to paris was a difficult affair eventually however after having been dropped overboard near havre and recovered from the bottom of the sea the statue reached paris and was in sixteen fourteen set up on the pont neuf to marie's great delight inside the horse which was a facsimile of that which bears ferdinand's statue was placed an inscription on vellum stating that ferdinand grand duke of tuscany had ordered the statue to be executed by gian da bologna and had it finished by pietro tacca in affectionate memory of henry the fourth for francis i gian da bologna had executed a statue celebrated all over the world for ferdinand i he executed one as little known as the other is well known to wit his genius of the medici represented by a handsome boy holding aloft in one hand one of the medici balls and clasping under the other arm a small goat signifying capricorn the sign of the zodiac under which cosimo i was born while that sculptor's mercury as perkins says has winged its way to the museums and houses of every quarter of the globe 
this other fine specimen of Gian da Bologna's art, and one so interesting in its connection with the Medici, has hitherto been practically unknown. It is owing to the diligent care for the records of the past, events by Signor Cornish, director of the Pitti Palace, that this beautiful statue has been brought to light, having hitherto been hidden away, uncared for, in a back courtyard of the palace. In 1605, Pope Clement the Eighth, who had been Pope for thirteen years, died, and was succeeded by Leo the Eleventh, whose name was Alessandro de' Medici. He did not belong to this family, not being a descendant of Giovanni di Bici. He was, however, a distant connection, being descended from a brother of the grandfather of Giovanni di Bici. He was only Pope for a month when he died and was succeeded by Paul V, 1605-1621. Ferdinand and Christine had eight children. Cosimo, who succeeded his father, Francesco, Carlo, Lorenzo, Eleonora, Caterina, Maddalena, and Claudia. They were all quite young at the time of their father's death, Cosimo, the eldest, being nineteen, and Claudia, the youngest, only five years old. The last six months of Ferdinand's life were chiefly occupied with arrangements for the marriage of his eldest son. Ferdinand arranged that he should be married to the Archduchess Maria Maddalena, daughter of the Archduke Charles of Austria. It was a very exalted marriage. Maria Maddalena's sister Margaret being already married to Philip III of Spain, while her brother Ferdinand soon afterwards became the Emperor Ferdinand II. The Archduchess came to Florence, and she and Cosimo were married in San Lorenzo in June 1608, with most magnificent ceremonies. On her arrival, Part of the walls of Florence were thrown down, and a new gateway opened in them for her to enter at. And on entering, she received the crown of Tuscany from Ferdinand himself, while the city blazed with magnificence. This auspicious event closed Ferdinand's life. He died on the 7th February, 1609, at the age of 60, leaving the affairs of the family in a most prosperous condition his eldest son just married to the sister of one soon to be the emperor, seven other children growing up, and an enormous treasure safely stored in the fortress of the Belvedere. He was buried with all the pomp which Florence learned to associate with the funeral of its grand duke, being interred in the new sacristy of San Lorenzo, pending the completion of the mausoleum which he had inaugurated, and to which his remains were eventually removed. In the crypt of that mausoleum, there has recently been placed an interesting memorial of his principal achievement. On the 3rd March, 1906, being the tercentenary of the founding of Legorn, the Antiquarian Society of that city visited the mausoleum, and, after an impressive oration by the president of the society, conveying the gratitude which Legorn felt to the energy and ability of its founder, Ferdinand I., hung a handsome bronze wreath on the wall over his tombstone, inscribed with the above date, so that Legorn still cherishes with gratitude the memory of the Medici. With Ferdinand I, who, it is important to observe, was the first head of the family during 150 years, against whom, on his succeeding to power in Florence, no attempt to overturn that power took place, a notable change begins in connection with a feeling which had greatly affected the career of this family in the past, and was to have still greater effects in regard to them after that career had ended. Writers on their history, belonging to other countries, have universally found an insoluble problem in the fact that even after the Medici have long since become extinct, a virulent animosity against them should still continue to exist, and that they should be under a cloud in the city which they made so great. It was felt that political antipathies, however strong, 
did not suffice to account for such a result, since these could scarcely continue in sufficient strength to have such an effect after the entire conditions which called them forth had for many generations passed away. It is, however, in another direction that the solution to this problem lies. The Florentines, with all their many admirable qualities, possess one characteristic which is the real cause of this phenomenon. This is a power of jealousy in degree almost inconceivable to those of northern race, a characteristic which is to be seen in operation throughout all Florentine history. This it was which in reality created the fierce internecine contests which, time after time, rent Florence during the 13th and 14th centuries. This it was which, in the 15th and 16th centuries, brought upon the Medici the violent attacks which they experienced eight times in succession during 150 years. And this again it is which has caused that strange fact which has puzzled so many writers. The poorer classes felt a fondness for the Medici family throughout their history and had ample reason for doing so, while even to the present day they have a regard for their memory but it was far otherwise with all those Florentine families who had originally been on a par with the Medici, but had, in course of time, been surpassed by them. That result was due to the effects of intellectual gifts so unusual that none need have felt moved by resentment at it, but nevertheless the families thus surpassed did feel the bitterest resentment and made no attempt to hide the fact. Accordingly, these families time after time headed furious attacks upon the Medici, as long as such attacks had any chance of success. Nor was this all. When a despotic monarchy is succeeded by a republic, there is only one family embittered by the loss of former greatness. But when a republic is succeeded by a despotic monarchy, there are created an hundred such families, and these also the most influential in the state. Since the Christian era, the former case has occurred often in history, but the latter case has only occurred twice, in the case of Rome and in that of Florence. But whereas Augustus carefully avoided all appearance of despotism, and whereas the notable Roman families were not ousted from public affairs, the course taken by Cosimo I though perhaps forced on him by circumstances, was the exact opposite of that pursued by Augustus. We have seen how he took every opportunity of showing that he wielded the sole power, how he ruled without any counsel, and how he invariably chose men who were not Florentines as his secretaries. Not a single one of the old Florentine families, whose members had for centuries held the highest offices in the state, including frequently that of Gonfaloniere, saw any one of its members employed by Cosimo even as a secretary. It may be imagined what fierce wrath such a state of things created. Wrath which, though it dared not show itself, was all the more carefully nourished by those concerned. The taking away of a liberty which had never resulted in anything but internecine strife might in time have been forgiven, but the deprivation of all the power and importance to which the leading Florentine families had for generations been accustomed could never be forgiven. It was a rankling sore which could never be healed. The Medici, like other families, were not faultless, but even had they been angels, the embittered feelings so widely shared consequent on the bare fact of a republic being succeeded by a despotic monarchy, were alone sufficient to produce all the charges which have been made against them. When, therefore, overt attacks had no longer a chance of success, owing to the Medici having become crowned heads, supported by emperors and popes, these other families outwardly acquiesced in conditions which they felt powerless to reverse but they secretly nourished from generation to generation the remembrance that they had once been the equals of this family, and, harboring an intense jealousy 
at the height to which the latter had attained, vented that jealousy no longer in overt attacks as heretofore, but in the secret fabrication of stories of crime to cast disgrace upon the Medici. It is here that there originated from the time of Ferdinand I onwards those various stories of this nature which have, quote, passed for history, and which, eagerly caught up by the sensation lovers of all ages and countries, have had so large a part in forming the general idea entertained of the Medici, that atmosphere of the dagger and the bowl by which melodrama loves to surround them. In this manner, years after he was dead, were fabricated against Cosimo I the stories that he had poisoned his own daughter and killed with his own hands one of his sons, and against his sons the stories that two of them had killed each other, that another had ordered the murder of his sister-in-law, that a fourth had murdered his wife, and that a fifth had poisoned his brother and instigated the murder of his sister. Thus, envenomed jealousy contrived to accuse every one of Cosimo's five sons of the murder of a brother, a sister, or a wife. Even, however, were all these stories true, it would still be the case, as has once before been remarked, that to not many among the ruling families of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries have so few crimes of murder been attributed as to the thirteen generations of the Medici. Therefore, it is not owing to an unusual excess of crime that the character generally imputed to them has gained its prevalence. This demonstrates the source where its true origin is to be found. And when at length the Medici passed away, this long-standing jealousy, grown stronger by what it fed upon, bore its natural fruit in a never-ending vilification of their name, in accusations of their having taken away a liberty asserted to have existed before they arose, in the repetition of these legends against them, and in endeavors in all possible ways to obliterate their memory. The Medici, attacked by the sword in their earlier career, were attacked still more virulently by the pen when they were no more, and when there remained no one to defend their memory. Such were the results of the ordinary course of history being reversed by a despotic monarchy succeeding a republic instead of the opposite case. Since the publication of The Cambridge Modern History, it is no longer possible for anyone pretending to a knowledge of history to treat these tales of abnormal crimes except as stories finally condemned as entirely without foundation. But they show how great was the jealousy of the other principal families of Florence against the one of their number which had surpassed them, a jealousy which, never laid aside, appeared to grow even stronger after the grave had closed over the last member of the family concerned. Now, however, that a better day has dawned, it is time that these methods of a bygone age should be repudiated. The methods themselves have, one may well believe, been abandoned, but their effects still live, and will continue to do so as long as stories of this nature against the Medici, though condemned by history as false, are still repeated by a generation which would not itself stoop to invent them, and by whom such methods cannot but be utterly despised. End of section 34 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 35 of The Medici, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2020. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 27. Cosimo II. Born 1590. Reigned 1609 to 1620. Died 1620. Cosimo II, the eldest of the eight children of Ferdinand I and Christine of Lorraine, 
succeeded his father as Grand Duke at the age of nineteen. The good disposition which he inherited from his mother, combined with the excellent training which from his childhood he had received, made him a most agreeable character, and his tolerance, dislike of quarrels and oppression, friendly temperament and social tastes caused him to be universally liked. In this respect he was fully seconded by his wife, Maria Madalena, and under this young and agreeable pair the court gained an attractiveness it had never had before. Sustermans was now the leading portrait painter of the time, and his fine portraits of Cosimo and Maria Madalena in the Corsini Gallery, Florence, enable us to realize the appearance of this young couple at the time that Cosimo began his reign. With Cosimo II, the life of this family seems to enter on a new phase, one in which, during his time, youth, brightness, gaiety, and vivacity joined to cultural tastes, a free expenditure of great wealth, and warm interest in amazing scientific discoveries were the prevailing features. While he himself was nineteen, his wife Maria Madalena was the same age as his eldest sister Eleonora, namely eighteen, his sister Caterina was sixteen, his brother Francesco fifteen, and his brother Carlo fourteen. All of them were cultured, accomplished, and abounding with youthful spirits, and this band of young people, gathering others of their own age about them, made the palace, with their constant entertainments, light-heartedness, and genial sociability, in a short time full of life and animation. It is a pleasant view that we have of these sons and daughters of Ferdinand I. Cosimo himself, with his brothers Francesco, Carlo, and Lorenzo, all showed in their lives both good qualities of character and good abilities. Again, in regard to their sisters Eleonora, Catarina, Madalena, and Claudia, we hear no case of any of those scandals which had disgraced the former generation, and while Eleonora and Madalena had no opportunity of distinguishing themselves, Caterina and Claudia both showed in their respective spheres the good qualities and high abilities they possessed. One effect of these new conditions was that Cosimo now determined that the Grand Ducal Palace must be much enlarged and improved in appearance. He accordingly set about extending it to three times its former size, by increasing the length of the façade from seven windows to thirteen, and erecting two great wings, three stories high, at right angles to the back of the building, enclosing a large central courtyard, with a terrace at the back of the latter on a level with the rooms of the first floor. The work was rapidly carried out, all the necessary stone being quarried on the site itself, the solid rock on which the palace stands having to be cut away in order to get sufficient level space for the wings added at the back of it. This great enlargement of the building, together with the costly additions which Cosimo at the same time made to the furniture and interior decoration, made the Grand Ducal Palace a much more splendid abode than it hitherto had been. Not content with this, Cosimo also built for his wife, Maria Maddalena, the palatial villa of Poggio Imperiale, called so in honour of her with reference to her imperial descent, on a site which she particularly admired on the slope of the hill leading down from Arquetri, outside the southern environs of the city, to which villa he made a truly royal road, nearly a mile in length, and bordered on each side with a strip of garden and a double avenue of splendid cypress trees, which ascends to it from the Porta Romana. The building has for many years been given by the King of Italy as a government college for young ladies, but the reception rooms are kept much as they were formerly, and these show various reminiscences of the time when this was the favourite residence of Cosimo and Maria Maddalena. Each of these later generations of the family had their favourite villa, which thus becomes especially associated with them. With Cosimo I it had been Castello, with Francis I Poggio a Caiano, with Ferdinand I Petraia, but Poggio Imperiale had a longer period of favour, being not only the favourite villa of Cosimo II and Maria Maddalena, 
but also of Ferdinand II and his generation of the family. Moreover, one important fact connected with it makes it one of the most interesting buildings of Florence. But Cosimo II was occupied with other matters more important to the world than the enlargement of the Grand Ducal Palace, the construction of the Villa of Poggio Imperiale, and social entertainments. His reign began the demonstration of a fact not always sufficiently realized, that is, that Florence did not only lead the world in learning and art, but in science also, a fact still further demonstrated in the reign of his son, Ferdinand II. This fresh addition to Florence's laurels was begun by a step taken by Cosimo as soon as he came to the throne, which proved the most important act of his reign, signalizing it even more than that of his father had been signalized by the creation of Leghorn, and bringing lasting renown to Florence as well as to his own name. This was his act of inviting back, protecting from prosecution, and establishing in honor in his own country the great Galileo, who had eighteen years before been compelled by jealous animosity to leave it. Galileo Galilei, born in 1564 at Pisa, had at the early age of twenty-three been appointed professor of mathematics at the University of Pisa. And it was there that he made his first great discovery, that which resulted in his invention of the pendulum. The late Signor Vincenzo Antinori, director of the Scientific Museum of Florence, in his notice of Galileo, says, The pendulum, as is already known, was the result of the first observations of our philosopher in Pisa. It was the spark which kindled his genius, the instrument by which he tested the conceptions of his mind, the torch which led him along the path of his discoveries. The pendulum, by proving the resistance of air, served to confirm him in his theory of gravitation. It likewise illustrated his theory of music by the intersection of waves of sound. The pendulum, suspended to a fixed center, suggested to him the motion of the earth, with the moon, round the sun and it is singular to reflect how the two marvellous discoveries with which he so happily commenced his glorious career, the isochronism of the pendulum and gravitation, should have occupied him at its close. But in 1592, when Galileo was twenty-eight, he had been forced, owing to the machinations of those who were jealous of his fame and abilities, assisted by the Jesuits, who objected to his new theories, to resign his professorship and retire to Padua, where he had for eighteen years been supporting himself by teaching mathematics, and where Cosimo as a youth had for some time been his pupil. As soon as he became Grand Duke, Cosimo invited Galileo, then forty-six years old, to return to Tuscany, and established him at Florence, giving him a villa at Arquetri, not far from where he was building his own new villa of Poggio Imperiale, and creating for him an appointment as chief mathematician of the Grand Duke, with an annual salary of one thousand scudi. And in this capacity Galileo remained for twenty-three years, provided with a maintenance which left him free to prosecute his scientific studies, and shielded, under the personal protection of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, from the machinations of his enemies both at Florence and Rome, during which time he made the whole of his discoveries. And the subsequent history showed that had it not been for this protection on the part of Cosimo II, these discoveries would never have been made by Galileo, for nothing but this protection prevented the Jesuits from silencing him in 1610, as they eventually succeeded in doing in 1633. The above action on Cosimo's part very quickly produced astonishing results. Shortly after his establishment at Florence, Galileo invented the telescope, and in the first year of Cosimo's reign began by its means to make those great discoveries which were destined to revolutionize man's knowledge of his place in the universe. The celebrated astronomer, Sir John Herschel, says, it is difficult to conceive what Galileo must have felt when, having constructed his telescope, he for the first time turned it to the heavens, and saw the mountains and valleys in the moon. Then the moon was another earth, 
the earth another planet, and all were subject to the same laws. What an evidence of the simplicity and magnificence of nature! But at length he turned it again, still directing it upwards, and again he was lost, for he was now among the fixed stars, and if not magnified as he expected them to be, they were multiplied beyond measure. What a moment of exaltation for such a mind as his! The villa of Poggio Imperiale gains a new interest when we realize that it must have been there that all these and the other great astronomical wonders which during the next two or three years successively became known to Galileo were first narrated to others. For he would certainly convey them first to one who had made it possible for him to make these discoveries, and who, though he was Grand Duke, Galileo knew to be as keenly interested in the matter as himself. We can imagine the enthusiasm with which, after a night spent among the stars, he would hasten down to relate to Cosimo some fresh discovery, as well as the amazement with which the circle gathered in the Grand Ducal Villa on the slope of the Arquetri Hill first heard the astounding truths which Galileo had to relate, which revolutionized all that had hitherto been believed on such matters, and proved that the earth was not the centre of the universe, but merely a minute planet in the solar system. Galileo's celebrated tower at Arquetri, from which, in the still midnight of far-off time, its master read the secrets of the stars, stands overlooking Florence from the southern hills, as though to be a constant reminder of all that was from thence unfolded to mankind. We hail thy sunny slope, Arquetri, sung of old for its green vine, dearer to me, to most, as dwelt on by the great astronomer. Sacred be his villa, justly was it called the gem, sacred the lawn where many a cypress threw its length of shadow while he watched the stars. Thus did Florence, which had led the world in learning and art, now that the sovereignty in that domain had passed away from her, place on her brows a fresh crown of leadership, and show the way in that new branch of knowledge, science, which was henceforth to be the chief interest of the intellect of the world. It was fitting that the Medici should be as closely associated with this new leadership as they had been with that of the past. Nor did their connection with this stepping forth by Florence on a fresh path of renown go without a permanent record. The first hitherto unknown stars revealed to Galileo by his telescope in the first year of Cosimo's reign were the satellites of Jupiter. And to these, in gratitude to one who had made it possible for him to carry on such investigations, Galileo gave the name of the Medician stars, Stellae Medicae. Thus the satellites of Jupiter preserve for all time among scientific men a memorial that the Medici helped to bring about the first great discoveries of modern science. And if the founding of Leghorn is to be considered a masterpiece on the part of Ferdinand I, far more may action which enabled these great revelations of science to be made by Galileo be considered so on the part of Cosimo II. In 1610 Cosimo sent an embassy to France to condole with his cousin, Marie de Medici, on the sudden death of her husband, Henry IV, who was stabbed in his coach while proceeding to a state function, whereupon Marie became Queen Regent of France during the minority of her eldest son Louis, then nine years old. It was remarked that her nine-year-old son was as fit to reign as she was. Cosimo's envoy obtained scant attention from her to his message, for Marie could think of nothing but the grandeur of her coronation as Queen Regent, and constantly interrupted the envoy to describe it to him, and how her throne had had nineteen steps. Marie's children were Louis the Thirteenth of France, Gaston, Duke of Orléans, Elizabeth, married to Philip the Fourth of Spain, Henrietta Maria, married to Charles the First of England, and Christine, married to the Duke of Savoy while her sister Eleonora's daughter, Eleonora, married the Emperor Ferdinand II. Thus, in the eleventh generation from Giovanni di Bicci, we see a Medici seated on the throne of each of the four principal countries of Europe, 
France, Spain, England, and Germany. Marie's subsequent history was a sad one. As Queen Regent, she was entirely ruled by her minister, Concini, and her powerful mistress of the robes, Leonora Gallegai, whom she had brought from Florence, and who trafficked in all appointments throughout the kingdom. In 1617, Marie's son, Louis XIII, threw off her authority, confined her at Blois, whence she escaped, and eventually exiled her from France. Advised by Cardinal Richelieu, he refused to make her any allowance unless she would return to Florence. But Marie's pride rebelled against becoming a mere appanage of the Tuscan court after having been Queen Regent of France, and nothing would induce her to accede to this so she took refuge in Holland. After many hardships from want of any resources, and a fruitless visit to England in 1636 to her son-in-law Charles I and her daughter Henrietta Maria, she retired in great poverty to Antwerp, her children being all either unwilling or unable to make her any allowance. Soon, however, she was requested by the authorities to leave Antwerp, and then migrated to Cologne, where the painter Rubens, who had often been employed by her when she was Queen of France, gave her a house to live in. There, after many sufferings, she died in 1642 in absolute destitution, it is said, in a hayloft. Cosimo II was the last of the Medici to be a banker. Soon after ascending the throne, he abandoned the practice of private trading, closed the family bank with its branches in various capitals, and discontinued all commerce on his own account, considering that the practice was derogatory to a reigning sovereign, as well as harmful to the trade of the country. The step considerably reduced the income of the family, but their immense wealth made this of less consequence. In 1614, when Cosimo was four-and-twenty, and had been reigning for five years, all his life was changed in consequence of a severe illness, the result of an attack of malignant fever, and from this time forward he became a confirmed invalid. This permanent ill health forced him to give but little attention to state affairs, which had its effect on the country, inducing a general apathy in public matters under which the prosperity of the country declined, and it might have had more serious results had it not been Cosimo's good fortune to reign during a time when Europe was at peace, and when Tuscany was blessed with unusually abundant harvests. At the same time, Cosimo's temperate and tolerant disposition made him respected and liked by the people, notwithstanding the undesirable results of a weak rule. And, though forced to live a very quiet life, he did not shut himself up in gloomy seclusion, but continued to take interest in the amusements of the people and in social festivities, even though able himself to take little part in them. He also encouraged art and literature with all the zeal of his race, making various valuable additions to the family collections. The political events of Cosimo's reign were few. His chief interest was in his navy, and he took every opportunity of adding to its strength and efficiency. In the construction of new ships he received much assistance from Sir Robert Dudley, who had taken refuge at Leghorn and had great talents for shipbuilding. He invented for Cosimo various new descriptions of ships of war, but it was eventually decided that for the Mediterranean warfare the galleys propelled by oars were better adapted than any other pattern of ship. Cosimo sent his fleet, led by the Knights of San Stefano, to assist the Druses against the Turks, and in this service they won still further renown. On only one occasion was Cosimo involved in a dispute with another country which threatened to produce serious consequences. When in 1617 Louis XIII threw off his mother's authority, he caused her chief minister, Concini, to be assassinated, and transferred the property of the murdered man to his own favourite, de Loyne. Cosimo took up the cause of Concini's son, refused to recognise the confiscation of property decreed by the French courts, and demanded that the murdered man's son should be allowed to inherit it. Much ill-feeling followed between the two countries, and mutual reprisals, 
which were only brought to an end by the intervention of the Duke of Lorraine. The Thirty Years' War, which began about a year before Cosimo's death, did not affect Tuscany, which was steadily sinking into a position of less and less importance in the affairs of Europe. In 1614, the same year that Cosimo's severe illness occurred, the first death took place among the eight brothers and sisters. Francesco, who had taken up a military career and had been nominated to the command of the army, died at Pisa in December at the age of twenty. In his portrait in the Uffizi Gallery, he wears a very splendid dress, consisting of a coat of mail with lace collar and ruffles, the peculiar wide padded breeches of the time, profusely embroidered in red and gold, and long scarlet coloured stockings. In his hand he holds the baton denoting his command of the army. It is curious to note that on the table by his side he is given a jewelled coronet, having round it the Florentine lily repeated five or six times, as worn by the younger brothers and sons of the Grand Duke, this being the first time that this feature appears. Three years later, in December 1617, Cosimo's eldest sister, Eleonora, died at the age of twenty-six. She had been engaged to Philip III of Spain, but he broke off the engagement, and it is stated that Eleonora died of a broken heart in consequence. In her portrait in the Uffizi Gallery, she wears a jewelled coronet, a high ruff, and a very handsome dress with long open sleeves, though the full padded skirt has the effect of making her look very short. Earlier in the same year, Cosimo's second sister, Caterina, then twenty-four, was married to Ferdinand Gonzaga, Duke of Mantua. On being left a widow in 1626, she returned to Tuscany and was made governor of Siena, dying there of smallpox in 1629 at the age of thirty-six, with a reputation for great piety. Caterina's portrait and that of her sister Claudia, as well as others in the pity gallery of Cosimo's brothers, show what a strong family likeness existed between all these brothers and sisters, all of them having the same peculiar nose and mouth, unpleasing but showing much character, which we see in Cosimo's portrait, and which they evidently inherited from their mother, Christine of Lorraine. And it is remarkable to notice that this feature appears again in yet a third generation, as can be seen by the portraits of Cosimo's children, Ferdinand II, his four brothers, and their sisters Margherita and Anna. Cosimo's second brother, Carlo, became a cardinal, and rose to importance at the Vatican, living to the age of seventy. His third brother, Lorenzo, who was twenty when Cosimo died, lived to the age of forty-eight. Lorenzo's twin sister, Maddalena, became a nun at the age of twenty, in the convent of the Crocetta a few months after her brother Cosimo's death, and died there in 1633, at the age of thirty-three. The youngest sister of all, Claudia, was married in 1620, the year of her brother Cosimo's death, when she was sixteen, to Federigo della Rovere, the only son of the Duke of Urbino, a worthless boy two years younger than herself, who, however, died of his excesses before he was eighteen, when she returned to Florence with one baby daughter, who was the sole heiress of her grandfather, the old Duke of Urbino. In 1619, Cosimo's brother-in-law, Maria Maddalena's brother, became the Emperor Ferdinand II. Cosimo's health was by this time rapidly failing, and it being evident that he had not long to live, he made a will by which on his death he appointed his mother, Christine, and his wife, Maria Maddalena, joint regents of Tuscany during the minority of his eldest son, then ten years old. Cosimo died on the 28th February 1620, at the age of thirty, much regretted by the people, after a reign of eleven years. He left eight children, five sons and three daughters. He had an exceedingly magnificent funeral, being buried at first in the new sacristy pending the completion of the family mausoleum, to which his remains were, two generations later, removed. 
Strangely enough, a mistake has been made with regard to the length of the reigns of Cosimo II and his son Ferdinand II, the former being always stated to have reigned twelve years, and the latter forty-nine years, instead of eleven years and fifty years respectively, as was actually the case. This is owing to a mistake as to the date of the death of Cosimo II, which has been stated to be 28th of February 1621, even Napier making this mistake, and so stating that Cosimo II reigned for twelve years, and Ferdinand II for forty-nine years. But that this is an error is clearly proved by the report on the examination of the coffins in 1857, as the 28th February 1620 is the date found on the leaden plate inside Cosimo II's coffin, and also on the two gold medallions discovered therein, which latter fact is conclusive. It may be wondered how a historian like Napier could be wrong on such a point, but the explanation is that Napier's history was written in 1847, and so before the opened coffin came to bear its silent testimony. End of section 35section 36 of the medici volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the medici volume 2 by g f young chapter 28 ferdinand the second part 1 the fifty years' reign of Ferdinand II saw a long step made on the downward path on which the once great family was now plainly embarked, and the pace of that descent, which had been slow at first, now quickens. Incipient decay, becoming more and more pronounced, is the keynote of the reign of Ferdinand II, even though there were still many things done which were worthy of the family's best days. Cosimo II's will included very stringent provisions to ensure that the government should be satisfactorily carried on during the minority of his son. While it laid down that the two grand duchesses, his mother and his wife, were to be joint regents, it also ruled that they were to be assisted by a council of four ministers who were named. The salary of each of these four members of the council was limited to two thousand crowns. No foreigner of any sort was to hold any office of state, or even of domestic service in the court. No resident ambassador from any country was to be allowed at Florence, those of France, Spain, and Austria being expressly debarred. All private trade by the regents was prohibited, and above all, the opening of Cosimo's treasure vaults was absolutely forbidden, except to pay the marriage portion of a princess, or to give public aid in a time of national calamity. The penalty for infringing these conditions was deprivation of office as his children's guardians. But these provisions, carefully drawn up as they were, only served to afford an example of how easily all such arrangements can be set aside. The Grand Duchess Christine was now fifty-six, while her daughter-in-law, the Grand Duchess Maria Maddalena, was thirty. Both were excellent women, but they were without any talent for governing. They were still less endowed with the smallest financial ability, and they were excessively fond of pomp and splendor. Never before had such gorgeous magnificence been displayed by the court as now ensued under their rule. They were accompanied on all occasions by a numerous retinue arrayed in the richest costumes, were surrounded by every accessory which could add to their grandeur, and seemed to have considered it incumbent on them to make as splendid a display as possible, in order to maintain, in proper style, the importance of the young Grand Duke for whom they were regents. Everything was done with the utmost extravagance money being spent in the most lavish way on every matter which they took in hand. Added to this, the Grand Duchess Christine, who took the lead, was intensely bigoted, 
and ready to fall an easy prey to the numerous ecclesiastics who gathered round her and who in a very short time had established a strong control over all tuscan affairs while every order emanating from rome no matter how harmful to the country or disastrous to the fortunes of the family was received by her with the most abject submission the results were those to be expected from such conditions the provisions of cosimo's will were ignored the immense treasure which he had left and ordered not to be drawn upon except in case of public emergency was all squandered during the eight years regency of the two grand duchesses want of administrative talent and subordination to priestly influence produced corruption and misgovernment in every department of public affairs and under this state of things the country sank more and more into a condition of poverty and misrule while the only persons who profited were the crowds of ecclesiastics and the so-called converts each of whom on the recommendation of a priest received a pension from the regents susterman's portrait of the grand duchess christine who was primarily responsible for these results shows her wearing the heavy black dress widow's cap and immense black veil which she always wore after her husband ferdinand i's death in her hand she has a locket with his likeness no rings on her fingers and no other ornament except a large gold cross the grand duchess maria maddalena necessarily took only a secondary part in the affairs of the regency to which her nomination was perhaps intended mainly as a formality it being recognized that the chief power would rest with her mother-in-law being left at her husband cosimo's death with eight small children all below the age of ten she had in bringing them up plenty of domestic cares to be added to those of government of the country besides her eldest son ferdinand her other children were maria cristina twin sister to ferdinand born 1610 giovanni carlo born 1611 margherita born 1612 matthias born 1613 francesco born 1614 anna born 1616 and leopold born 1617 in bringing up her children the grand duchess maria maddalena showed considerable sense for her sons were all given a very high class of education the excellence of which they demonstrated in their after lives while a broad-minded policy was shown in the fact that notwithstanding the strong ecclesiastical influence which pervaded the court they were all in turn sent to be taught science by galileo the portrait of maria maddalena shows her in her court dress as regent with her crown by her side the crown being very large and somewhat different from that of her mother-in-law ferdinand the eldest son of cosimo the second was a boy of a thoroughly good disposition his gentle and affectionate nature being conspicuous while his constant endeavor when he grew up to secure peace in italy caused him to become noted as a peacemaker but he had one fatal flaw a want of strength of character while the influences by which his grandmother's subordination to priestly domination caused him to be surrounded from a very early age were such as tended to increase this defect his portrait by sustermans in the pitti gallery at the age of fourteen shows him wearing armor but he did not display any military talents in sixteen twenty three when he was thirteen his young aunt claudia returned to florence as a widow of nineteen with her infant daughter vittoria della rovere and ferdinand was forthwith betrothed to this child in order to unite the duchy of urbino which would be her inheritance when her grandfather the duke of urbino died with tuscany the document drawn up on the occasion of this betrothal specially laid down that vittoria's dowry was to be the duchy of urbino which was to be incorporated with tuscany but a few months later pope gregory the fifteenth 
who had succeeded Paul V in 1621, died and was succeeded by Urban VIII, 1623 to 1644, whose main endeavor was to enrich in every way his family, the Barberini. Urban VIII, soon after becoming Pope, put forward a claim on behalf of the Church to the state of Urbino whenever its aged duke, Francesco Maria della Rovere II, who was then eighty and in failing health, should die, claiming that it would then be a vacant fief, and as such would belong to the states of the Church. This claim was the more outrageous in that the Duchy of Urbino not only belonged to the child Vittoria della Rovere as her grandfather's sole heir, but also, supposing she was to be set aside on account of being a girl, it then devolved upon the boy Ferdinand himself. When Christine of Lorraine was betrothed to Ferdinand I, Catherine de' Medici gave her, as her dowry, 600,000 crowns, a transfer to her of all Catherine's rights in the Medici property in Florence, and also of the latter's claim on the Duchy of Urbino, which had never been annulled, even when Adrian VI restored the dukedom to Francesco Maria della Rovere I. Thus, Ferdinand II claimed Urbino on a double ground. First, he claimed it as being the lawful property of his betrothed wife, Victoria, she being the only child of the duke's only son, and not to be set aside by a papal bull of investiture, limiting the succession to heirs male only, seeing that the dukes of Urbino did not admit that their title to their hereditary duchy depended on any such bull of investiture. Secondly, if Vittoria's claim was set aside, then Ferdinand claimed Urbino in his own right as inherited from Catherine de' Medici, the daughter of Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, on the ground that, though the Duchy of Urbino had been given back by Adrian VI to Francesco Maria della Rovere, yet the Medici family had never acquiesced in this transfer of Urbino from them, this being witnessed, to by the fact that, on all occasions, Clement the Seventh had styled his relative Catherine Duchess of Urbino, and that she was even so styled in her formal marriage documents. Moreover, that this fact also proved that there was at that time, at all events, no restriction of the succession to heirs male only. He therefore maintained that the will of Catherine de' Medici made him, Ferdinand, the lawful Duke of Urbino, supposing Vittoria's claim was set aside. Nevertheless, the papal troops were marched into Urbino, ready to take possession of it the moment that the octogenarian Duke should breathe his last. All that the Pope would concede was that Vittoria should inherit the movable property of the Duke. In 1625, when Ferdinand was fifteen, his aunt Claudia, then twenty-one, married again, and this time more satisfactorily. She was married at Innsbruck to Leopold V, Archduke of Tyrol, the brother of her sister-in-law Maria Madalena and of the Emperor Ferdinand II. Claudia's home henceforth was the Schloss Amras, beautifully situated amidst the pine woods and waterfalls on the lower slope of the mountains overlooking Innsbruck, but with its small rooms and restricted area somewhat of a change from the magnificent Grand Ducal Palace of Tuscany. Claudia did not take her daughter Vittoria with her to Innsbruck, but as the latter was betrothed to Ferdinand, left her at Florence in charge of her own sister Madalena in the convent of the Crocetta, where Vittoria was brought up until she was fourteen. By her second marriage, Claudia had two sons and two daughters. When, in 1632, her husband Leopold died, she was appointed regent of Tyrol on behalf of her young son, and ruled that country well during the most difficult time in its history, showing herself a woman of much ability. She was regent from 1632 to 1646, 
and not only greatly improved the administration and resources of Tyrol, but also, by her wisdom and watchful care over the defenses of the country, she saved it from being drawn into the Thirty Years' War, in which all the rest of the German Empire was involved. In the museum at Innsbruck is to be seen a large picture depicting her sitting on her throne, presiding at a meeting of the Landstag on the occasion of an urgent national crisis. Her eldest son, Ferdinand Karl, married his first cousin, Anna de Medici. Claudia's fine portrait by Sustermans in the Uffizi Gallery shows her as she was at the age of thirty. In her dress there is an absence of the excessive ornament then so much in fashion. She has also dropped the high Medici collar and wears a small plain one. In the corridor between the Uffizi and Pitti galleries there is also a fine portrait of her husband, the Archduke Leopold, dressed in a tunic of yellow leather much embroidered, long yellow leather boots reaching to the thigh, a wide sash round the waist to keep his sword in its place, and by his side his helmet with a huge plume of blue and white ostrich feathers, which, since the whole structure represents a height of about three feet, must have been highly inconvenient when riding. In 1627, Ferdinand, being then seventeen, was sent on a tour to see something of the world before beginning to rule on his own account. He went first to Rome, but there the numerous Barberini family, full of pride and hating the Medici, owing to the opposition they had experienced on their behalf in the matter of Urbino, behaved towards him with great insolence, and he departed thence to Vienna to visit his uncle, the Emperor Ferdinand II, where, with the love of peace which was his characteristic, he made an endeavor to bring to an end the dispute taking place over the succession to the Duchy of Mantua, in which, however, he was unsuccessful. In 1628 he returned home and took over charge of the government, but his feeling for his mother and grandmother would not allow him entirely to deprive them of authority, so that they continued to exercise a considerable influence in the government. Shortly after his return, his second sister, Margherita, then seventeen, was married to Eduardo Farnese, Duke of Parma. This marriage strengthened the position of Tuscany in the politics of Italy, constantly troubled as these were by Urban VIII, Parma and Tuscany becoming allies, while it was also of considerable importance in its consequences two generations later, when the throne of Tuscany threatening to become vacant owing to Cosimo III having no grandchildren, it was held that after the demise of Cosimo's daughter, the rightful heirs to that throne were Margherita's descendants belonging to the house of Parma. End of section 36. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 37 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 28. Ferdinand II, Part 2. In the following year, the quarrel over the succession to Mantua caused Richelieu, the all-powerful minister of France, to send a French army across the Alps, which occupied Susa, while the Austrian army seized Mantua. But the conflict did not spread into Tuscany, though the latter state had to mobilize its whole military strength and remain in a state of preparedness for war. Soon afterwards, Florence suffered from an outbreak of the plague, which raged with great violence for many months, and plunged the city into the utmost misery. In this time of distress, the measures taken by Ferdinand were worthy of his ancestors, the earlier Medici. Money and provisions were liberally distributed to the poor. 
one hundred fifty thousand ducats being given to those of the wool and silk trades alone and rondinelli who was an eye-witness says that all that was done was wisely directed quote, not in mere donations but also in useful works and agricultural labors end quote lazarettos were organized and a general quarantine established the court retired into the fortress of the belvedere which occupying a high eminence enjoyed fresher air than the grand ducal palace at the foot of the hill but ferdinand and his young brothers giovanni carlo matthias and francesco quote, nobly disdaining this shelter while the people were perishing went daily into the city and with hand and voice administered comfort to the sufferers end quote. the pestilence raged for thirteen dismal months during which time in and around the city twelve thousand people died ferdinand established a board of health and this body issued many wise regulations while they also forced the inmates of the immense number of monasteries and convents with which the city was crowded both to obey sanitary rules and also to bear their share in receiving and helping those who were convalescent but ferdinand's sound sanitary regulations were denounced by the priests as impious the pope demanded that the board of health should be censured and required that a severe penance should be exacted from its members and ferdinand unable to resist the pressure of his bigoted grandmother was forced notwithstanding his own and the general indignation to comply with these arbitrary demands with the result that the board of health was made to do penance for having adopted measures which were in every way right and desirable in sixteen thirty one the war cloud departed from italy to spread instead over germany richelieu brought the celebrated gustavus adolphus king of sweden into the contest and the latter ran his short but brilliant course of victory ferdinand's two brothers matthias and francesco then respectively eighteen and seventeen were both eager to take part in the great events occurring north of the alps and the grand duchess maria maddalena being also anxious to visit her brother the emperor in order to see whether he could not assist to prevent the pope from seizing urbino when its duke should die accompanied her sons matthias and francesco on this journey unfortunately however she fell ill on the way and died at passau in november her body being brought back to florence by her two sons and buried in san lorenzo and so passes away another of this family who deserves an honorable record as a young wife maria maddalena high-born virtuous sensible and charming in character and manners had come to florence bringing brightness joy and animation with her had helped to keep the life of the court free from scandals and with her accomplished sisters-in-law had made the grand ducal palace and her villa of poggio imperiale centers of joyous social amusement and relaxation when her husband's health failed she had proved herself an efficient helpmeet to him bearing alone the burden of the court entertainments which he wished still to be kept up showing herself able to give him helpful advice and in every way smoothing his life as an invalid lastly when he died and she was left as regent of the country and at the same time a young mother with a large family of small children she showed herself gifted with sound sense and courage in the manner she brought them up despite the narrow-minded tendencies by which she was surrounded and however much she may have been wanting in administrative and financial ability she deserves high praise for this other portion of her work every one of her five sons showed in their after-lives the effects of a good bringing up and of a large-minded tolerant spirit learnt in their early years and while her son francesco died too soon to evince any special ability her other four sons all made themselves greatly distinguished not only by their good qualities of character but also by their high attainments 
Her daughter, Maria Cristina, died at 22, but her other two daughters, Margarita and Anna, both showed in after years good qualities and marked ability. When, at the age of 40, Maria Maddalena died, her son Ferdinand and his sister Maria Cristina were 21, her sons Giovanni Carlo, Matias, Francesco and Leopold were respectively 20, 18, 17, and 14. Her daughter Margherita was 19, and her daughter Anna, 15 years old. As in the Boboli Gardens, one sits in the long pergola, now so empty and deserted, which is always associated with her memory, it inevitably arouses a vision of the past, as one is drawn to think of how different it must have looked in Maria Maddalena's day, when thronged with the gay crowd of young people whom she and her two elder sisters-in-law gathered round them in the first years after her marriage, or later on with the brilliant embroideries and brocades of the gorgeously dressed retinue, pictured for us in the gallery hard by, who followed her in the days of her regency, or again with the joyous groups of her young sons and daughters and their numerous companions who surrounded her in the last few years of her life. Their mother's funeral being over, Matias and Francesco again prepared to proceed northwards, and as Gustavus Adolphus was threatening to cross the Alps and bring the war into Italy, these two brothers in 1632 started from Florence with money, arms, and two regiments supplied by Tuscany to assist against him, and to learn war in Germany under the great Wallenstein. Soon afterwards, however, the whole aspect of affairs was changed by the Battle of Lutzen in November 1632, at which Gustavus Adolphus was killed, and Richelieu's pride for a time humbled. In this same year, Ferdinand's twin sister, Maria Cristina, died in August at the age of 22 at the villa of Poggio Imperiale, the favorite residence of this generation of the family. Meanwhile, Francesco della Rovere II, Duke of Urbino, at length died at the age of 82. The papal troops at once took possession of Urbino, almost before the breath was out of his body, while the emperor, Ferdinand II, was too much occupied with the war in Germany to be able to take up the cudgels on his nephew's behalf and prevent this seizure of Urbino as he otherwise would have done. And Ferdinand, feeling himself unable to resist a pope without assistance, and hampered by his grandmother's opposition to such a course as being sacrilege, had to acquiesce in seeing his and his future wife's inheritance robbed from them. The matter created much bad blood between the Barberini and Medici families. Cosimo II's brother, Lorenzo, made strong endeavors to get Philip IV of Spain to oppose the Pope's action, but his efforts were unsuccessful and only recoiled upon himself. The general result of the whole affair was that Pope Urban VIII nourished an undying hatred against the Medici throughout his pontificate, thwarting them on all occasions, making every priest and monk in Tuscany an enemy of the government, and creating incessant difficulties in the administration of a country in which priestly influence was supreme. While, by the weakness which Tuscany had displayed over this question of Urbino, it lost all weight in European politics. It was a difficult position for a youth of twenty-two to have to confront, and though a Cosimo I would have met it and overcome the difficulties, no doubt with much bloodshed, Ferdinand II was not cast in so strong a mold. It was not long before Urban VIII found a means of venting his spleen upon Ferdinand, and in a manner which has had the effect of bringing a lasting slur upon the reign of the latter. Galileo, since his achievements in the first year of Cosimo II's reign, had, during the years 1609 to 1632, made many and marvelous astronomical discoveries, 
in the course of which he had had to carry on a perpetual contest with the Jesuits, who endeavored in every way to silence him. In 1611 he had visited Rome, had demonstrated his various discoveries to Pope Paul V, and been well received by the latter. Returning to Florence and publishing more and more astronomical wonders, he was, in 1616, summoned by Paul V to Rome, where his statement that the earth revolved round the sun was condemned by the Inquisition, whereupon he ostensibly acquiesced in the falseness of his theory and promised not to republish this doctrine. During the next seventeen years, 1616 to 1633, Galileo, though still attacked by the theologians, had lived more or less at peace under the aegis of the Grand Duke, going again to Rome in 1624 and being received there with honor by the new Pope, Urban VIII. He again went to Rome in 1630, on which occasion he received a caution to make his books purely mathematical and not doctrinal, and with this caution was allowed to publish them. In 1632 he published his Dialogues. By this time, however, the affair of Urbino had occurred. The Pope was incensed with the Grand Duke of Tuscany, and the weakness of the latter had been fully displayed. Galileo was, therefore, in 1633, charged with having gone back from his promise of 1616 and summoned to appear before the Inquisition in Rome to answer for his writings, which, in maintaining the fixed position of the sun and the movement of the earth round it, propounded a doctrine which was declared by the Pope to be in flat contradiction to the Bible. The causes for this arraignment of Galileo are said to have been twofold, the bitter animosity of the Jesuits against all genuine philosophy, and the enmity of the Pope against the Medici, whose special protégé Galileo had been for more than twenty years. Accordingly, commissioners were sent from Rome, with orders to conduct Galileo thither, notwithstanding that he pleaded illness, and Ferdinand II and his grandmother, the Grand Duchess Christine, stood far too much in awe of priestly condemnation to think of offering any opposition to this arbitrary proceeding. At Rome, Galileo, now seventy years old and broken in health, was threatened with torture by the Inquisition. His theories were formally condemned. He was made to recant on his knees his so-called errors, and especially to declare his doctrine as to the movement of the earth false, and was kept a prisoner until the pope's will regarding him should be made known ferdinand the second has received much execration for having permitted the pope thus to treat galileo for ferdinand's weakness there is nothing to be said but it would seem that the blame cast upon him in the matter has been excessive and that it has not been sufficiently realized that he was still to a very large extent under the domination of his grandmother, the Grand Duchess Christine, especially in a matter which touched religion, and that he had been brought up to consider opposition to a pope's direct command as a deadly sin, which nothing could excuse. He must have changed his nature before he could have withstood a pope's condemnation on a point of this kind. Galileo, having thus recanted his errors, was condemned by the Inquisition to perpetual imprisonment, but the Pope commuted the sentence to residence in retirement in the gardens of Santissima Trinita al Monte, and after a short time there he was allowed to remove to Florence, where, after residing for a little space under the personal charge of the Archbishop, he was permitted, though still a prisoner of the Inquisition, to move to his villa at Arcetri on condition that he lived in retirement, and received no visitors. But he never published anything more. In 1634 he lost his only daughter, a nun, Maria Celeste, who had been his chief comfort in his troubles, and in 1637 was allowed by the Inquisition 
to move to his house in the Costa San Giorgio, but on condition that he did not go out into the city. There, Ferdinand, who had been his pupil as a boy, and who had been aimed at by the Pope together with him, visited the old man and condoled with him on the unjust treatment he had received. Galileo soon afterwards became blind, and when Milton visited him in 1638, was no longer able to see anything more of those wonders of the heavens which he had explored. He retired again to Arcetri, and consecrated to science the last remains of his energies, with a heart full of remembrance of his beloved daughter, who, he wrote, calls me, calls me continually, while I wait to change my present prison for that community august and eternal. But he was comforted, he said, with two thoughts, that I have not ever declined from piety and reverence for the Church and my own conscience. He died at Arcetri in January 1642, without any enmity against those who had spoilt his life. Ferdinand was anxious to erect a monument to him, but the Jesuits opposed this, and, as usual, prevailed, and Ferdinand had to content himself with giving Galileo burial in the chapel of the Medici family in the church of Santa Croce. It is, however, pleasant to record that this wrong done by the Jesuits to Galileo's memory was rectified by the Medici ere they passed away, and the very last year of their rule was signalized by the deserved honor to Galileo being at last given by the erection in 1737 in the nave of Santa Croce of the fine monument to him, his remains being removed to it from the chapel of the Medici. Dean Stanley says that it was from the burial of Galileo and Michelangelo in this church that Santa Croce gradually became the recognized shrine of Italian genius, while Byron, in enumerating those whose dust makes Santa Croce glorious, makes special mention of Galileo. Quote, in Santa Croce's holy precincts lie ashes which make it holier, dust which is even in itself an immortality. Though there were nothing save the past and this, the particle of those sublimities which have relapsed to chaos, here repose Angelo's, Alfieri's bones and his, the starry Galileo with his woes. End quote. End of section 37. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 38 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 28. Ferdinand II, Part 3. In 1633, the year that Galileo was summoned to Rome, the plague again broke out in Florence, and this time there was no board of health, former experience having very effectually put a stop to any further action of that kind. Instead, therefore, of wise sanitary measures, superstition reigned supreme, accompanied by religious ceremonies which, in puerility and intellectual abasement, surpassed everything previously seen. The Madonna del Imprunetta was brought to Florence and carried through the streets, quote, followed by crowds whose contact gave fresh vigor to the pestilence, end quote. and for many months Florence again became a city of mourning. In 1634, Vittoria della Rovere, being now 14, the marriage between her and Ferdinand took place. Brought up in the seclusion of the convent of the Crocetta, Vittoria, to a naturally frivolous disposition, added an entire ignorance of all the circumstances of ordinary life, together with, quote, a most profound admiration for everything connected with the church, end quote. 
It was easy, therefore, to see that she was not the sort of person likely to be of much assistance to Ferdinand in the difficulties which surrounded him through the dominance of the Jesuits and other ecclesiastical orders over the country. She brought with her as her dowry the movable property of the Duke of Urbino, and this added many valuable pictures to those already possessed by the Medici. In the Uffizi Gallery, the portrait by Piero della Francesca of Federigo di Montefeltro, Duke of Urbino and his Duchess, of Pope Julius II by Raphael, of Francesco della Rovere I and Eleonora Gonzaga by Titian, the two pictures of the reclining Venus by Titian, and the portrait of Francesco della Rovere II by Baroccio. And in the Pitti Gallery, the portrait of Guido Baldo della Rovere II, Vittoria's grandfather, by Zuccheri, the Magdalene by Titian, La Bella by Titian, the portrait called The Englishman by Titian, and The Martyrdom of St. Agatha by Sebastian del Piombo, besides many others of lesser note, all formed part of Vittoria's dowry, which also included a valuable collection of Maiolica and Urbino ware, most of which now forms part of the treasures of the Museum of the Bargello. This marriage was shortly afterwards followed by the death, at the age of twenty, of Ferdinand's manly young brother Francesco, who died, greatly regretted by all, in the camp of the imperial army before Ratisbon of the plague. His portrait by Sustermans, which hangs in one of the rooms of the villa of Poggio a Cagliano, shows him as he was at eighteen. He wears armor, but it has only to be compared with that of his ancestor Giovanni delle Bande Nere to see that armor is by this time no longer worn for use, but merely for show. And the large lace collar, the lace cuffs, and the sash, not worn round the waist as hitherto, but over the shoulder, all tell the same tale. In 1636, Ferdinand, ashamed of the many humiliations he suffered from the subordination of the whole country to the Jesuits, and at the state of misgovernment to which it had thereby been reduced, had just resolved to emancipate himself from the Grand Duchess Christine's authority, and to rule independently, when in December of that year she died at the age of seventy-two. Excellent as she was as the mother of a family, and in the social sphere, she was hopelessly incapable of ruling, and the country never recovered from the effect of the clause of Cosimo II's will, which entailed upon it sixteen years of the rule of a woman utterly unfitted for such a task. When she died, Tuscany had become almost more under the domination of the ecclesiastics than Rome itself. Clerics of every kind and degree swarmed throughout the country. Nearly every office was in their power. They treated the Grand Duke's officials with insolence, telling them that they would obey no laws and pay no taxes but such as had the authority of the Pope. Most of the property of the country was owned by monastic orders, and therefore exempt from taxation. There were over 4,000 nuns in Florence alone. The people were crushed by taxation borne by only a portion of the population. Trade and agriculture were languishing, and licentiousness, crime, and ferocity, going unpunished for lack of the strong hand, were rampant. The Inquisition held its gloomy court in the cloisters of Santa Croce, the most dreaded place in Florence, whither all who did not please the Jesuits were likely, sooner or later, to find themselves summoned. Torture, confiscations and penalties, under the orders of the Holy Office, became common things to the Florentines, and the dismal pomp of the horrible Auto da Fe threw its lurid glare over that Piazza Santa Croce, which once had shone with the joy and brightness of Lorenzo's and Giuliano's tournaments. Nor even when Ferdinand came to rule independently was there at first much change in this latter respect. It was in the year 1641 that in the great hall of the refectory of Santa Croce, 
there took place in the presence of the princes of the blood the nobility and the whole of the ministers and high officials of the government the celebrated trial of pandolfo ricasoli a canon of the cathedral and a man of much learning and respectability who was accused whether truly or falsely will never be known of grave and scandalous immoralities and he and one faustina mainardi who was asserted to be his accomplice after first doing penance in the piazza santa croce quote, in garments painted with flames and devils end quote, were condemned to be walled up alive in one of the dungeons of santa croce which sentence was carried out it is evident that ferdinand had strong doubts whether the whole charge was not simply due to bitter animosity on the part of another ecclesiastic he censured the latter for over officiousness in the way he brought forward the accusation and eventually effected his removal from florence to rome thence however the same individual was shortly afterwards sent back to florence promoted to the high office of head of the inquisition in that city the insult was one of many which pope urban the eighth contrived to give ferdinand in revenge for the opposition which he had encountered from the medici to his seizure of urbino but though ferdinand thus failed for a long time to exert any successful opposition to the dominant power of the jesuits in other directions he gradually brought about improvement more especially as his brothers began to grow older and to assist him in public affairs moreover finding it so difficult to bring about a satisfactory state of things in regard to the administration of the country so long as urban the eighth was pope he turned his attention to other matters in which his abilities were better able to find scope the family now consisted of ferdinand and vittoria he being by this time thirty and she nineteen prince giovanni carlo now twenty-nine prince matthias twenty-seven the princess anna twenty-four and prince leopold twenty-three one sister and one brother were dead while the third sister margherita was duchess of parma under the influence of his young wife vittoria the splendor of the court continued to increase and in sixteen forty ferdinand determined on a further enlargement of the grand ducal palace the enlargement of the palace which ferdinand now carried out again nearly doubled it in size cosimo the second's additions had made the palace a large square block three stories high the facade towards the via romana having thirteen windows to this ferdinand now added two more great wings two stories high in prolongation each way of the front portion of the palace thus increasing the facade to its present length of twenty-three windows at the same time adding the buildings round the two inner courtyards at the eastern end he constructed a corridor uniting that end of the palace with the passaggio these additions gave a magnificent range of state apartments on the first floor consisting of about sixty rooms the private apartments being chiefly on the upper floor as soon as the additions to the palace were completed ferdinand caused the whole of the apartments on the first floor to be splendidly decorated with ceiling paintings by piero berettini da cortona ciro ferri and other artists the recent discoveries in astronomy made by galileo were memorialized in these decorations each of the new rooms being dedicated to one of the planets or to such subjects as prometheus the iliad flora etc and cortona's splendid ceiling paintings being made to accord with the dedication thus increased to its present size the grand ducal palace of tuscany became a model which several other sovereigns endeavored in after years to copy though without attaining the same result ferguson speaking of it in his history of architecture says quote, the facade is four hundred sixty feet in extent three stories high in the centre 
each story 40 feet in height and the immense windows of each twenty-four feet apart from center to center with such dimensions as these even a brick building would be grand but when we add to this the boldest rustication all over the facade and cornices of simple but bold outline there is no palace in europe to compare to it for grandeur End quote. and tain says Je doute qu'il y ait un palais plus monumental en Europe. Je n'en ai vu qu'il laisse une impression si grandiose et si simple. End quote. The palace which the Medici had built in 1430 in the Via Larga had surpassed all others of the 15th century, but no less did that which nine generations later they built at the foot of the Boboli Hill surpass all royal palaces in europe of the seventeenth century some idea of its dimensions is afforded by the fact that the central courtyard round three sides of which the center block of the palace is built is exactly the size of the strozzi palace in the via tornabuoni it is sometimes said that this was done intentionally in order to be able to say that the entire strozzi palace could be placed in the central court of the palace of the medici but whether it had any such intention or not the fact helps us to realize the size of the palace built round this courtyard the palace is built directly upon the natural rock in fact in one of the two inner courtyards the floor of the courtyard is the plain rock lines having been cut on it to give the appearance of being paved and in the same courtyard are in the walls of some of the ground floor rooms ornamental gratings by looking through which the virgin rock may be seen actually forming part of the outer walls of these rooms built on such foundations it is no wonder that the palace presents such an appearance of solidity the size and form of the building are not apparent in looking at it from the front because the two-storied portions added by ferdinand the second projecting as these do far on either side of the center block hide the great wings which extend backwards at right angles to the front on both sides of the central courtyard owing to the unusual shape of the palace there is no point from which the whole form of it can be seen so that from whichever side regarded it always looks smaller than it really is and it is only by walking all round it or traversing the interior that its size can be appreciated the latter is also more particularly dwarfed in the view of the front of the palace owing to the fact that when looking at the building from that point the projecting corner of the upper story while preventing the side wall of the center block from being seen also gives the impression that the upper story is only one room in depth whereas there are more than fifty rooms on that story the interior arrangements of the palace remain at the present day very little different from what they were in the time of the medici notwithstanding that it has since been occupied by two other dynasties the ground floor contains the grand ducal chapel a labyrinth of large vaulted rooms accommodating various offices connected with the palace and the three rooms known collectively as the treasure room containing the gold plate and rare china for state occasions and many other valuable heirlooms of the medici beneath one of these halls on the ground floor is to be seen the large swimming bath which was constructed by ferdinand the second at the last enlargement of the palace the grand ducal chapel remains as it was in the time of the medici grand dukes the high altar a mass of the finest and most costly kind of pietra dura work was given to it by cosimo the third the grotto under the terrace at the back of the central court with marble cupids swimming on the water of the fountain has on its walls the arms of vittoria della rovere ascending to the first floor we find the eastern end of the former state apartments occupied by the picture gallery in sixteen large rooms decorated with cortona's beautiful ceiling paintings with opening from the end of these rooms the rest of the state apartments twenty rooms 
and the fifteen rooms which were occupied until Florence ceased to be the capital by the late king of Italy. The hall, which in the time of the Medici Grand Dukes was their throne room, situated in the original portion of the palace built by Cosimo I, is entirely painted, both on the arched roof and walls, with frescoes, executed in the time of Ferdinand I, by Pochetti, representing the founding of Legorn, the battles of Ferdinand's army and navy with the Turks, the attack and capture of Bona from the Barbary pirates by the knights of Santo Stefano, and other deeds of Ferdinand I and his father. In this hall is now placed the beautiful bronze statue executed for Ferdinand I by Gianda Bologna of the genius of the Medici, also the costly ornamental cabinet presented to Anna Maria Ludovica by the city of Paris. The rooms, which were those of the Grand Duchess Vittoria della Rovere, have on the ceiling paintings her motto and family arms, the oak. In the rooms, which were those of the Grand Duchess Marguerite Louise of Orleans, wife of Cosimo III, are various pictures by French artists. In another room is to be seen the fine portrait which Paolo Veronese painted of the Grand Duke Francis I, and in various rooms are specimens of the finest work of the tapestry manufactory founded by Cosimo I, and of the Pietra Dura manufactory founded by Ferdinand I. On the upper floor are, in the right wing, the range of apartments occupied by the present King of Italy when in Florence, including the private ballroom and private dining room. In the left wing, the apartments set apart for guests of the court, and in the center, facing the piazza in front of the palace, the private apartments formerly occupied by the Grand Dukes of Tuscany. These latter, the finest of the fifty rooms on the upper floor, have splendid coffered ceilings of the same description as those in the rooms of the Palazzo Vecchio, which Cosimo I had decorated for Eleonora di Toledo. And, as this portion of the upper floor of the palace formed part of Cosimo's building, it is probable that these rooms were thus decorated for her in the same way. The views from the great windows of the first floor are very fine, but it is upon the upper floor that the best idea is gained of the size and height of the building and the extent of the views from it. Owing to the great height of the palace and its position on a slight eminence, the views looking from the balcony of the upper floor are splendid, the eye being carried right over the city and the view embracing the entire valley of the Arno and the mountains surrounding it. Similarly, from the back of the palace, on the same story, an extensive view is afforded of the whole of the Boboli Gardens, sloping up to the fort of San Giorgio, while from the large center window of the main portion of the building, as well as from the rooms at the ends of the two wings, Sports and pastimes taking place in the amphitheater, situated in this part of the gardens, could be as easily watched as if sitting in the amphitheater. Such was the palace in which the last three generations of the Medici passed their lives. End of section 38 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 39 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 28 Ferdinand II, Part 4. Ferdinand's reign witnessed a great activity in regard to the minor arts, and especially in regard to one of them. While at this time various sculptors, in particular Pietro and Ferdinando Tacca, the successors of Gian da Bologna, attained a certain excellence, 
the last gleams of expiring genius, the chief direction to which the artistic talent of Florence at this period devoted its energies was that of the Florentine inlay work, or pietra dura industry, which had been started by Ferdinand's grandfather, Ferdinand I. The reign of Ferdinand II is notable as that in which this art made so great an advance that it became a specialty of Florence. This work was, however, so costly that only the purse of the Grand Duke could bear its expense. Consequently, almost all the efforts of the art were put forth in connection with the royal manufactory of Pietra Dura. The erection of the mausoleum, to meet the requirements of which that manufactory had been started, was steadily proceeding, while the very best work which the manufactory could produce was being prepared for the intarsiatura work on the lower part of the walls. In addition to this, there was also a constant demand from the Grand Ducal Palace, now that it had been so much enlarged, for inlaid tables, cabinets, and numerous other articles in this work. Ferdinand took immense interest in this industry, fostering it to the utmost, and under him it reached its highest development. As a consequence, other countries became eager to emulate Florence in this new art, and Florentine artists skillful in it were invited to France and other countries to introduce it there. The chief advance made at this time was in the production of half-tints and shadows, to obtain which search for suitable stones was made in the most distant parts of the world. Describing the difficulty of the art, Baldinucci says, quote, Whereas it is the aim of a good painter to mix and diffuse his colors so as to form an infinite number of half-tints, all differing essentially from the original color, the artist in commesso cannot multiply his material, nor melt one color into another, but must adopt the stone as nature made it. In order to convey the color by insensible gradations, from the highest light to the deepest shadow, he must seek out the most delicate tints which nature has produced in stone, and observe the infinite number of shades discoverable in the hardest gems and other stones. End quote. But though so difficult to execute, it is practically indestructible, and this caused it to be highly valued. The most skillful artist in this new form of the art was Luigi Serrier, a Frenchman, who settled at Florence and was appointed by Ferdinand, director of the royal manufactory. Ferdinand's and Vittoria's first child, a son, to whom they gave the name of Cosimo, had been born in 1639, but only lived a week or two. Another child, a daughter, was born in 1641, but also only lived a short time. In 1642, however, another son was born, to whom again the name of Cosimo was given, and who lived to succeed his father. This was followed by the marriage of Ferdinand's remaining sister, the Princess Anna, to her first cousin, Ferdinand Karl, the eldest son of her aunt, Claudia, he being sixteen and she twenty-six. In Anna's portrait by Sustermans, taken when she was about twenty, her likeness to her brother Ferdinand is very marked. Ferdinand, Karl, and Anna preferred the attractions of the splendid court of Tuscany to the mountains of Tyrol, and were more often at Florence than at Innsbruck. They had one daughter, Claudia Felicitas, born at Florence, who married the emperor Leopold I. During the next two years, while the Thirty Years' War continued to be waged with unabated energy in northern Europe, and while England was becoming involved in civil war between Charles I and his Parliament, Pope Urban VIII kept Italy also in a continual ferment by his endeavors to seize upon various territories for his family, the Barberini. On his thus trying to take Castro and Ronciglioni from the Duke of Parma, the latter marched his army through Tuscany into the territories of the Pope, 
who was greatly alarmed at this attack. Ferdinand was drawn into the quarrel, both to assist his brother-in-law and to defend his own state, but his military operations were feeble and brought Tuscany no glory. In fact, the condition of the country was such that military strength was as impossible as satisfactory civil administration. The swarms of ecclesiastics, who exercised a dominating power in every department of the national life, who grievously mismanaged everything they touched, and who acknowledged no authority but that of a pope, whose object was to obstruct the ruler of the country in every way, produced conditions which made military efficiency impossible. The domination of the country by an ecclesiastical hierarchy of this kind produced tribunals which were corrupt and arbitrary. It created monopolies, privileges, immunities from taxation, and vexatious, ill-advised laws under which agriculture dwindled and trade threatened to expire, and it made the people in general completely poverty-stricken. It is remarkable that under such conditions no conspiracies should have arisen against Ferdinand's rule. We still see the old names appearing from time to time, Caponi, Ruccellai, Acciaioli, Ridolfi, and others, families whose members had in former times been ever ready to head such revolts, but none ever seemed tempted to originate a revolt against Ferdinand. His officials were powerless, his troops contemptible, both Spain and France exceedingly cool towards him, and the Pope inimical, so that, except for one consideration, a revolt against his authority would have been easy to carry out. But the affection of the poorer classes of the people was too great to make a rebellion against him practicable. Ferdinand's goodness of heart liberality, love of peace, and easy-going ways, giving them a strong regard for him. Though the mismanagement of the country was palpable, and though the sufferings caused by its subjection to a crowd of insolent and tyrannical priests and monks were felt in every department of life, yet, nevertheless, the people liked Ferdinand. There must have been much that was good in a ruler who, under such adverse conditions, still retained the affection of his subjects. At length, in 1644, Tuscany was at last relieved from that which had formed its chief infliction for twenty-one years, by the death of Pope Urban VIII. He was succeeded by Innocent X, 1644 to 1655, and the new Pope adopted an entirely different attitude towards Ferdinand, showing much friendliness towards him, and Tuscany soon felt the effect of this in an end being put to the evils due to ecclesiastical tyranny under which the country had so long groaned. As one outcome of this friendly feeling, the new pope made the eldest of Ferdinand's brothers, Prince Giovanni Carlo, a cardinal. In 1648, the Thirty Years' War came to an end, and in the same year, Ferdinand's uncle Lorenzo, the third brother of Cosimo II, died at the age of 48. His life had been spoilt, partly by his own fault, partly by circumstances. He had good talents and was anxious to employ them for the advantage of his country, but, from one cause or another, had been prevented from doing so. Twenty years old when his brother Cosimo II died, and his only other brother, Carlo, being a cardinal and living always at Rome, Lorenzo had been anxious to take some part in the government of the country, but was not allowed by the two grand duchesses to do so. Foiled in this, he tried to obtain a command in the Spanish army, but in this also was disappointed as, in consequence of his pressing Spain so persistently to take up his nephew's cause in the matter of Urbino, he fell into ill favor at the Spanish court, and was refused the military command which had been promised him. The result of these failures was that he drifted about, his life alternating between literary pursuits and all kinds of erratic diversions. 
fond of learned men, he collected round him a sort of academy, out of which he subsequently formed two societies, which he called the Inflamed and the Immovable, the latter of which, established in the Via della Pergola, eventually grew into the well-known theatre of that name. Among other peculiarities, he was in the habit of constantly taking all sorts of medicines, and eventually died from a dose of poison given him in mistake for medicine. In the following year, 1649, all Europe was horrified at the execution by the English of their king Charles I, but the event created little stir in Tuscany, which had long ceased to have any commercial or political transactions with England, or to pay much attention to events taking place outside Italy. Ferdinand II was now a man of forty. In his fine portrait by Sustermans, taken at about that age, though contriving to give himself, with the aid of armor and other accessories, a formidable appearance, this was no doubt with a view to hide his real disposition, which, as already noted, was kind, good-hearted, and weak. He wears a large cloak over his armor, and the cross of Grand Master of the Order of Santo Stefano. Vittoria della Rovere, whose portrait by Sustermans shows her as she was at about five-and-twenty, proved a most unsatisfactory wife to Ferdinand, and was a disappointment all through. She neither brought him the dowry of the Duchy of Urbino, which had been the sole reason for his being betrothed to her as a boy of twelve, nor did she make up for being a portionless bride by any qualities in her own character. She was foolish, vain, ignorant, and utterly frivolous. As the result of her education in the seclusion of the convent of the Crocetta, she was entirely ruled by the priests, while having none of the tolerant spirit in matters of religion, which Ferdinand and his brothers possessed, she was a constant cause of discord in the family. She also had a bad temper, and the strife which she created soon became so great that for many years she and her husband were entirely separated, living in different parts of the palace, and never seeing each other except when attending state functions. Though this state of things, after continuing for about seventeen years, was brought to an end in 1659, when a reconciliation took place. But the most lasting harm which Vittoria della Rovere did to the family fortunes was produced by the kind of education which she insisted on giving to her son Cosimo, who was brought up by her from a child, with the sort of training more suited to one who was to become a monk than that required in the case of one who was to be the ruler of a state, with results altogether disastrous to himself and to Tuscany. Looking at the way that she was throughout his life, a heavy drag upon her husband, hampering his best efforts and increasing that priestly domination which was ruining the country, at the still more fatal effect of her manner of training her son, who was destined to rule Tuscany for over half a century, and at the long period during which her pernicious influence was exercised, we may with justice say that if Giulio de' Medici was the evil genius of the earlier generations of the family, Vittoria della Rovere was the evil genius of its last three generations for to her chiefly was due the despicable character of its decline and end. The portraits of Vittoria are numerous, as she delighted in being painted in various characters. Her portrait by Sustermans, in the Pitti Gallery, as a Vestal Virgin, is one of the most notable. In another, also in the Pitti Gallery, she appears as the Blessed Virgin in a group of the Holy Family, and in another in the Uffizi Gallery as the Magdalene. Whilst Vittoria della Rovere was Grand Duchess, the court was maintained with the utmost magnificence. She had a large number of maids of honor, chosen from all the noblest Florentine families, and the whole set of their portraits is to be seen in the long corridor between the Pitti and Uffizi Galleries. 
Victoria survived her husband 23 years, so that her baneful influence was prolonged also for nearly half the next reign. End of section 39. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 40 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2 by G. F. Young. Chapter 28. Ferdinand II, Part 5. It is a far cry from Florence to Agra, from the puny court of the small and decaying state of Tuscany to the magnificent splendor of the court of the great Mogul, the ruler over two hundred millions of people and an empire the size of Europe. But even in the days of her decadence, Florence, which once had led Europe in learning and art, was still able to make her influence reach even to such a far-off region as this, and to write her name in imperishable letters on the palaces of India. Nowhere in all the world does the sunset of departed glory make us feel its pathos as in the long, silent marble halls of the palaces of Agra and Delhi. In them we are surrounded by the very spirit of Omar Khayyam's words, the palace that to heaven its columns threw, and kings the forehead on its threshold drew, I saw the solitary ring dove there, and coo, 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 she cried, and coo, coo, coo. But there is something else there besides this, for there we may see, if we look closely, the first faint beginnings of the West to influence the East, the first evidence in India, after the time of Alexander the Great, of a Western hand and brain guiding Eastern taste into a more perfect expression of its own spirit. It is written in letters of lapis lazuli, topaz, jasper, ruby, and turquoise, and it is the hand of Florence that wrote it. When we stand in the Diwani Am of the palace at Delhi, where stood the peacock throne, the hall which has round its cornice in gold letters the celebrated inscription, Agar Firdus Barue Zamen Ust, Tuvuhin Ust, Wuhin Ust. When we visit the beautiful Diwani Kas of the same palace, whose windows of delicate marble tracery look out over the blue waters of the Jumna, when we walk through the Diwani Kas, or the Kas Mahal, or the Saman Burj of the palace at Agra, or sit in the quiet garden on the bank of the river, while before us rises that dream in marble, the Taj, and when we see these beautiful white marble buildings of the Indian Saracenic architecture decorated everywhere, round arch and pillar, doorway and window, with delicate floral tracery of jasper, agate, cornelian, bloodstone, lapis lazuli, ruby, turquoise, and other precious stones, the originals long since picked out of the marble by the sword and bayonet of plundering Maratha, Jat, or Pathan invader, but replaced in imitation by the reverent care of later British conquerors, and when we afterwards see similar work in the inlaid tables of the Medici in Florence or in their mausoleum, we are apt to imagine that Florence copied this art from faraway India, but it was not so. Each was independent of the other. But though the Munubutkari, or Indian inlay work of inserting designs in precious stones into pure white marble, existed long before it received any influence from the West and came originally from Persia, the improvement in the designs, which is visible in these palaces at Delhi and Agra, received its inspiration from Florence. 
It was in 1627 that the fifth of the Mughal emperors, the Emperor Shah Jahan, the great building emperor, grandson of the great and magnificent Akbar, succeeded his father, the Emperor Jehangir, and began that series of beautiful buildings, first at Delhi and then at Agra, which made his reign of thirty years the culminating point of Mughal architecture. In 1629, his beloved wife, Urjumund Banu, niece of the celebrated Nur Mahal, died, and Shah Jahan determined that she should have the most splendid tomb ever erected over any woman. How well he carried out this determination has been attested by the world at large. It has been well said. The Taj is in harmony with that side of Eastern feeling which regards a white muslin tunic and an aigrette of diamonds as full dress for an emperor. Keen. So light, it seems, says Bernard Taylor, so airy, so like a fabric of mist and dreams, with its great marble dome soaring up like a silvery bubble, that even after you have touched it and climbed it, you may almost doubt its reality. And it is in the Taj that we first see that change in the inlay work which denotes the influence of the Florentine Pietra Dura artists, a change still further developed afterwards in the inlay work ornamenting the palaces of Delhi and Agra. In 1648, Ferdinand, as a part of his endeavors to make the new industry at Florence still more perfect, sent Austin de Bordeaux, a Frenchman in his service, who was one of the leading workers in the royal manufactory, with several other artificers, to the emperor Shah Jahan to procure certain silices only to be obtained in India. These Florentines, while at the court of the great Mughal, suggested more artistic designs for the inlay work going on in the decoration of the new buildings at Delhi and Agra, introducing more delicate floral patterns. While Austin de Bordeaux, instead of returning to Florence, took service permanently under the Emperor Shah Jahan for this kind of work, being chiefly employed upon the ornamentation of the palace at Delhi and the construction of the peacock throne. And from this time forth, the inlay work at Delhi and Agra shows that resemblance which has been mentioned to the Pietra Dura work of Florence. Thus did Tuscany, even in her decay, still show power to influence other countries far beyond her own narrow boundaries, and left her sign manual upon one of the most beautiful of the arts of India. One of the best arrangements made by Ferdinand II was the plan which he adopted about the middle of his reign of associating his three brothers with himself in the government of the country and giving each of them one branch of state affairs to administer with almost complete authority, one controlling military affairs, one finance, and the third political affairs. Matters being well administered in each case, the arrangement was both popular and productive of much good to the country. Prince Matthias commanded the army and had the management of all military affairs. He was a good soldier and had seen much service in Germany during the Thirty Years' War, from whence he returned with a high reputation to command the army of Tuscany. In addition to this office, he was also made governor of Siena, where he became very popular, and was more often there than in Florence. His portrait by Sustermans in the Pitti Gallery shows him as he was towards the end of his life, which terminated at the age of 54. He wears a blue scarf over his armor and a large white collar in the fashion of the time, and holds in his hand the baton denoting his office as commander-in-chief of the army. Cardinal Giovanni Carlo had the control of financial affairs, which he managed well. On being created a cardinal by Innocent X, he had resided for some years at Rome, where, after being employed by the Pope in various capacities, 
he was at length sent to receive Queen Christina of Sweden, the daughter of Gustavus Adolphus, when, in 1654, she renounced her throne in consequence of becoming a Roman Catholic, and came to settle in Rome. Innocent X, however, died in the following year, being succeeded by Alexander VII, 1655 to 1667, and the new pope found that, quote, the society of young prelates and Christina's attractions became so agreeable to all parties, end quote, that he thought it desirable to appoint a cardinal of maturer years as Queen Christina's spiritual director, and requested Ferdinand to recall Giovanni Carlo to Florence, he being considered by the Pope too young and handsome for such an office. Like his younger brother Leopold, Giovanni Carlo was a great collector of pictures and other objects of art, and a keen assistant in every undertaking entered upon by Ferdinand to promote the advancement of science, literature, or art. His fine portrait by Sustermans in the Lucca Picture Gallery depicts him in his dress as a cardinal, and was taken when he was about 33 years old. He has the long hair and curls usually associated in our minds with the cavaliers of that period in England. But the most capable of all the five brothers was the youngest, Prince Leopold, who had the charge of political affairs, but whose talents and enthusiasm in the cause of art and science caused these latter subjects to be his principal sphere of activity. It is strange that this eminently capable man, who by his ability and energy produced such important and lasting effects for the renown of Florence, should have been consigned to almost complete oblivion. By most he is, if known at all, only known as the originator of the collection of portraits of the painters in the Uffizi Gallery. His important work of not only founding the celebrated scientific society of the Cimento, but leading it during the whole of its brilliant career, has won for him no credit his name even being scarcely mentioned in connection with that society. His valuable work in assisting the cause of literature has been equally unrecognized. Above all, it is to Leopold that the world chiefly owes the two great picture galleries of the Uffizi and the Pitti, of which Florence is so justly proud. And for this achievement alone, his name deserves to be rescued from the obscurity into which it has been allowed to sink. He was a worthy successor of those earlier members of the family who had done so much for learning and art in the 15th century. And he was the last of this family who showed that exceptional ability for which it had for nearly three centuries been noted. Leopold corresponded with all the leading men of science and professors of the fine arts throughout Europe. His critical taste and knowledge in all matters relating to art and literature were proverbial. While in science he had not only been one of Galileo's chief pupils, but also his abilities and ardor in that study made him the natural leader of the band of men who had been influenced by Galileo's researches and were anxious to carry still further the scientific enquiries which the latter had inaugurated. The fine portrait of Leopold depicts him in the dress of a cardinal, and was, therefore, painted towards the end of his life, as he did not become a cardinal until 1667, by which time he was fifty years of age. He holds in his hand one of the many letters on the subject of art or science which he was constantly receiving from his numerous correspondents scattered about Europe. Ferdinand, who had the reputation of being the most cultured ruler of his time in Europe, took as keen an interest in all scientific, literary, and artistic matters as his brothers Giovanni Carlo and Leopold. And these three Medici brothers owing to their eagerness in this cause and the influence which their position and wealth gave them, were at this period the leading men in Florence in all that pertained to science, literature, or art. 
Ferdinand's gradual emancipation from the ecclesiastical domination which had so seriously marred the earlier part of his reign begins to show itself about the time of the death of Galileo in 1642, about which time we see the initiation by Ferdinand of a movement due to the seed sown by Galileo, which ere long had great results. Ferdinand and his brothers, who had all been pupils of Galileo, had been greatly impressed, not only by his teaching, but still more by the illogical character of the arguments used in condemning his theories, and they were profoundly anxious to initiate, in opposition to the theories of the scholastic philosophy, a system of deduction of truth from the observation of facts, and of dispersion of error by the force of experimental knowledge. As the first step in this direction, and as a preliminary attack on the tyranny over thought exercised by the ecclesiastics and on the false philosophy which they propounded, Ferdinand, when he was thirty-two, formed, about the time of Galileo's death, the Conversazione Filosofica of the Palace, a society which, holding its meetings in the Grand Ducal Palace itself, had for its members all the ablest literary and scientific men of the day, including such enlightened men as the celebrated Evangelista Torricelli da Modigliana, Niccolo Aggiunti, Famiano Michelini, Viviani, Marsili, Uliva, and the renowned physician, philosopher, and poet Francesco Redi. From the brilliant talents of those who formed its members, this philosophical society of the palace gained wide respect from all interested in literature and science. End of section 40. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 41 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 28. Ferdinand II, Part 6. This, however, was but the preliminary step to one much greater. In the year 1657, when Ferdinand was 47, there was formed under his patronage by his talented brother, Prince Leopold, the celebrated Academia del Cimento, Academy of Experiment, the first society for experiments in natural science ever formed in Europe and one which became the model for all those subsequently established in England, France, and other countries. And this new academy held its first meeting on the 16th June, 1657, in the Grand Ducal Palace, presided over by its founder, Prince Leopold de' Medici, then 40 years old. Truly, the Pitti Palace, honored as it is by all artists for its magnificent picture gallery, should be no less honored by all scientists as the building in which originated this notable event in the world of science. The Royal Society of England was not incorporated until 1663, and the French Academy of Science not until 1666, so that Florence in this matter also as in former days it had done in learning, and as it had done in art, led the way. And prominent as had been the leadership of the Medici as to learning and as to art, in neither of these was it so directly marked as in this case of science. Prince Leopold, both as an earnest pupil of Galileo and on account of his own proficiency in science, was chosen by the new society as the proper man to lead it as its president, and very ably he did so. At its first meeting, the society ruled that its fundamental law should be that no special school of philosophy or system of science should be adopted by it, and that it bound itself to investigate nature by the pure light of experimental facts. 
also that the society should be open to all talent and that the privilege of selecting the experiments to be made should lie with the president it adopted as its motto provando e riprovando magalotti was chosen as its secretary and on the walls of the entrance hall of the present national library in the uffizi building are to be seen the portraits of the distinguished men who were the first members of this famous society thus took place the first case on record of the formation of a society purely for the pursuit of inductive science and for the furtherance of that new philosophy which galileo had inaugurated and of which bacon was to be the chief exponent ferdinand took the greatest interest in the work of the new society and devised several of the experiments among others the suggestion of the use of the expansion of liquids for thermometric purposes instead of the air of galileo's thermoscope the results of the experiments made by this society were later on detailed by the secretary magalotti and were published in florence in sixteen sixty seven under the title saggi di naturali esperienze fatte nell'accademia del cimento results of experiments in natural science made by the academy of the cimento and a latin translation of this work was published at leyden in 1731 by von muschenbrock regarding these results of this society's work a scientist of our own day remarks many of these experiments are classics in the history of science but leopold was not only fitted to be the president of such a society through his scientific attainments his gifts of character enabled him to guide smoothly a community of men of very diverse idiosyncrasies who, however talented they were as scientists, were no freer from the frailties of jealousy and envy, vanity and self-conceit, than commoner mortals. And his gifts in this direction received a remarkable testimony. The new society pursued an energetic and brilliant career for ten years. Then, Leopold, his brother Giovanni Carlo having died, was made a cardinal in his place and had to resign his presidency of the society. The removal of the guiding spirit which had known how to make all the members work together for a common object had immediate results which showed how considerable his gifts were in this respect no less than in the scientific direction for the society of the cimento which in its short career of ten years had won renown all over europe had a sudden and dramatic end Nepier relates that upon leopold's retirement from the leadership of the society quote, the clashing pretensions of irascible genius burst forth and blew the assembly to atoms its fragments still bright and precious were eagerly gathered up by foreign nations and made the cornerstones of steadier institutions end quote. it was an epitome of all florentine history without the leadership of one particular family which alone of all the tuscan race possessed a special gift for calming discord and inducing antagonistic natures to work harmoniously together and whose possession of this valuable quality demonstrated in many generations of this family for two hundred and fifty years was here exhibited for the last time internecine conflict ever robbed the talent and genius of the florentine race of its crown and flower of success none but a medici could ever steer the bark of florentine genius safe to port and keep it from wrecking itself upon the rock of fratricidal strife ferdinand and his brothers giovanni carlo and leopold were no less active in the cause of literature than in that of science by them was formed with diligent labor the palatine library or library of the palace which now forms the chief part of the national library of the uffizi and contains fourteen thousand manuscript books and over two hundred thousand printed books the treasures of this library though not so great as those of the older medici library founded by cosimo pater patrie are still very considerable 
it possesses over 300 volumes of letters and papers of Galileo and his most distinguished contemporaries, including his celebrated Discourses and Mathematical Demonstrations and his treatise called The Dialogues, which brought upon him the wrath of Pope Urban VIII. Also, an interesting letter from his favorite pupil, Viviani, proving that Galileo was the first to apply the principle of the pendulum to the clock. Among the illuminated books is a missal, once the property of the Emperor Otto III, 983 to 1002, with his name written in it. Also another missal, with very interesting medallions in enamel. A Bible which belonged to Savonarola has his comments written in the margin, and in so fine a hand that a magnifying glass is required to decipher them. A scrapbook of Ghiberti's contains notes and sketches by himself and other artists of his time. The library also contains autograph letters of Boccaccio, Politian, Machiavelli, Michelangelo, Tasso, Alfieri, Redi, and many other celebrated men. Also, a valuable manuscript edition of Petrarch's works, and a copy of Dante's Divine Comedy, written only fifty years after his death, and illustrated with very curious miniatures and a profile portrait of Dante himself. A copy of the Anthologia has a frontispiece of the most beautifully executed miniatures and small medallions painted in 1499. A copy of the Pandects of Justinian, made by order of the Signoria, when the original was removed to Rome by Leo X, has beautiful illuminations executed by Boccardini. The Latin Bible of St. Jerome, in two volumes, has a miniature of him on the first page, and in the margins, beautiful little drawings of landscapes with deer. Raymond Lully's rare book on alchemy and magic has beautifully painted illustrations with charming landscape backgrounds. Another curious book is The Miracles of the Madonna, a very rare Portuguese work with illustrations of an Eastern character. A fine copy of the Hebrew Bible, printed in 1488, is the first edition ever printed in that language. The Poems of Bellinconi, printed in 1493, another very rare work, has notes in the margin by the critical Accademia della Crusca. The Latin poem of the Convenevole, describing the corrupt state of religion in the 14th century, an exceedingly rare work, owing to its censures against the Church, causing it to be destroyed wherever possible, has curious miniatures in which the angels are represented behind walls with the swallow-tailed battlements of the Ghibelline party, while the people are behind square gulf battlements. Another notable book is the Intria Vergeli e Opera Expositio by Servius, being the first book ever printed in Florence, 1477. It was printed by the Florentine goldsmith Cennini, who cast his own type after seeing the results of printing in Germany and on the title page commemorates his invention. The first printed copy of Homer, printed on vellum and presented by the editor Bernardo Nerli to Pietro the Unfortunate at the time of the latter's marriage in 1488, has in it a portrait in miniature of Pietro himself at the age of 17. One of the first attempts at printing with movable types is a copy of Durando's Rationale Divinorum Officiorum, a work explaining the origin of the various ceremonies of the Church, which went through 48 editions. The copy of the Divine Comedy, with commentaries by Cristoforo Landino, bound in red and white leather, ornamented with Landino's arms, which was presented by him to the Signoria in 1481, has fine miniatures and, among them, a portrait of Dante himself. The above gives some idea of the many rare and interesting books contained in the splendid library which Ferdinand and his two brothers formed. But by far, 
the most important memorial of the reign of Ferdinand II, was made in the domain of art. Francis I and Ferdinand I had begun placing some of the family pictures in the rooms constructed by them over the offices of the Uffizi, but as yet there was nothing there which could be called a regular picture gallery, while the rooms up to this time consisted only of a few opening from the eastern portion of the corridor. But in the latter part of Ferdinand II's reign, at the suggestion of Prince Leopold, the two brothers, Giovanni Carlo and Leopold, both of whom possessed very large collections of pictures of their own, irrespective of those which were the general property of the family, besides numerous other objects of art, gave the whole of their collections to form the two galleries of the Pitti and the Uffizi, those belonging to Giovanni Carlo being chiefly made to form the gallery in the Grand Ducal Palace itself, the Pitti Gallery, and those belonging to Leopold to form the Uffizi Gallery. At the same time, Ferdinand added to these the general collection of pictures which he had inherited as head of the family, as well as those which he had acquired from Urbino with his wife Vittoria della Rovere. To house this great collection of pictures, to which many other objects of art were added by each of the brothers, not even the spacious Grand Ducal Palace could give sufficient accommodation, and it therefore became necessary to largely extend the gallery constructed over the offices of the Uffizi. This was nearly trebled in size, the corridor being extended all along the western side and additional rooms being added on that side. Ferdinand also, among other objects of art, added the whole of the valuable collection of gems, rare vases and other valuable articles now kept in the gem room, which was at the same time constructed for this purpose. Leopold not only originated the proposal for the formation of these two galleries and contributed the largest share of the pictures, other than those already belonging to the family, but he also conducted all the arrangements necessary to form the gallery of the Uffizi. At the same time, he began the collection of the portraits of the painters of all nations, which now fills four rooms of that gallery. All the portraits of the oldest masters he obtained, some from the Academy of St. Luke at Rome, among which was the portrait of Raphael, and others as the result of a long and careful search made by him throughout Italy for any portraits of them which could be found. And to these he added those of the chief painters of his own time. Another important item in his contributions to the Uffizi Gallery was the valuable collection of drawings to be seen there, which took him many years to collect. Most of the pictures in the Venetian room he bought through a Florentine merchant, Paolo del Sera, who was settled at Venice. The above action on the part of Ferdinand and his two brothers is the real formation of the Pitti and Uffizi galleries as we now know them. Prince Leopold's artistic possessions being much greater than those of his brother, Cardinal Giovanni Carlo, he did not restrict himself only to the Uffizi gallery, and many of the objects of art to be seen in the Pitti gallery were also given by him. Notably, the interesting collection of miniatures of important historical personages of his time, made by him in the course of his travels through Europe, now in the corridor of the columns in the Pitti gallery, which miniatures Leopold valued so highly that he used to carry them with him wherever he went. He also gave, among other articles of the kind, the rich stipo, or cabinet of ebony, enclosing a small altar, and having its many doors and drawers inlaid with precious marbles and curious and beautiful designs in transparent stones, which stands in the center of one of the rooms, and which, after he became a cardinal, he occasionally used when he celebrated mass in the palace. It was in this manner that the Uffizi and Pitti galleries were formed, and it shows what the Medici were in the domain of art, that they could, even in their decadence, 
form out of their private collections the two most important picture galleries in Europe. These two galleries, however, were not as yet public galleries, but simply, conjointly, the private picture gallery of the Medici family. It was to remain for a later generation of that family to make them the property of Tuscany. This important work formed the occupation which, during the last ten years of Ferdinand's reign, chiefly engaged the attention of Leopold de' Medici. And it was fitting that this truly great man, of whom we never hear anything but what is good, and who, wherever we meet with him, is always engaged, either in works of charity, or in some important work in the cause of science, literature, or art, should be commemorated in that gallery, whose formation was the last and greatest of his many enlightened labors. His statue has fittingly been placed in the room in the Uffizi Gallery, containing the portraits of the greatest masters of painting, where he sits surrounded by the portraits of those of whose works he was the largest and most appreciative collector ever known. Around him hang the portraits of Bellini, Perugino, Leonardo da Vinci, Filippino Lippi, Michelangelo, Giorgione, Titian, Raphael, Andrea del Sarto, Guercino, Tintoretto, Velasquez, Rembrandt, Van Dyck, and many another of that glorious company. End of section 41. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 42 of The Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 28. Ferdinand II, Part 7. During the years 1649 to 1660, the Commonwealth was in power in England, and in the Pitti Gallery there is an interesting memento of this time. When the persecution of the Waldensian Protestants was at its height, Oliver Cromwell sent a message to Pope Alexander the Seventh that if these cruelties were not promptly stopped, he would send the English fleet into the Tiber to exact retribution which message forthwith produced an order from the Pope to the Duke of Savoy to desist. Ferdinand was so struck with admiration of Cromwell's action that he sent a request to the latter that he would allow his portrait to be painted for him by Sir Peter Lely. Cromwell acquiesced and added that he would himself present Ferdinand with it. And in due time the portrait of Oliver Cromwell presented by him to Ferdinand, and painted by Sir Peter Lely, arrived and was placed with Ferdinand's other pictures in the family gallery, where it still hangs. Ferdinand, during his reign, initiated various experiments with the object of improving the agricultural and commercial prospects of the country, and one of these, though it did not produce the results he hoped, still survives and is of considerable interest. This was his endeavor to introduce camels into Tuscany, as being hardier and less expensive to keep than horses. They were imported from India and tried in various places in Tuscany. Unfortunately, however, it was found that the climate and conditions of the country did not suit them. Only at one place did they continue to thrive, namely in the Grand Ducal Park at San Rosore, about three miles from Pisa where they may still be seen, the herd numbering about 200 and being employed chiefly in carrying wood. In 1660, the year that in England Charles II regained his throne, a second son was born to Ferdinand and Vittoria, 18 years after the birth of their eldest son Cosimo. He was given the name of Francesco Maria, Though the evil effects of a monkish style of bringing up were by this time making themselves strongly apparent in their eldest son, 
and though Ferdinand showed that he was fully aware of the error by spasmodic attempts to retrieve it, yet he allowed the same style of training to be given by the boy's mother to this second son. Ferdinand, perhaps acquiescing, for fear of again disturbing the comparative domestic peace, which had, after so many years of discord, only so recently been established. In the case of Francesco Maria, the effects were of less importance, as he was not called upon to rule, and was, from the first, intended for an ecclesiastical career. In 1661, Cosimo, Ferdinand's eldest son, being now nineteen, arrangements for his marriage were taken in hand. Under the kind of bringing up which he had received, he had developed into a gloomy and disagreeable youth, sunk in bigotry and superstition, unmanly, awkward, hating all society, shunning as impious everything connected with science or philosophy, an enemy to all cheerfulness, detesting music, art, poetry, and the conversation of learned men, equally disliking all manly exercises, sullen and ill-tempered, and only at his ease in the society of friars and monks. Ferdinand thought to cure this by marriage, but while it was obvious that to find a wife suitable for such a youth would be a difficult task, if all Europe had been searched, none more unsuitable could have been found than the one who was selected. The princess, Marguerite Louise of Orleans, then sixteen, daughter of Gaston, Duke of Orleans, and first cousin of Louis the Fourteenth, who had succeeded Louis the Thirteenth in 1643, had been brought up as the future Queen of France. She was lively, beautiful, clever, highly accomplished, full of French espièglerie, brilliant in conversation, fond of riding and hunting, detested all gravity and melancholy, and was, in short, the exact opposite of Cosimo in every particular. To crown all, she was deeply in love with the young Prince Charles of Lorraine, to whom, when the plan of her marrying Louis the Fourteenth fell through, she had hoped to be married. Her mother, the widowed Duchess of Orleans, wished it, and was opposed to her daughter being given to Prince Cosimo of Tuscany. But her children were left by Duke Gaston under the king's charge, the schemes of Cardinal Mazarin brought the king's authority to bear, and the unhappy girl was given her choice of this marriage or a convent. After being married by proxy in the chapel of the Louvre in April 1661, she traveled to Marseille, where she was met by Prince Matthias and escorted by him to Legorn and thence to Florence, the whole journey from Legorn to Florence being made a brilliant pageant, all that wealth and taste could devise being employed to give it splendor. But Marguerite Louise had left her heart behind her in France, and hated all things Italian. She was received at Florence with great festivities, the palace was turned into a scene of enchantment, and every device was put forth to give her pleasure, but under the circumstances this was impossible. Her broken heart and the natural disgust which she felt for the monk-like and unattractive Cosimo prevented her taking pleasure in anything. Despair and a settled melancholy seized upon her, and every proposal for her entertainment was met only by bitter sarcasm. Shortly after the marriage, Prince Charles of Lorraine paid a visit to Florence, which made matters worse, and after his departure, Marguerite Louise no longer made any attempt to conceal her detestation of her position, of Florence, of the Tuscan court, and of everything in Italy. She refused to learn the Italian language, and sent urgent prayers to the King of France to be allowed to enter a convent rather than remain in Tuscany. And neither the endeavors of her father-in-law to assuage her misery, nor the threats of Louis the Fourteenth nor the efforts of his ministers to smooth matters had any effect in producing a change in her conduct. There is an interesting relic still in Florence of these dead-and-gone troubles, of the poor, 
cruelly treated bright French princess Marguerite Louise. Some years ago, two of the silver coins in the collection of coins in the archaeological museum, which bore the head of Ferdinand II, were discovered to be hollow and to be, in reality, boxes, and in one of these was a miniature of Prince Charles of Lorraine in his youth, believed to have been concealed in this manner by Marguerite Louise, so that she might wear it without detection, which had been the cause of its becoming lost. In January 1663, Cardinal Giovanni Carlo died at the age of 52. His death was felt to be a great loss, both to the family and to the country, owing to his ability in public affairs, his varied talents, and his agreeable disposition. In the following year, hostilities threatened to break out between France and Pope Alexander VII, and to bring war into Tuscany, both sides having assembled their forces on her frontiers. But the dispute was, at the last moment, settled by a conference which was held at Pisa, presided over by Ferdinand, always at his best as a peacemaker. But all international politics were thrown into the shade by the quarrels between Prince Cosimo and his young wife, which turned the Tuscan court upside down. A son who was named Ferdinand was born to this ill-assorted pair in August 1663, but the explosions and turmoils still went on. At one time, Marguerite Louise, wishing herself dead, would neither eat anything nor speak to anyone. At another, she poured forth volumes of the most cutting ridicule on everyone connected with the court, so that none dared go near her for fear of her biting and sarcastic wit. The Duc de Crequy, Louis XIV's ambassador to the Pope, was ordered on his return journey from Rome to visit Florence and endeavor to bring the Princess Marguerite Louise to a better mind. But after a few days, quote, he gave up the attempt in despair and returned to the less puzzling affairs of state policy, end quote. A second special ambassador sent from France met with like success. Then Madame de Defant, who had been the governess of the princess, was dispatched on the same errand, and after a toilsome journey from Paris, arrived at Florence armed with copious instructions from Louis the Fourteenth as to the arguments she was to employ. But all were equally scorned by the young French princess, who, brought up to admire all that was bright and gay and noble in life, and in love with one who fulfilled these ideals, had been handed over to such a fate as marriage to the gloomy and contemptible Cosimo. The written threats of the King of France, the arguments of French ambassadors, the persuasive exhortations of her governess, even the authority of the Pope, were all alike powerless to make Marguerite Louise more ready to endure her lot. At length, she could stand the court no longer, and retreated to Poggio a Cagliano, whence she sent a message to Cosimo that if he dared to come there, he would have a missile thrown at his head. After a little time, however, she repented herself of this move, suddenly reappeared at the palace, flung herself into her father-in-law's arms, and acknowledged herself in the wrong, and for a time the court had a little peace. In June 1666, Ferdinand's uncle, Cardinal Carlo de' Medici, the last of Cosimo II's brothers, died at the age of 71. He had lived almost all his life at Rome, was deacon of the Sacred College, and had long been a person of considerable importance at the Vatican. His body was brought to Florence and buried in San Lorenzo. In the following year, Pope Alexander VII died, and was succeeded by Clement the Ninth, sixteen sixty seven to sixteen seventy. Both the cardinals of the Medici family having died during the preceding four years, the new pope now made Prince Leopold, by this time fifty years old, a cardinal in the place of his brother Giovanni Carlo. In this same year, sixteen sixty seven, 
Ferdinand's brother, the successful soldier Matias, died at the age of 54 at Siena, of which city he had for many years been governor, and where he was much liked. He never married, and was thus the third of Ferdinand's brothers, who had died leaving no children. His body was brought to Florence and buried, like all those at this time, in the new sacristy of San Lorenzo, waiting until the family mausoleum was sufficiently completed for them to be interred there. In the same year that Prince Leopold was made cardinal, and that Prince Matthias died, the quarrels between the Princess Marguerite Louise and the monkish and irritable youth to whom she had been married again developed into an open rupture. Sent to the family palace at Pisa, Marguerite Louise was kept there by Cosimo as a sort of prisoner and prevented from holding any communication with the outside world. Finding her circumstances becoming thus ever more intolerable, and that she could get no help from her relatives in France, she evolved the idea of escape from the contemptible Cosimo by joining a party of gypsies, with whom she was discovered one night settling all the arrangements from a window of the palace at Pisa, whereupon that mode of escape was made impossible. Soon afterwards, her second child was born, a daughter named Anna Maria Ludovica, the wild projects and immoderate behavior into which Marguerite Louise was drawn have too often formed a subject merely for ridicule. They show to what depths of despair this once bright, clever, and accomplished girl had been reduced by the cruel policy of Louis the Fourteenth and Cardinal Mazarin in forcing her to marry one so infinitely her inferior in abilities, knowledge, and every other quality and her vagaries, laughable as they often were, should rather excite an intense pity, since, in one not by any means wanting in ability, they showed how deep was the misery which she suffered. The aversion which Marguerite Louise entertained for Cosimo being so great, and travel being the best means for enlarging a mind so narrow as his, Ferdinand, in 1667, very wisely sent the latter off to make an extended tour of various countries. It had, at any rate, the advantage of relieving Marguerite Louise of his presence for a considerable time, and during his absence we hear of no more of these vagaries on her part. In this tour, Cosimo visited Germany, Holland, Spain, and Portugal, from thence endeavouring to reach England, he was driven by a storm to Ireland, where, quote, he was astounded at the wretched condition of the people, whom he found in far greater poverty and misery than those of Tuscany, end quote. From Ireland, Cosimo travelled to London, and thence, passing through France, returned to Florence in 1669 after an absence of two years. Ferdinand's health had for some time been failing. He only lived a few months after his son's return, and in May 1670 the fifth Grand Duke passed away at the age of sixty, and after a reign of fifty years during which the condition of Tuscany had been one long decline. In larger politics, Ferdinand's sincere and successful endeavor to preserve peace in Italy was the distinguishing feature of his reign. He was buried with great pomp in a temporary grave in the new sacristy of San Lorenzo, pending the completion of the family mausoleum. Ferdinand II furnishes a strong illustration of the fact that the greatest crime of which one placed in any position of authority can be guilty is weakness, and that in a ruler neither immorality nor even ferocity produce such an amount of misery to others as this failing. Ferdinand's good qualities are patent in every period of his life. His kind and generous disposition, his unselfishness, desire to do good, love of peace, regard for religion, good abilities and energy in the cause of science and art, all these are conspicuous, 
but they could not compensate for the one defect of weakness. Cosimo I, with all his murders, cruel tyrannies, and deceitful character, made Tuscany, for the mass of the people, a happy and prosperous country. Ferdinand II, with all his goodness of disposition and desire to do right, made it the most degraded and misgoverned country in Europe. And the root of these opposite results lay solely in the fact that the former was a strong ruler and the latter a weak one. But the full effect of Ferdinand's weakness was not seen till the next reign. End of section 42 Recording by Linda Johnson Section 43 of the Medici, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 29. Cosimo III, Part 1. Born 1642, reigned 1670-1723, to 1723, died 1723. To those who have watched the many illustrious achievements of this family during a course of nearly three hundred years, it is deplorable indeed to witness the rapid descent to ignominy which now set in. Down the steep path from degradation to degradation go the Medici, and down with them, dragged at their chariot wheels, goes Tuscany also and could lorenzo the magnificent have stood again in florence he might have inverted the form of his speech and said the state goes with the house they rose and fell together the death of all ability the death of all high and generous sentiments the death of all strength and force of character this is what is set before us in the fifty-three years reign of cosimo the third great things are being done in other parts of europe the victories of the great turenne the victories of marlborough blenheim ramier oudenard and malplaquet the spread of science literature and art in other countries but tuscany has no part in these things and leads the way no more to anything but degeneracy and ruin cosimo was twenty-eight years old when he succeeded to the throne his character has already been noted his travels had not produced any marked improvement in him their chief effect having been only to give him an unbounded love of ostentation with the result that the magnificence and luxury of his court far exceeded that of any previous reign for the first three years matters proceeded tranquilly peace for a time prevailed between the grand duke and his wife marguerite louise the strong respect which Cosimo entertained for his uncle Leopold's opinion gave promise of wisdom and moderation in the government, while the birth in 1671 of a second son, who was named Giovanni Gastone, was welcomed as rendering more secure the continuance of the family. But this satisfactory state of affairs did not last long cosimo's subordination to priestly influence together with the constant interference of his foolish mother vittoria della rovere in all matters after a time provoked the grand duchess marguerite louise to demand in sixteen seventy four a share in the government this being refused she withdrew to poggio a caiano wrote thence to cosimo saying you make the unhappiness of my life and i make the unhappiness of yours and demanded a final separation and permission to return to france to this cosimo afraid of the strong public opinion which existed in her favour had to consent accordingly delighted to be able at last to turn her back on the country which had been to her like a prison for thirteen years marguerite louise left tuscany for france where she took up her abode at the convent of montmartre near paris this was followed by the death in sixteen seventy five of cosimo's uncle cardinal leopold who died at the age of fifty eight and with him departed all ability and common sense in the conduct of affairs the grand duchess vittoria the field being thus left vacant now gained the entire influence 
and where she was paramount every folly was a certainty ferdinand the second's ministers were replaced by others of her selection chosen as a rule from the cloister men so utterly without capacity or spirit that Magolotti compared them to little children frightened lest they should be sent back to school theology became a substitute for statesmanship and in a short time universal contempt for tuscany and its sovereign began to be the prevailing sentiment among other powers while in home affairs one ill-advised measure after another followed in rapid succession meanwhile marguerite louise was highly popular at the french court where her lively sallies and constant ridicule of cosimo and the tuscan court greatly amused louis the fourteenth this made cosimo furious increasing his naturally bad temper almost to madness he threatened to stop her allowance but louis the fourteenth forbade him to do so and cosimo stood far too much in awe of the french monarch to disobey the history of cosimo the third's long reign of over half a century is one of every evil which a ruler at once vain weak tyrannical entirely wanting in brains and sunk in superstition and bigotry can create the record becomes wearisome by reason of the constant repetition of the same enormities and imbecilities while the condition of the outraged people grew ever more deplorable cosimo was his own minister of justice his avarice caused him to overtax his subjects his bigotry to arraign them for offences outside the scope of all ordinary laws his weak yet tyrannical disposition to inflict upon them punishments outrageous in their cruel severity and these effects when combined with the measures to which an earnest but mistaken view of religion led a foolish and superstitious character produced results which made the condition of the people under the worst of asiatic rulers more tolerable than that of the people of tuscany under cosimo the third crime poverty cruel punishments and priestly interference in every detail of domestic life reduced the inhabitants to the last stage of wretchedness cosimo considered it his mission to dragoon his subjects into morality and his methods in this particular created untold misery the most ferocious punishments were daily meted out for the smallest offences or supposed offences against morality the chain and the lash were in constant requisition the periodical visits of a dominican friar who made minute examination into all family matters and by the royal authority commanded marriages separations or imprisonment destroyed all possibility of domestic happiness dissimulation spread like a pestilence priests and hypocrisy pervaded all marriage portions given to girls recommended by ecclesiastics pensions given to crowds of so-called converts a crushing taxation laws conceived in entire ignorance of all commercial or agricultural affairs outrageous punishments for trivial offences these and similar measures caused many of the inhabitants to take flight from the country while those who remained became idle false and bigoted thus did cosimo's early training habits and disposition reduce a high-spirited and intellectual people to the most abject state of moral and material degradation ever known one of the worst features in cosimo was his dislike of his sons whom in the most ill-advised manner he persistently bullied both of them had good natural dispositions and abilities but both were in turn ruined through the treatment they sustained from their father and this in the end brought about the most disastrous consequences to the family a mixture of extravagance and niggardliness he kept a tight hold on his purse-strings where his sons were concerned employing this means of coercing them to his will prince ferdinand the heir to the throne had as his instructors viviani redi noris the brothers lorenzini and other distinguished men of the time and being full of talent and intelligence promised to offer a striking contrast to his father whenever he should be called upon to rule 
by the year sixteen eighty when he was seventeen this young prince began to find the follies of the grand duchess vittoria insupportable and to revolt more and more from her authority he was prohibited by cosimo from corresponding with his mother whose extravagant conduct in paris continued and who openly declared her intention whenever cosimo's intemperance brought his life to an end of going to florence chasing hypocrites and hypocrisy from the court discharging all the incompetent sycophants who had been promoted by the grand duchess vittoria and restoring good government and common sense ferdinand espoused his mother's side in the quarrel disregarded the prohibition against corresponding with her and when his instructors the brothers lorenzini were most cruelly consigned to permanent imprisonment in the dungeons of volterra for supporting him threw off his father's authority altogether and became the centre of a band of well-born young men whose avowed object was to assert themselves in opposition to the monastical atmosphere of the court to favour music art and literature and to contend against all hypocrisy and dissimulation this society became immensely popular all the young scions of the leading florentine families pressing to join it in their detestation of the rule of the ecclesiastics favoured by cosimo and his mother while the society was soon still further strengthened by being joined by cosimo's younger brother francesco maria who was only three years older than his nephew ferdinand on his uncle leopold's death francesco maria had been made a cardinal at the age of fifteen but had no taste for the ecclesiastical life thus the family was divided into two parties on the one side the bigoted cosimo and his still more bigoted mother vittoria and on the other his brother francesco maria and his eldest son ferdinand with the grand duchess marguerite louise watching from a distance and encouraging the latter party but the concourse of youthful spirits led by prince ferdinand soon in their revolt from hypocrisy and a monkish style of life went further than merely favouring music art and literature and developed a taste for pleasure and intemperance which nullified all their good intentions and gave cosimo an opportunity for applying a thoroughly characteristic remedy a rigorous family inspection with a searching investigation into every detail of private habits was instituted carried out by friars and this developed into a regular system of espionage and persecution which soon put down any tendency to gaiety and pleasure and made the opponents of dissimulation and hypocrisy themselves practise these means of evading ecclesiastical tyranny all classes were subjected to this system while at the same time monks were placed over the parish priests and kept the people perpetually employed in processions preachings and penances accusations multiplied while pardon for imaginary offences was only to be obtained by the payment of large sums of money to the ecclesiastics disgusted with this state of things prince ferdinand being now twenty-two desired to be allowed to proceed on a tour to see the world but was kept for two years before cosimo would agree to let him go in sixteen eighty seven however ferdinand was allowed to depart on a tour in northern italy after being first betrothed to the princess violante beatrice of bavaria in november sixteen eighty eight he returned and the marriage was carried out with a most gorgeous display of magnificence a special gate was opened in the wall of the city near the porta san gallo and through this the princess violante was drawn in a car profusely studded with gems to a chapel erected for the occasion there she was crowned by cosimo with the grand ducal crown and thence was conducted to the palace in a procession of the most extravagant splendour after which the marriage was performed in the cathedral prince ferdinand was the hope of all those who desired to see a better state of things dawn upon tuscany high-spirited full of ability and fond of art and science he had become the centre round whom gathered all who were learned and cultured and all that portion of florentine society which had no taste for the atmosphere of hypocrisy which pervaded the court 
but his father contrived to bring these bright prospects to ruin ferdinand was as energetic and resolute as his father was weak and undecided and being eager to employ his abilities to some useful purpose desired to take a part in public affairs but cosimo refused to permit him to do so disgusted at a fatuous style of government which was dragging the country to ruin forced to be the daily witness of errors and follies which he was not allowed to remedy and subjected to chronic bullying by a father who hated him ferdinand gradually took to a dissolute course of life which before he was forty ruined his health and brought about his death a few years later unfortunately he did not care for the wife whom his father had chosen for him the princess violante though she was in every way worthy of his affection and deservedly liked by all classes in florence she never reproached him for his neglect and to the last continued to show her affection for him in the early part of cosimo's reign various important additions were made to the art collections in the uffizi gallery cosimo's intemperance both in eating and drinking caused him to suffer from frequent illness as a remedy for which his physician the celebrated redi prescribed regular walking exercise and paolo falconieri one of the cultured men whom prince ferdinand had gathered round him suggested that this exercise should be taken in the uffizi gallery and that the grand duke should for his amusement adorn it with all the best specimens of sculpture belonging to the family cosimo took up the idea warmly removed to the gallery many of the statues hitherto placed in the boboli gardens and caused to be brought from the villa medici at rome most of the remaining works of sculpture which ferdinand i had collected including the venus de medici the wrestlers the knife wetter and the large number of classic busts and other works of sculpture to be seen in the uffizi gallery then called the gallery of the statues the long corridor between the palace and the uffizi gallery which formed part of this daily walk of the grand duke was also adorned with many pictures among them the large collection of over six hundred portraits of notable persons in europe during the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries which though they are of no artistic merit are of much value from an historical point of view cosimo also now took in hand an important matter in regard to the family mausoleum hitherto the numerous members of the family who had died since it was begun by his great-grandfather ferdinand i in sixteen o four had pending the completion of the mausoleum been buried temporarily in the new sacristy Migliore, writing in sixteen eighty four in describing the new sacristy says this chapel also serves for burying the bodies of the grand dukes and princes of the blood placed in the ground beneath with short inscriptions merely for the record and not in the form of elegant eulogy such as they merit and their grandeur would require pending their being transferred to the mausoleum which is being prepared immediately behind the choir of the church he also states that in the old sacristy were buried the bodies of maria salviati and cosimo i with his sons giovanni and garzia thus in the new sacristy there had been temporarily buried in this manner some eighteen members of the family viz francis i and his wife joanna with two of their children anna and filippo ferdinand i and his wife christine with five of their children francesco carlo lorenzo eleonora and caterina cosimo the second and maria maddalena with four of their children maria cristina giovanni carlo matthias and leopold and ferdinand the second by the year sixteen eighty five however the mausoleum though still only about half finished was sufficiently advanced for them to be interred there cosimo therefore now removed the bodies of all the above from their temporary resting-places to the mausoleum the remains of giovanni della bandanere being at the same time brought from mantua all were duly placed in the crypt those of giovanni della bandanere and his wife maria salviati in the centre and the whole of their descendants ranged round them 
before the middle of cosimo's reign was reached his imbecile method of government had begun to produce serious difficulties in the disturbed state of europe it was urgently necessary that the country should be placed in a proper state of defence but all military requirements had been ignored by cosimo's cloister-trained ministers of state and no money for this purpose was forthcoming vast sums were squandered on religious ceremonies votive offerings the foundation of convents and similar objects while gold was lavishly poured forth on the crowd of monkish satellites who surrounded cosimo and his mother and on the spies who infested every family circle and this inordinate expenditure on such purposes while the military defences of the country were allowed to go to ruin caused general exasperation public opinion loudly complained of this insane policy and was led by prince ferdinand who openly condemned his father's conduct and was backed by public applause which kept cosimo in continual fear of a revolution end of section forty three section forty four of the medici volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 2, by G. F. Young. Chapter 29, Cosimo III, Part 2. In 1691, the princess Anna Maria Ludovica, then twenty-four, the only one of his three children for whom Cosimo had any affection, was married to William, Elector Palatine. At the same time, Cosimo was granted by the emperor the title of Royal Highness, but the condition of the country allowed him small opportunity for satisfaction at these new honors the people rose and surrounded the royal palace clamoring for bread the provinces were almost depopulated and savage bands of marauders roamed over the country in search of a livelihood unobtainable by any other means tuscany appeared to be sinking into general anarchy fortunately however in sixteen ninety eight the grand duchess vittoria who had for nearly sixty years been the constant source of discord to the family and ruin to the country died at pisa at the age of seventy-two and this by removing the chief influence which had led cosimo into methods which made all satisfactory government impossible produced some amelioration in the conditions from which the country was suffering cosimo's second son known as gian gastone was by this time twenty-two he was good-looking and highly educated having the reputation of being the most cultured prince of his time and being specially devoted to science antiquarian studies and botany it was considered a special proof of his exceptional attainments that among various other languages he even knew english but unlike his brother ferdinand he preferred a retired and studious life in company with the distinguished cardinal noris who had been his tutor his active-minded brother ferdinand consequently despised him while his father cosimo disliked him exceedingly and with his propensity for always taking the most ill-advised course gave him a very restricted allowance and ignored him on all occasions with the result that john costone lived neglected by the court being without the means to share in social dissipations john costone however cared little for being thus isolated from the life of society so long as he was left to pursue his studies in peace he had a good disposition loved a country life was free from any feelings of ambition and with the learned cardinal for his companion wanted no other society and had no other desire than to live this kind of life permanently but cosimo who by his senseless method of treatment had already driven one son into reckless and dissolute courses now proceeded to do the same with the other it was no doubt desirable that john gastone should marry and that he should be induced to lead a less retired life but cosimo's methods for attaining these objects were the worst that could have been employed fired with the idea of planting a branch of the medici in germany cosimo arranged through his daughter the electress palatine when john gastone was twenty-four 
that the latter should be married to anne of saxe lohenburg daughter of the deceased duke of saxe lohenburg who had left no son and widow of the count palatine philip of newburg a lady of enormous weight immense self-will and no personal attractions she was coarse and unintellectual was more like a bohemian peasant than a princess cared only for field sports which john gastone detested and considered her small patrimony of reichstadt a petty village in a secluded part of the mountains in bohemia the only place in the world worth living in john gastone strongly objected to the wife thus chosen for him who was about as unsuitable to a man of his tastes as could have been found but cosimo would not listen to his protests and after making him accompany him to loreto to make numerous votive offerings despatched him to dusseldorf the seat of the elector palatine where in july sixteen ninety seven the marriage was performed after which john gastone and his uncongenial consort proceeded to the remote bohemian village which was in future to be his abode arrived there john gastone found himself condemned to live in a small and mean castle in the midst of a village without any intellectual society with a wife altogether his inferior in a country which was buried deep in snow for half the year and where during the other half there was nothing to do but shoot his wife cared only about horses and dogs and spent most of her time holding conversations in the stables she was capricious hysterical imperious brainless and apt to burst out suddenly in wrath or in tears and her character and manners had after three years experience caused her former husband to take to drink john gastone writes to his father that she is nothing more than a contadina placed in such conditions and saddled with a coarse and ill-favoured wife who offended his tastes at every turn john gastone stood it for a year and then fled to join his mother in paris thence he was forced by cosimo to return to his hated domicile in bohemia but the various miseries of his existence there began ere long to produce in him a settled melancholy nevertheless from time to time john gastone's keen and witty tuscan spirit caused him to treat facetiously even the dismal circumstances in which he found himself and his letters to his father occasionally described the untoward conditions of his life with considerable humour after a time he tried to induce his wife to come with him for the winter to prague but she utterly declined to quit reichstadt and flew into a passion whenever the subject was mentioned and at length the constant quarrels with the vulgar and unrefined woman to whom he had been united the inclement climate and disgust at his surroundings drove john gastone to remove to prague where he took to low society intemperance and a generally dissolute life and henceforth he was more often at prague than at reichstadt by this time cosimo whose errors were all caused by egregious vanity and want of wisdom rather than by deliberately malevolent intentions began to perceive the mistake he had made and seeing that his elder son's health was failing and that john gastone would probably become ere long heir to the throne desired that he should return to tuscany but as he would not agree to john gastone doing so by himself he turned all his efforts to induce anne of saxe lohenburg to come at all events for a time to tuscany every power was brought to bear to effect this and the struggle continued for eight years without avail urgent letters from cosimo to anne herself the authority of her relative the elector palatine who visited reichstadt in person with this object even the commands of the pope all were equally powerless to remove anne of saxe lauenburg from reichstadt eventually in seventeen o eight cosimo gave it up as hopeless and wrote to john gastone to return to florence leaving her behind this john gastone did and henceforth they lived apart in seventeen o five prince ferdinand's health began to decline and as he and the princess violante had no children while the same was the case as regarded john gastone and his wife anne 
the question of the succession began to be of primary importance in the affairs of tuscany cosimo therefore in seventeen o nine compelled his brother francesco maria who was now nearly fifty to resign his cardinal's rank and to marry eleonora gonzaga the young daughter of the duke of guastella but though they went through the marriage ceremony they separated at once and francesco died in the following year leaving no children in view of the large families of three successive generations it is remarkable that the medici should have died out as they did cosimo i had eight children five sons and three daughters in the next generation ferdinand i had also eight children four sons and four daughters and in the next generation cosimo the second had again eight children five sons and three daughters yet from one cause or another descendants failed to such an extent that in the fifth generation from cosimo the first the family entirely died out for nearly twenty years the wars between france spain and austria had threatened the independence of tuscany that state under cosimo's clerical administrators had become ready to be the prey of whoever marched an army into its territory all the strength that it possessed under cosimo i and ferdinand i had departed forts had been allowed to fall into disrepair and their armaments to become obsolete the fleet had disappeared the army was contemptible wanting in men arms and equipment cosimo had only maintained tuscany's independence in the midst of these wars by the usual resource of a weak state that of siding first with one and then with another of the combatants according to whichever at the moment was the strongest their armies had frequently invaded lombardy and tuscany would have been similarly overrun had it not been that each of the three powers was determined to prevent the central state in italy from becoming the property of either of the others these conditions were now intensified by its becoming apparent that at no distant date there would remain no descendant of the medici family to occupy the tuscan throne none of cosimo's three children having any children therefore between the various powers who all cast greedy eyes upon the most important state in italy there now began a political contest which lasted for the next thirty years as to which of them should become the possessor of tuscany when that throne should be vacant the european monarchs watching like wreckers the last moments of the foundering medici meanwhile cosimo protested furiously against any such question being debated declaring it to be his right to nominate a successor to the throne after the demise of his sons and that even if this were disallowed the position reverted to that which had existed before cosimo i created that throne the right to say by whom they would be governed reverting to the tuscan people in seventeen twelve there was assembled the congress of utrecht in which almost every state in europe took part and at which each had some claim to urge as a portion of the terms of any general peace which might be effected at this congress cosimo's right to nominate a successor to the throne of tuscany on the death of his second son was practically acknowledged by the powers although not a final settlement of the question it was a matter of common knowledge that cosimo intended to nominate his daughter the electress anna maria ludovica to succeed his second son if she outlived the latter and the emperor charles the sixth signified to her and to cosimo that he would be ready to give his sanction to this arrangement in seventeen eighteen when cosimo was seventy-one his eldest son prince ferdinand died at the age of fifty he was greatly lamented in tuscany not only on account of his abilities his agreeable disposition which caused the excesses of his later years to be forgiven and his constant opposition to the foolish methods of government by which the country was being brought to ruin but also on account of the high hopes which had been entertained of the complete change which it was felt he would have introduced whenever he succeeded to the throne upon the death of cosimo's eldest son the florentine senate was convened and passed a decree which was confirmed by the grand duke that on the death of prince giovanni gastone 
his sister the electress anna maria ludovica should succeed to the throne this decree was formally promulgated and communicated to the various courts of europe its promulgation in florence being accompanied by public festivities austria declined to agree declaring that the decree showed that cosimo's ultimate intention was to give tuscany to a bourbon but cosimo placed his chief reliance on england and holland who were both ready to withstand austria in the matter george i being specially opposed to any foreign power obtaining a preponderating influence in italy france also did not object to the decree louis the fourteenth only taking exception to its incompleteness and urging that prudence policy and national justice pointed to the ultimate successor being the princess elizabeth of parma through margarita de medici daughter of cosimo the second lastly philip v of spain took a still more definite course by promptly marrying the princess elizabeth as a preliminary to claiming tuscany for spain when the time came meanwhile the peace of utrecht seventeen fourteen took place without any opposition being made by any of the powers to the electress anna maria ludovica being considered the rightful successor to the throne of tuscany after her brother giovanni gastone in seventeen fifteen louis the fourteenth died his death causing important changes in european politics and in seventeen sixteen the electress anna maria ludovica now fifty years of age became a widow and returned from dusseldorf to florence where she immediately became the principal personage at the court on her arrival ferdinand's widow the princess violante retired to siena of which she was made governor the altered state of european affairs caused by the death of louis the fourteenth led in seventeen eighteen to a quadruple alliance between england holland france and austria and these powers in a treaty concluded at london decided without even consulting the grand duke of tuscany that on the death of cosimo's son gian gastone tuscany should go to don carlos of spain the eldest son of elizabeth of parma queen of spain this being done in order to pacify austria as to the chance of a bourbon being allowed to obtain tuscany the article of this treaty which thus sacrificed tuscany trampled on a formal national decree and excluded cosimo's favorite child from the succession was kept secret but could not long be concealed and when it became known it filled both the florentines and the grand duke with unbounded indignation the people hated cosimo but at the moment this feeling was swallowed up in their wrath against the four powers who had thus treated their country cosimo sent vehement protests to all the powers concerned but each of them profited in various ways by other clauses in the treaty and would do nothing to invalidate it and cosimo was informed that he must submit and that if he did not foreign troops would be sent into tuscany to hold it for disposal in accordance with the treaty of london thus did cosimo see himself insulted his country sold and the independence of tuscany annihilated but at this juncture cosimo though he was now seventy-six years old displayed an energy and vigor at variance with all his previous history troops were raised throughout tuscany the fortresses were repaired and their armaments brought up to date the harbor defenses of porto ferraio and leghorn were strengthened and every arrangement made to resist to the uttermost tuscany if it was to perish as an independent state should die fighting at the same time cosimo drew up a formal declaration to the powers which stated that no successor to the medici could be recognized in the free and independent state of tuscany unless approved by the people through their representative the florentine senate therefore no power had a right to exclude the electress anna as chosen by that body and hailed with public acclamation and that except by violence there was no way of making a free nation submit to feudal supremacy a thing utterly at variance with its nature and institutions 
or of introducing garrisons into a neutral and unoffending country which had only been striving to preserve its own peace without molesting any one by this time england and holland were at war it was believed that cosimo's determined attitude must be supported secretly by some other power while it seemed probable that some new turn in international politics might throw the whole question again into discussion cosimo's protest was consequently received with respect in seventeen twenty peace was again restored and a fresh congress was assembled at cambrai at this congress the whole question of the tuscan succession was argued out afresh cosimo's ambassador being corsini who displayed much ability in demonstrating the injustice to tuscany of the proposed course and more particularly the certainty that any rule of that country in austrian hands which the florentines feared was now contemplated would be of a most tyrannical character while in any case it was he argued most unfair not to allow the rule of tuscany to pass after prince giovanni gastone's death to his sister the electress anna maria ludovica she being eminently qualified both in character and ability to govern the country well these discussions at cambrai continued all the way through the years seventeen twenty one and seventeen twenty two while the negotiations intrigues and secret agreements between the various powers over the bone of contention tuscany were interminable meanwhile age began to tell upon cosimo worn out by these long contests over the independence of his country and with his strength failing now that he was approaching eighty years of age he abandoned the rule of the state entirely to his capable daughter with whose control of affairs her brother john gastone only anxious to be left in his beloved seclusion had no desire to interfere she conducted all negotiations with foreign powers showed a capable management of home affairs mitigated the harsher aspects of cosimo's laws and spent much in works of public benefit her conduct was widely praised and it became a general wish that she might survive her brother and succeed to the throne so that her efforts to make other powers accept the decree of the florentine senate were vigorously supported by the people of tuscany the memory of her mother's youthful sorrows was revived in september seventeen twenty one by the death of the grand duchess marguerite louise at paris at the age of seventy six and this increased the regard entertained for the daughter of a princess for whom the florentines had always felt much sympathy in seventeen twenty eight the discussions at cambrai showing that whatever other arrangements were made between the leading powers of europe they were determined to adhere to their unjust treatment of tuscany corsini was instructed to lodge a final solemn protest with the object of asserting the rights of cosimo's successor and of making the act of violence on which the powers were bent more marked this was the last public act of cosimo's life and on the thirty first october seventeen twenty eight after handing over the government to his son john gastone cosimo the third passed away after a reign of fifty-three years in which with the best intentions he had produced nothing but evil and the utmost national misery cosimo the third is an example of how a character which in private capacity would have been unobjectionable may in the position of a ruler become a pattern of everything most baneful in a private sphere he would have been a very ordinary person and probably much respected since the chief defects of his character would never in that case have had any opportunity of developing placed however on a throne the combined effects of his want of wisdom vanity weakness bigotry and tyranny caused him to present an example of everything that is worst in a ruler under him joyous and light-hearted tuscany became a veil of tears hating his sons apparently for no other reason than that they were each in their different ways more capable than himself he ruined both their lives by the most narrow-minded domestic tyranny lastly 
cosimo the third was the first of his house who by his conduct as a ruler turned the poorer classes of the people against him and thereby overthrew that which had always been the strongest bulwark of his family such was the result which had been produced by ferdinand the second's weakness in allowing his eldest son to be brought up by a foolish and incapable mother in the manner that he did whereby evils were entailed for half a century upon both the country and the family which were appalling in their magnitude and deplorable in their consequences End of section 44